in the chat box and I work through them in the order they come in. Sometimes I have the answers, sometimes I do not. But either way, we have a great time talking about lawn care. So let's see what we have in the live in the live stream tonight. See Papa Mo's Low is in the house leading things off, saying, Every everyone, let's go. I agree, man. Let's go. Guys, this today, well, this week was busy, but today was incredibly busy. You guys are gonna find out more about that later. Uh, but it's it was a very, very, very busy day. If you guys follow me on Instagram or watch the YouTube stories, you already know what was what was up, what went down. But uh, but yeah, it was a great day, got a lot of work done. And uh, looking forward to tomorrow to do like the next thing that you know I normally do around this time of the month. So awesome stuff. All right, next up is, first up is Papa Mo's Low with a question or comment rather. He says, watch your video and peace video with Roland. Uh, I'm meeting him at Sunny Bermuda's next week or he's coming here. I may end up with a Sterling before it's over. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. You know, I mean, it's it's a nice unit, uh, you know, and, and Roland is uh, is pretty convincing. I, I think that you'll, um, depending on where you are with an outlet and what you, uh, you know, what you would be using the unit for, I think there's a lot of merit in it. But I will definitely get into that. I'm sure there's going to be more questions and comments about the Sterling. So we will definitely chat about that if you guys so desire. We'll definitely get into that. I also have some questions from last week that I need to answer. Um, some, um, some viewer questions that I promised I would get back to you, mainly around different weeds and what we'll, you can use to kill them, to treat them. So I'll get into that and uh, some other things we got going on. So yeah, let's 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 get into it. We got lots to cover tonight. Get your questions queued up, guys, so I can work through them in the order they come in. Next up is Paco Guibes. He says, uh, Ron is in the house. Um, let's get going. He says, you're a lawn god. Um, I hope one day that my lawn is as flat, as green as yours. I am leveling with sand. This season, I am pumped. I am far from a lawn god. I just spend entirely way too much time messing with my lawn. So I appreciate the kind words and I don't envy you that, you know, you're leveling with sand this season because it's a lot of work. Uh, but at the same time, the payoff is totally worth it, right? The way the lawn looks after a good top dress, after a good leveling job is pretty incredible. So you will, uh, you'll, even though you'll, you'll go through the pain and you'll be questioning why you're doing this to yourself when you're in the middle of it, once it's done, you'll be very happy that you did. Paco has a follow-up comment. He says, after that, I'm getting a engine reel mower. Right now, I'm using a push one, and I really like the results it's giving me. Everyone knows that I have the best lawn, and they ask me for my advice. Thanks. Very, very cool, man. Here's the thing. If you had a rotary, and then you went to a push reel mower, yes, I agree, that is one level, one order of magnitude improvement. But going from a push reel mower to a powered reel mower is a, is completely a game changer. I know it's a term that's completely overused, uh, but it it really is. Like you really cannot compare the difference in cut between uh, a a push reel mower and a powered reel mower. And then when you get into powered reel mowers, there's obviously you know different tiers of that, right? There is like your True Cuts, McLean's, California Trimmers, and then you get into what I consider to be like your mid tier mowers, uh, like your um, like anything with a rear drum, so like your Alets, um, Swordman's, those kind of fall in that in that area, more so based on price point. And then you have the big dog mowers, which are like your John Deere's and, of course, the almighty Toro Greensmaster. Alet also makes some really nice mowers, too, that are also um, in that that range. It actually costs more than what a Greensmaster will cost. So it, it, the the long short of it is, man, uh, you know, it's, it's a fun hobby, and your pocketbook is the limit, right? You can spend anywhere from you know, a couple hundred bucks or a few hundred dollars for a pre-owned true cut up to five, well into five digits, five figures for a real more, depending on options and everything you get with it. So, but I will tell you going from where you are now to the next level is, uh, is pretty awesome. You're really gonna, you're really gonna appreciate the difference in cut. So if I can help with anything, let me know and, uh, and keep me posted on how it, uh, it works out. Thin Cut is here. He says, good evening, Ron. Happy to gross you out. Ha ha. So guys, here's the thing. And hopefully this isn't gross too many of you guys out. He sent me a picture of something that is growing in his lawn. I've never seen anything like it before. I've shown it to two of my friends that work in industry that spray lawns for a living. And the, imp the, the, the response they both had was, that looks disgusting. They had no idea what it was. They were asking if it was coming out of the, out of the ground or is it actually something that was growing on the grass itself. I've never seen any kind of fungus or disease or anything that looks like this. So perhaps I'll show it to you guys. Maybe some of you that are in the live stream that are in the chat that also work in, in um, you know, that work in the lawn care industry might say, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And that's what this is. So I'll show you guys really quickly here. I won't leave it on the screen too long, but it's three pictures. They picture one, picture two, and picture three. So it looks, I mean, it almost looks to me like some kind of like spray foam or something on the lawn, but that middle picture, you see like the red and pink stuff that's in it. 
Uh, you know, I'm not sure what that is. Thin Cut sent these in earlier this evening, and again, I showed them to a couple of friends. They were stumped on what it was. The only consensus they had was that it was pretty disgusting. So you guys can chime in. If any of you guys know what that is, let me know. I don't have an idea of what of what you know we're working with here, but I'm sure one of you might. One of you might. So feel free to chime in if you know. Guys, we're a little bit early in, but if you guys wouldn't mind touching that like button ever so gently. Normally I wait for the top of the hour after I provided some value, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna start being a little bit more needy and start asking earlier in the show for those likes because it definitely does help with engagement, it helps with, the, with uh, you know, how YouTube promotes the live stream. So if you guys would do that, really, really would appreciate it. We got 83 people in here so far, so let's touch that like button gently or hard, however you wanna do it, by all means, proceed. All right, next up is Papa Moslo, actually I'm wrong. The next up is, is from Bermuda. He says, what up Ron? I got my aeration done and I got my five yards of sand delivered to today for this weekend. Should be fun, let's go. Wow, man, five yards, that's um, that's that's quite a bit, Daryl. And, and I know you've got some equipment to make the job easier, but a couple of tips, you know, I mean, you're a pro, you've already done your lawn a couple of times before. Um, something I would just tell you is that once you get through top dressing, or actually going into top dressing, I'm not sure if you're, you're um, you know, if you've if you've already done this, but um, be sure to mark any sprinkler heads or any irrigation heads that you have in the lawn. That's really important because the last thing you want is sand getting into those guys and it will it'll ruin them, right? You'll be out there digging up a big donut out of your lawn to replace a sprinkler head. And while it's not difficult to do, you really would hate to have to mess up the lawn after you spent all that time getting it nice and smooth and getting the grass to grow back. So uh, the only tip I'd give you is if you can get your hands on like those some of those little rubber dog Frisbees, like put those down while you're top dressing. It does a lot for keeping debris out of um, sprinkler heads. Outside of that, man, you've already done it before. There's nothing that I'm gonna tell you. you. You you already know what you're doing. We've seen your lawn, you've got the the results, so I'm sure you're gonna have a great time uh, leveling your lawn yet again tomorrow. Great stuff. All right, next up is Papa Mo's Low. He says, aerating tomorrow, I'm throwing the sink at it. Okay, here we go, What's what you got going on? What you got? He says, I'm throwing in um, a quick release nitrogen, Essential G, Hydrotain, Miramichi Carbon Package, and then Top Dressing next me week. I like it, Papa Moslo. So aeration is on the brain for those of you guys that haven't been um, watching, you know, following me on other social media. Um, I, today, I aerated the lawn. It was a ton of work. We did a bunch of lawns today. I actually took the day off from work because I really wanted to not be disturbed. I had like one, I took the day off, but you know how things are. I still had a meeting in the morning that I had to go to. So had one call that I, I went to, and outside of that, today was all about aerating. So we did uh, my lawn, Alex's lawn, the neighbor's lawn that lives nearby us, um, and then there were uh, there were three other lawns that also got done today. So it was a ton of aerating. I am beat. Um, the, the the last two Alex and his brother in law did. I didn't. I had to get back here to get ready for the live stream to prepare for you guys. But uh, but it was a lot of work. A lot of work. A lot of fun. And the lawn looks. The lawn is going to bounce back really nicely. I'll show you guys a picture here. Some video here in a second. But, it, but I like what you've got going on, Papa Moslo. You know, some a little bit of quick release N is a good idea. It's gonna help the lawn bounce back that much faster, recover that much faster, along with the heat that we got coming here over the next week or so is really gonna help. Uh, the Essential G, always a favorite. You know, I did that today myself, went pretty heavy with it. And then the car carbon package and top dressing, you got it all planned out, man. It's really, really good. So, uh, you know, out of those things, the only thing that I did today was the Essential G. I went really heavy on that. And then tomorrow, because it's the 15th, the middle, because it's the middle of the month, it's the middle of the month weekend anyway, I'm gonna be doing the carbon kit and then my um, another PGR application in with that. So I'm, I'm toying with the idea of um, going down on rate on, on, uh, on the on plant growth regulator. So instead of going out at you know full rate once a month, I'm having that and doing it every couple of weeks. So far, I like the results I'm getting so far. So tomorrow, I'm gonna to go out again with the, um, again, the carbon kit, a release zero, Nutri-Kelp, Biospectrum, gotta have some micronutrient in there. So Nutrisol is going in with that. And then uh, Primo Max, Plant Growth Regulator as well is gonna be going down on the lawn. So good stuff, man. I like I like what you're doing. I'm sure it's gonna work out really well. Uh, you know, I, I feel free with all the work you got going on, but the lawn is gonna look great once you're done with it. So awesome, thanks for giving us an update. Next up is Alexander Thomas. He says, NPK to push, growth PGR to, to slow the push um, every evening, everyone. Uh, yes and no, um, Alexander. So NPK, yes, but if you if you feed your lawn nitrogen, it does help increase growth. It does help push growth. But in general, you gotta remember nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium are also just needed in general just for plant health. You know, so it's not so much about you know like pushing a ton of extra growth by by um, by throwing some NPK at the lawn. You know, you know, the 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 um, the rhyme you remember is you know uh, nitrogen up, um, phosphorus down, and potassium 
um, you know, all around. So it's, 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 they are the macros there with the, they are the nutrients your, your, your grass needs in greatest quantity. Um, and it's not just for pushing growth, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. And here's the thing, right? We're kind of crazy when it comes to PGR, right? So we mix a little bit of nitrogen in with our PGR. So we're like, you know, one thing to slow things down, but we're also adding some nitrogen, and a little bit of iron as well. So I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I'm going to be doing that tomorrow as well. So, uh, so yeah. All right, next up is Paco Guives. He says, thinking about getting a McLean reel mower, but I'm open to your recommendations for my first big boy reel mower. What do you think? I only have 2,500 square feet. Should I go electric or are they expensive? So it's like anything when it comes to, um, to, to electric versus gas. I'll answer the latter part of the question first. Um, it, it's with electrics, you're paying the heavier cost up front, right? So the, the typically electric mowers tend to be a bit more expensive than their gas counterparts. Um, and then you also have, to have the batteries and chargers and that type of thing to, like, to get into an electric reel mowing. But once you do, you know, as long as you take care of the batteries, you cycle them properly, you know, you, know, you keep them in, in reasonable temperatures, you know, you tend to recoup your costs over time. And, you know, it's, it's better for the environment. You're not inhaling fumes. It's not, um, you know, you don't have to worry about getting gas. There's no, no gasoline in the store, you know, assuming you're all electric. So there are those benefits to it. Um, and now, as far as a McLean or some other real mower, the way I answer these kinds of questions as far as which real mower really is what can you get serviced in your area? Because at the end of the day, I can tell you, you know, go out and get a Greensmaster, go get a True Cut, go out and get a McLean. But really, unless you've got someone in the in your area that can one work on it, um, that can that's comfortable with sharpening or grinding on that particular mower, as, and as far as getting parts, if you need to, you know, we need you need to maintain it because real mowers do need more maintenance than their rotary mower um, equivalents. Um, you know, you, you're just not gonna you're just not gonna enjoy using it. So, so that's the 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 big criteria. The, the that's thing one that I uh, I focus on when it comes when someone asks me which real mower. Now, all things being equal, let's say you're my neighbor and you're in Northeast Georgia, where you can you can use any of those mowers because there's people all around that can service any of them. I would lean for me um, if 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 quality of cut is your biggest criteria, meaning all you care about is getting the best quality of cut. It's really hard to beat a greens mower. Really hard to beat a greens master. You know, a greens master or a John Deere. I I lean more towards Toro because I have one of them, and uh, there's there's uh, places in the area that can service them. Like Jerry Pates right down the road and get you parts. So that for that reason, it's very nice. Um, they the, the the maintenance on those does tend to be a bit more expensive though. So that's something you have to consider. Uh, now, if we go back away from like you know Cadillac mower to, and, and back it down a tier, that's where you have your McLean's, your True Cuts, um, what else? California trimmers, those types of mowers. Out of the three, I I like the the True Cut the most out of them. Reason being is that it's uh, I prefer the fat. I, like, I prefer the drive system in the True Cut, just frankly, uh, more so than I do in the McLean or the California trimmer. Uh, I um, you know, when you put a grooved roller on the true cut, it cuts, it, it produces a very nice cut. I'm sure you can get a great cut out of a California trimmer and McLean too. There's people that have those and love them. But for me, uh, the, the true cut would be the mower, the mower I would choose in the McLean category or in that price range. That, that's more my taste. I would get one of those, slap a grooved roller on it and go to town. So hope that helps. Um, as far as electric mowers, there's a couple of good options. I mean, there is, um, what is it? The one from Alep, there's the Liberty. There is the the new Sterling, the one that I got to play with uh, last Saturday. Tomorrow, you know, tomorrow will be one week since so I got to actually use that one for a couple of hours. Kind of a cool mower. And then there's some mowers from um, from Swordman, but those ones I've not I've not seen always great feedback or results as far as the electric version. Some people that have the, the gas ones seem to love them, but the electrics I've I've seen those being a little bit iffy as far as electronics and just running and and just just running into issues. So um, if you are going to get an electric uh, an electric reel mower anyway, I would look at one of the ones from Alit. There's obviously also the options from Toro and John Deere, but then again, you're into another price tier there. So it's, it's like really depends on you, on your budget, and, um, and, and, and how picky you are with getting that perfect cut and stripe action. All right, uh, Paco, as his follow-up, he says, I'm in, I have Bermuda in North Carolina. Right now I'm keeping it at one inch with my old school push reel mower. Yeah, so the nice thing about a going to a um, a powered reel mower is you're going to be able to drop that down to whatever your schedule will permit, right? So really, going from an inch to three quarters of an inch or to half an inch, if you're really a boss, it really comes down to how much time do you have to mow. 
right? So three quarters of an inch, in my opinion, is the sweet spot for real mowing. That's that's the, I always I, I always jokingly say, mowing your lawn or keep maintaining it at three quarters of an inch is the height of cut that, that doesn't cause real mowing to mess up your life. So, and the stripes look good at that at that height. So it just depends on you. You're gonna, it, I, I don't know how much time you have to mow or, or your desire to get out there and mow, but that's the only consideration really once you start going from an inch and, and lower is, um, is how much time you have because it's going to take more time to keep the long green between mowings. Great question, man. Let us know what you end up going with. Next up is Timothy Wolf. He says, hi, Ron, and happy Friday. Regarding leveling, is there any temperature that is too hot that would damage Bermuda or any grass type? Um, you know, here's the thing. I would, you know, as far as Bermuda goes, um, not really, not that I'm really uh, aware of. I mean, I've, I've leveled my lawn or, or topped just my lawn anytime, anywhere between um, April time frame all the way into July, August. So I've done it a bunch of different times and I've done it different times of, um, of throughout the growing season. The big thing I would say is whenever the grass is actively growing is when I would do it. Now, there are grass types. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to cool season grass, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit different because with Bermuda, our our growing season is like, it's like big and heavy and, and lumpy in the middle, right? Whereas a, for cool season grass, you have a growing season in the spring. And then during the summer, you're, you're watering a lot and the grass tends to be, get stressed. And then in the fall, cool season grass ramps up again. So they get a growing season in the spring and they get a growing season in the fall. So I would, I would, you know, discourage you from leveling or top dressing a, a cool season. If I say, well, yeah, I'm top dressing a cool season lawn um, during that lull in the summertime, whenever the, whenever the grass is just seeing a lot more stress. You know what I mean? I would I would restrict leveling a cool season lawn to springtime and summer and um, and fall time. Um, but when it comes to Bermuda uh, or zoysia, really any time between mid April all the way into early August you're good to go. You know, the grass doesn't really, I've not seen any issues with the grass, you know, definitely not getting damaged or anything like that. The one thing I'll tell you is the the further into the season you wait. So like, say if you, like I, I leveled my lawn, the front lawn two weeks ago, two weekends ago, something like that, two or three weeks, it all runs together. And the recovery time, because I did it earlier in the season was a bit slower. If you wait until June, so you wait another two, three weeks and level, the lawn's going to bounce back a lot faster, right? So that's one consideration you want to make when it comes to leveling uh, Bermuda or, um, you know, or any um, or any warm season grass that it's when it's growing more actively or more aggressively, it's going to bounce back sooner. So that's that's the only consideration I'd really make. Temperature really should not damage Bermuda. I have not seen that. And again, especially if you're doing it the way that I recommend, which is not to go crazy heavy, and uh, you know, beach the lawn, then you're not going to have issues with introducing too much stress and causing some of the turf to die off because it's not getting sunlight. So, the short answer to your question is no. I've never seen that. All right, you're saying it's mid 90s in Texas. The lawn's just going to bounce back really quickly. That's all you're going to really see. As long as if you can tolerate it, the grass can tolerate it because you're going to be the one out there doing it. The grass is is you know is always um, seeing those temps. So um, nothing, nothing to worry about. All right. Next up, let me get, let me get going faster. We got a bunch of questions tonight. All right. Next is LG with a super chat. Super chat. For he says, I had to get in the 10% of whatever Merrill was going to donate before he stole sponsorship. Can I get some Tango Bolero? You can, sir. You can get some Tango Bolero just for you. And I'm going to make you the show sponsor, which you are as of right now. And let me scroll up and find where I left off. I appreciate it, LG. Thank you so much for the support, sir. All right. Next up is Mr. Patrick from the great state of Texas. He says, good evening, my, or good afternoon, rather, my crazy lawn nuts. I spent the day on the golf course, <laughs> on the golf course, looking at the grass more than trying to make par. I hear you. I hear you, uh, Patrick. You know, the you know, if you're out there on a nice course, it's, it's pretty, um, I can see how you can get caught up staring at the turf versus trying to make par, although we have to question why you're trying to make par. Remember, you gotta be trying to make birdie and settle for par. We don't go out trying to make par. We're out trying to, you know, shoot shoot 18 under, technically, right? That that would be that would be awesome. Uh, but I'm just giving you a hard time, man, but I, I, I totally get it. When I went to Augusta National, I was more impressed, I mean, I shouldn't say, there's awesome golfers there that are, that are there, obviously, you know, you know, Tiger, Rory, all those guys are out there just, you know, having a great time ripping it up. But the the grass is is pretty awesome. You know, golf is kind of like football. I almost prefer, I really prefer to watch it on TV than in person. Uh, but the grass you cannot appreciate on television like you do in person. So 
I think you made the right choice. You can always go out there and shoot another round if you want to. I, I totally get you wanting to spend time looking at the turf. All right, Higgy pops up next. He says, um, hello, Ron, time for the weekend. Let's go. Everyone hit the like button. Let's do that, guys. Let's hit the like button. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I like gently, but if you want to smash the like button, you know, by, by all means, whatever works for you, really would appreciate that. It helps support the channel. Doesn't cost you anything. Oh, that's great, right? Uh, 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 uh. Okay, Patrick is back. He says, renting an aerator tomorrow, my first time. Any tips? Yes. So there's going to be a video on aeration that's going to be coming out here soon, depending on when I can get around to editing it. But if you, uh, some couple of tips I, could I can give you as far as aerating your lawn. First of all, great job choosing to do that. It's a lot of work but it's one of the best things you can do for your lawn as far as reducing compaction, um, you know, getting, getting moisture in the soil, getting air into it, getting, you know, stimulating microbial activity. There's really no negatives to aerating other than it's just hard work, right? As far as tips go, <clears throat> I, I would say that uh, if you have a, a fairly level lawn, a flat lawn, a fairly open space, um, instead of making passes back and forth, uh, do like an overlapping oval type um, situation. It's going to allow you to keep the mower moving the entire time. Um, I, I'm going to show that in the video that I'm, that I'm working on. You guys will get to see exactly what I'm talking about. But if I have a piece of paper here, I, I do. I might be actually show you. I'll be able to show you guys now so you can see what's going to be in the video. So let's say that this is your lawn, right? And I don't have my soul, my soul tuscated, but let's say this is your lawn. So instead of going, and I'm doing this without, without seeing, I'm looking at the, the screen. So instead of going back and, well, Helpful if I turn, if I turn, my, turn my pen on. Let's do, let's pick a pen that will write sideways. All right, so instead of going um, back and forth and back and forth like that, right? So like make a pass this way, turn around, make a pass back the other way, turn around, make a pass, which sounds like it would make sense logically because that's how you mow your lawn. With an aerator, it actually makes, it's actually a lot of work to do it that way. So what I would recommend instead is do like um, overlapping ovals. So let's say this is your entire lawn. Let me see if I can actually draw this backwards. Let's say we're gonna go like this. We're gonna make a pass like this. You're gonna come down, right? And then come back this way. And now what happens is we've now divided our lawn into two halves, two different quadrants, right? So find out where I was so I can continue my line. Is you're gonna come back around and you're gonna, you're going to go back this way. And then when you come back around again, you're gonna go down and to like here and make a pass, oh, it's so hard to do backwards, and make a pass like this. And then you're gonna come back up and then around and then back down and then this way, well, and then this way. So I'm doing a terrible job illustrating this. The video is gonna be way better. But the idea is instead of going back and forth, you want to go like this and then like slowly work your way down where you're essentially filling in the entire lawn over time, but you never have to stop the aerator to do it. So you're literally just going fast and turning left, right? It's like a NASCAR race. You're just going to go fast, turn left, go fast, turn left. And you slowly work your way down um, and each half gets filled in as you slowly work your way down. So that's the only tip I'd really, I'd give you for a flat lawn. As far as if you are aerating a slope, be careful. Um, you can either go sideways, which for me is the hardest way to run an aerator on a slope because it tends to want to tip over. Um, you can either go diagonally up the slope, kind of like I recommend for real mowing, or you can, um, you know, if you be careful when you do this, or you can go straight up and down the slope, but you just have to make sure that you can control the, control the unit. Going straight up and down um, allows you to make the best use of all the tines. It, on a slope, whenever you are, let's say the soil test kit is your slope, um, whenever you're, you are going to do this way. Yep. Whenever you're making a pass like this, the, the tines or the portion of the aerator that is lower is going to bite in more. And the one that's higher is going to be up a little bit more. So, so these tines, the ones up here are not going to dig in or not going to do as good a job pulling cores as the lower ones. So the way you can get around that is to think the sideways is to go straight up straight down, the weight will be evenly distributed that way. The only thing is you have to be careful. You wanna be careful when you're going up and definitely when you're coming down, you can almost let it free, reel, free wheel going down um, and that produces a good result. So just be careful if you have a slope or any kind of slope sections in your lawn. Outside of that, the, you know, the NASCAR overlapping oval um, a method is what I'd recommend for, for getting, you know, for doing it faster, minimizing the amount of times you have to stop uh, and turning the unit around, just kind of keep making overlapping ovals. 
Hope that helps. If you hang out till Sunday, my goal is to get the video ready for Sunday morning. It'll you'll have a video that shows it in detail. Shows it in detail. I actually got some cool shots you can actually see from above, like how what I'm talking about. All right. Next up is Jackie Bear, who says, "What's up? What's going on, Jackie? Hope you're doing all right. Thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream." My hands cramped, like holding it like this is actually pretty hard, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is R. Reed. He says, hey, I'm in the top 10 for the first time ever getting in here early. You are. Congrats, man. Congrats. You're in the top 10. Uh, welcome to the live stream. And now here we go. Papa Mo's Low is back about the question. He says, Sterling, your honest feedback. Mm-hmm. Versus my dishonest feedback? What am I giving you dishonest feedback of Papa Mo's Low? But I, I get what you're saying. He says, also, I saw another video he recommended scarifying once a month. Do you think it's really necessary or any benefit? Okay, there's a couple of things there. The Sterling overall, I, I think it's a nice unit as far as an electric reel mower goes. It's, um, you know, it's, it's solid. It's, it's well built. It, I would prefer if it were heavier. And that's, you know, that's a personal preference thing. Like, I like my True Cut, which has got a lot of weight to it. I like my, um, my Greens Master, which also has even more weight to it, right? So I, I like a heavy mower because it settles in better, you get better stripes. Um, it doesn't try to, you know, fishtail around, especially when you're dealing with a slope. So for that reason, I would I would like it to have a bit more weight. The interchangeable cartridge system, very cool. The the as far as swapping cartridges and, and it maintaining the cut properly, all that works great. So from the standpoint of like build quality, it's a really solid unit. Um, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense for someone that say you already have ego devices. Let's say you're already like in the ecosystem and you've got, you know, you're the string tremors and you already have a couple of batteries laying around. Then it's really compelling because then you don't have to go buy the unit and then go buy a battery and charger and everything else to help to have to run it. So it's, it's kind of your call on from that standpoint. On your second question about scarifying once a month. Here's the thing. I am not really a fan of scarifying Bermuda or really any creeping grasses. Um, I understand what Alad is after, but I really think that for a fescue lawn or a um, or like rye grass, uh, like those types of grasses, like running a scarifier regularly makes a lot of sense. But with Bermuda, the way it fills in and gets um, nice and dense is it wants to spread, right? Like you know, the rhizomes want to lay down and and run across the surface. So instead of scarifying, I am more a fan of verticutting the lawn then I am scarifying it. So, I, but I, I did it um, the Allet way. You know, I, I went out and I, I scarified. You guys saw in the video, I did a scarification and then I did a verticut and then I did a cleanup cut. And overall, the grass looks good. When it was done, it looks good, right? You know, the, um, the runners, it, it did pull or the runners that were attached did get pulled. They did get rooted up a little bit. But by the time I got done verticutting and, um, and then doing the cleanup cut, the turf looked good when I was done with it. You know, so... It, I, from that standpoint, I guess if you're doing, if you're following up the scarification with a verticut, then it is, um, then I, 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 in that situation, you're fine. When would I think scarify, scarifying would be a good idea? Let's say you are, uh, you've scalped your lawn in the beginning of the season, right? Or you're doing a scalp in the middle or like you're doing a scalp like mid-season, you're doing like a reset. And in that situation where you're trying to pick up debris off the lawn, I think scarifying is really good for that for that purpose. But on a Bermuda lawn, on a on a creeping grass lawn, not I am not a huge fan of doing it. It I did it and it worked. It's it's all right. Um, but I would much faster. I would, I'd be much more prone to verticut the lawn, you know, especially when temps get warmer than I would to scarify it. You know what I mean? So that's 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 more my thing. Um, you know, there are people that, that scarify their lawns monthly that have Bermuda and they like the results they get with it. And perhaps if I did it more, I might come into that camp, right? But, um, but in general, verticutting, I can see a lot of the benefits of that. And the, um, you know, just for, for a creeping grass like Bermuda, scarifying because of what it does as far as like, you know, like you're basically, you're basically disrupting um, the, with the growth characteristics of Bermuda. And I'm sure if you do that often enough, it will eventually tighten up and you'll change the way it grows to an extent, but Bermuda is still gonna wanna run. That's, that's what it does, right? So hopefully that helps Papa Moslo. Um, if, if I were buying, let's say budget were limited and I had a choice between buying, I could buy, I, mean, I could get the, uh, the Sterling and I could get a couple of cartridges. For me, given how short I mow my lawn, I would get the 10 blade because I really like the way ten, the cut you get with a 10 blade and I would get the Verticutter. Like those two, if I could, you know, if I could have anything, if I, those two would be the ones uh, that I would, that I would go with. The other ones, the brooms, the, um, the dethatcher, like the more aggressive tools, also awesome too, but they would fall, for me anyway, for the way I would maintain my lawn, those would fall 
um, after getting a 10 blade and getting a, uh, a Verita cutter. The one benefit, I will say this while I look for the other question, is, is that I do like the fact that when you verticut, there's a grass catcher on the front. So it saves you a lot of work as far as verticutting the lawn and then having to go and rake the entire lawn, which is, my lawn is a colossal pain. The fact that you're able to verticut or scarify if you decide you wanna do that, and all the debris goes right into a catcher that you can easily empty out, very, very nice, very cool. You know, so that, and that is something, I'm trying to think of is anyone else that's really doing that. I mean, I know Swordman has something, but I mean, as far as even from like say Toro, I don't know that, um, that, that you can get, if you, I know they have cutting heads, like verticutting cutting heads, but I don't know that you have like catchers, grass catchers for them, you know? So that's that's something that the Sterling has that is actually pretty cool that is a time saver. So if you decide to go with it, let me know, you know, fill me in on, on, on your thoughts on the matter. There are my thoughts. I think it's a cool mower and especially very cool if you already are in the Ego ecosystem. If I were gonna get one, I would lean more towards their heavier units, like their more commercial grades, like the C27. That would be my more my jam than the Sterling. For my taste, it's a little bit too light, um, and I just like a heavier mower, so there you go. All right, next up is R. Reed. He says, what's going on, guys? How's everyone doing? We're doing well, sir. Thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream. I gotta pick up the pace, because I got a lot of questions in here tonight, a lot of people hanging out, which I appreciate. Thank you guys for coming to hang out in the live stream. Next is Lavendi. He says, I've had aeration done for two years and I still have compacted soil. I cannot get it um, nice and lush. I'm tired. Okay, so Lavendi, um, and this is also for Patrick too, because this is one, one tip I forgot to give you that's also gonna be in that video, but you guys are kind of getting a, a Cliff's Notes version of the video now, is before you aerate, and I'm not sure if you've done this when you've had the lawn aerated in the past, uh, give the lawn a good irrigation cycle. So if you have irrigation built in, run it, run a heavy cycle on it. That is going the day before, not not the day of aerating, but the day before. So the day before you plan to aerate, do you plan to aerate? Run an irrigation cycle. That is going to soften up the soil a little bit. It's going to allow you to pull better plugs, which is going to help relieve compaction. So your lawn, you said it's very compacted. I get that, but that kind of tells me that either when you aerated, they didn't pull a good, you know two, three inch plug. I mean, really three inches is, is really what you're after with most rental aerator units. And if that's not coming out, then, you know, um, introducing some moisture prior to the aerating uh, job will help with that. Also, most people when they aerate, they only make like one pass. Like when I, when I did the lawn, and again, I, my artwork is absolutely horrible here, but um, you know, I made a pass, the pass is like this, my NASCAR track like this, and then I made another like this. So you, you you do both ways. I mean, there's nothing wrong with beating it up, beating up the turf and really, you know, really opening up that canopy. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Make sure you're doing a good job um, aerating that you have really good coverage as far as how much, how many cores you're pulling and, and, and how close the tines are next to each other when you're making an overlapping pass. If you do that, you should get a pretty good result as far as relieving compaction in, uh, in your soil lavendi. Next up is JC says, what's up, Ron? What's going on, JC? Thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream. I appreciate you. Next is No Name, which is kind of a name even though you say No Name. He says, happy Friday, Ron, and fellow lawn enthusiasts. Today, it's uh, hot in Georgia. I'm planning to air it uh, this week, as well as carbon, humic max, hydrotain, RGS. Need to manage this water with no rain. You're not kidding, man. You know, we were getting a bunch of rain earlier this spring, and now the rain is gone. It's like, oh, you, all, you guys want it to be hot? Now it's hot, right? We have no, uh, we have little to no rainfall. I don't think there's any rainfall in the forecast. I can look here really quick, but I don't believe there's any rain or any any appreciable about. So Sunday we have a forty percent chance, and then nothing for the next you know seven eight days. So we're not getting rain. So one thing, and that's a great point, uh, no name, is that if you guys want to reduce how much water you have to put on the lawn, uh, consider using a moisture manager like Hydrotain. What I'm talking about is uh, this product here. I'll show you guys here on the Golf Course Lawn Store. I sent out an email and text messages to people that um, have signed up for my mailing list and also that are signed up for uh, text on the store text alert. So you guys saw that. But if we take a ride here to the Golf Course Lawn Store, if you go to, uh, make sure this is refreshed. If you go to shop and then soil moisture management, you have a couple of options when it comes to hydrotain. You've got a granular, which I like the granular. I am a fan of the granular. Um, because it gives you a little bit more flexibility as far as application. Because with the liquid, um, you really need to water it immediately after it's applied. I mean, really, if you're really trying to do it well, you water the lawn before, you make sure it's damp before, you apply the liquid hydrotain, and then you water immediately after. When I say immediately after, I don't mean like three, four hours after. I mean, once you are done, you run an irrigation cycle and water it in. 
With the liquids, you get a bit better coverage or as far as, um, you know, for what you spend, you get more coverage on your lawn, but it's there as far as being easier to use or, you know, like as far as flexibility, it's less flexible. You have to, it's a lot more rigid about, about how you have to go about applying it. So either one of these guys will help reduce your watering. You know, Ecology also is up to 50%. That is that is valid. Like I started using Hydrotain last year and really, really like the results I got with it. I've already got an application down on my lawn this year. So it's a, it's a great product. If you're looking for ways to reduce moisture um, or lose, reduce the loss of moisture and, and, re and lower your watering bill, Seriously, look into hydrotain. It's not hard to apply, and um, it's it's going to make a pretty big difference in how your turf looks because you're not going to run into these situations where, or it's going to reduce the chances of you running these situations where you have like heat stress in the lawn and those types of things. So, we have those in stock and shipping now at the Golf Course Lawn Store. But definitely check that out. And uh, it's a good idea that you everything else you're doing is also great as well. Uh, no name. So thanks for for sharing that. But hydrotain really stuck out to me, so I wanted to also share that with everyone else. Two Trillas here, he says, Turf Talk time. It is, man. It is that Turf Talk time. It is that Turf Talk time. All right. Next up is uh, Todd Gleaves. He says, Ron, the Lawn Academy uh, subscription apply to guys like myself taking care of large lawns. Uh, I have slightly more than half an acre, but I'm looking to go up to two plus over the next few years. Yeah, so it, it does, uh, Todd. I mean, as far as, I mean, the, the Academy is really... Um, I mean, a, a lot of the content uh, that that is in the Academy is stuff that really would not work well on YouTube. So if you want to get like an in-depth understanding of what all the different nutrients do and why they're important to your turf, um, that's that the Academy covers that about how to use um, biostimulants properly. It, it covers that as far as mowing practices. That's in there and how to top dress your lawn. Um, that's that all that's in there. I'm working on, on doing a PGR module to add that to it as well. So. It's not so much that because if you have a larger lawn, it doesn't apply, but it's just that the, the scale of what you're using, it, uh, the, the amount of product you're going to use is going to go up. So if you have, you know, 5,000 square foot lawn, you know, you might use one bag of Essential G to do your 5,000 square foot lawn. I'd probably use two for me, but to say, just, just for, for argument's sake, let's say you use one. In your case, you have half an acre, so that is um, acres 43,000, so 22, 22,000 square feet thereabouts. Um, so you're going to use a lot more, right? You're going to use a lot more product. So if, if for someone like you, the thing I would say, you're a perfect example of someone that really should um, should learn how to use the professional, the pro grade, um, like fertilizers, herbicides, um, insecticides. Like you're you're a prime example of why that's a great idea because those products, while they tend to, while they they appear to be more expensive to buy up front, the coverage you get from them is a lot lot greater. Um, and, and the, the effectiveness you get is better. You know what I mean? So like a good example, can you, you can go to Home Depot and you can get a bottle of Spectricide for 10, 15 bucks, right? It's a good product for what it is. It does good. It does a good job, especially if you're willing to make a couple of applications to get, to, to get rid of the weeds, right? Compare that now to say something like Celsius Uncertainty, which is more expensive. It's several orders of magnitude more expensive, but if you mix them properly, apply them properly, you're going to do it once. You know what I mean? You're going to do that once. And as, and as far as like cleaning up a solid bowl lawn, um, you know, you're going to get a really good result with the pro grade products that you're, just, that you're not going to get out of the stuff that you're going to buy at the big box stores. So to, to, long, to answer your question, yes, it still applies to you. Everything's just going to be at a, at a bigger scale. And there's also the other aspects of the Academy that are, are valuable too. The private Facebook group is pretty awesome. Great group of guys and gals in there that are serious about turf care. So there's a lots of good, great um, reason in, uh, um, information and other reasons for, for joining in addition to the lesson modules, if that makes sense. So hope that helps. Um, if you have any other questions, drop me an email and we can chat about it some more and you can find out more about it both at golfcourselawn.com for the Academy. And the Academy is also available at the Golf Course Lawn Store. So either of those places, you're able to pick it up and learn more about what's, uh, what's in it. So Hope that helps, sir. I appreciate the question, and let me know if I can help with anything else. All right, next up is Steven Velasquez. He says, hey, Ron, there's a YouTuber stating that seed heads are a result of poor soil conditions, all the while promoting his soil amendment. Seems a bit scammy to me. What do you know? Any truth to this? Okay, so I don't know the video you're talking about. I haven't seen it, and I don't know which YouTuber you're talking about. But from my understanding, all right, and I'm, I'm Pretty sure I'm accurate on this, but from my understanding, seed heads are a stress response from the grass, right? So my soil is pretty healthy. Like my lawn gets babied a lot. It gets carbon, it gets micronutrients, it gets, it gets everything, it gets biosignals, it gets all, it gets everything thrown at it, right? And it gets mowed a lot. And I still have seed heads in my lawn this time of year, and I'm gonna have seed heads 
for two to three weeks, you know, and and the reason for that is because the, whenever the grass sees a change in environment, which it is, it's going through now, um, when temps were a little bit milder and now it's going into hotter temps, it's a stress response from the grass to say, hey, listen, you know what? Wow, if temps are going really high, I could be dying off here. I might die. Let's get out there and throw out babies. Let's throw out seeds, even though with hybrid Bermuda, they're all sterile. Um, I'm gonna throw out seeds so I can, so that life can go on and that Bermuda grass will still be a thing on planet Earth. So seed heads really are a, a response to stress. Now, to as far as um, if you have poor soil, if the soil is, um, if your, your, your lawn is, your soil is lacking nutrients, right? So if you're not putting enough water in it and it's also just lacking nutrients, like your NPK is not where it needs to be. Whenever seed heads show up, they're gonna stick around a lot longer. You know what I mean? So he having healthy soil does play a role as far as the lawn being able to transition from you know relatively cooler temperatures into the hotter temperatures of later spring and summer and making seed heads go away. So there is some truth that that soil, um, that healthy soil does matter, uh, but really the the nutrients that 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 will that help support that are NPK. So I'm not sure what the soil amendment is. I'm not sure what they're talking about. Um, but um, but yeah, so ho hopefully that helps. I mean, again, like the biostimulants, things like like Essential G or anything that helps with water retention, so like Hydrotain, Essential G, anything like any of the biostimulants from Miramichi Green, um, will help because again, your your you, you the nutrient availability is enhanced with those products. Um, but but really, if your soil, if you do a soil test, if you do a soil test, and your your NPK levels are where they need to be, seed heads in your lawn are really going to be you know, a two to three week thing. In most cases, that's that's what I always experience. Alice experiences it. So by, you know, late or late May, early June, they should be beginning to fall off and then it's just going to be mowing the lawn and, and trying to keep up with it. So hope that helps. Um, I, I don't know what soil amendment they'd be referring to unless it's like a starter fertilizer, uh, because that's the thing that I can think of that, that really would, um, it could potentially help with that. Also, if you're using plant growth regulators, so like so, so like Primo Max can also help with seed head um, suppression as well. Uh, PGR can help with that. But really, it's just something that your grass does. It just it it it's it's a thing that it goes through. It's it's completely normal. Just if as long as your soil is in great shape, it will pass, and you'll you know everything will be fine. So I would not stress about it too much. Hope that helps. I didn't see the video, so I'm not sure exactly what they were talking about. But you know, just hopefully my my response has, has given you some stuff to think about. All right, next up is, is uh, Trojan Dave. He says, how wet does the soil need to be to apply the granular hydrotain? Not wet at all, not wet at all. So when I've, I've, I've applied it to, um, to my lawn, actually I've never applied it to wet soil, the, the granular uh, Trojan Dave. So the granular, you can literally apply it and then water in after the fact, no problems with that whatsoever. It's the liquids that you want to have, you want it to be a bit of moisture on the lawn, apply that and then, wa and then water it in. As far as how much moisture, if you do it early in the morning when there's dew on the lawn, like, you know, when I do my, um, the intro video that you guys see where like the entire lawn is covered in dew, like that's, uh, that's a great example of, um, of what, of a good time when you could apply hydrotain and then run an irrigation cycle after that, and you're gonna get you're gonna get a good result. So for the granular, again, a lot less picky than uh, than the liquids than the liquids. All right, next up is Chris Burkett. He says top dress three days ago used four four and a half of the six bags of super sod just to use the last bag. Thinking about doing another light top dressing mid July on the front yard. Your thoughts on two top dressings per season, dude? I I've done as many as three in a season, so. You know, you're asking the wrong guy if you're asking someone as far as like top dressing your lawn a lot in a season. Like I am not a good accountability partner when it comes to mowing your lawn a lot and when it comes to top dressing, if your goal is to do less of it. If you wanna do more of it, then I'm, I'm your guy. Uh, so long short, long short um, Chris, is there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. If you have the time to get out there and the desire to get out there and uh, and take care uh, and do another top dressing job in late and mid July, then by all means go for it. Here's the thing that I, would, I might say, is you got it done, when did you do it? Three days ago, you got finished up. With the temps going where they are now, by you know, by June-ish timeframe, another two weeks, the lawn should be looking really good. What I might do, if it were me, is I might do a light top dress again right after that. Now, again, you said lights, so you're not gonna go as heavy as you did three days ago. And what's gonna happen then is the lawn is gonna be fully recovered before the 4th of the July. It's gonna be looking, uh, be looking awesome. And then you're not gonna have to be out there in the middle of the summer in mid-July heat. You know, that's the only thing. I'm more worried about you than the lawn. The lawn doesn't care. It's more you as far as being out there in mid-July 
uh, top dressing it. But yeah, there's no no issues whatsoever. Um, again, I've done as many as three in a season and there's there's no problem whatsoever. I mean, if you look at my videos from last year, there's the big major top dressing job that had the aeration and um, you know, the I did where I threw the entire kitchen sink at the lawn. And then later on in the season, I think in as far as like late July, early August, I did another some other spot top dressing. Uh, for the video that has like the orange bucket on it showing you how to level bumpy areas of your lawn. So, you know, as far as top dressing, I'm always out there messing around the lawn. No no problem with doing that whatsoever. With doing that whatsoever. Not, none at all. You know, and also I promised to show you guys as far as some of the work that I did today. I didn't, I, I completely um, gloss over one of my talking points. But as far as aerating, so this is uh, the aerator that I used. Um, you know, Alex and... Uh, I rented this guy from one of the big box stores and you can see we're all done. You see all the cores on the lawn. The lawn is beat up very really nicely, cores everywhere, cores for days, gotta love that. And then um, if we look at how the lawn looks now, this is it with cores on it. This is a video of it with cores all over it. And then what I did is because I want to take, um, I wanna put the true cut on it. I'm gonna use the true cut first. Not that I don't like my true cut, but it's the sacrificial mower, right? I want to run the true cut on the, to do the first cut with the true cut. I ran over right before the live stream the entire lawn with a leveling rake to help break up all the little the little plugs, little cores, right? So you guys see how it looks before. That's with the cores on it. And now this is it after. And it may not look like a difference, but there's, there's a pretty big difference as far as the number of cores that were on the lawn. So again, this is before. You see all the plugs. And then this is after. After doing it, going over the entire lawn with the leveling rake. And uh, and and working working those guys in breaking them up so you can again here you can see how it looks this is the after after uh, as far as the cores I'm um, running the leveling rake over the entire lawn to help disrupt the cores I am not someone that picks up my cores and in the video I cover that that you guys are gonna see hopefully that comes out Sunday if I can get it done in time we'll see um, but yeah that was all the hard work that I put in today it kind of sucked but it was worth it because the lawn's gonna look awesome when it bounces back. All right, next up is Mike Harvey. He says, hey, Ron, uh, thanks for the feedback on my pictures. A Headway G is already down. Aeration, Carbon Pro G, and FERT tomorrow. Is Humic Max enough, or should I get, I get a higher nitrogen FERT? So it depends on, like, it, like most things, Mike, it depends on the rate that you use to apply it. So if Humic Max is all you're applying as far as your nitrogen for the month, then the three pounds per thousand that I recommend is a little bit light. You know, the three pounds per thousand of Humic Max works out to about half a pound of nitrogen, just under half a pound of nitrogen at that three pound rate. But then you could go up to say five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And then you get closer to 0.72, um, something like that. Let me see here. I can I can tell you um, real quick. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. I'll tell you real quick exactly what it is. Um, yeah, so 0 0.8, you know, with 0 0.8 um, pounds of nitrogen, which is closer to, which is is, is more representative of a full feeding, um, you know, for a month for Bermuda. So if all you're doing is Bermuda, then go a little bit heavier. And when I say a little bit heavier, like three pounds to five pounds. Don't put 10 pounds down per thousand, per thousand square feet. Go from three pounds to five pounds. So a little bit heavier, and that's gonna put a little bit more end in the lawn. It's gonna, that's gonna be enough to feed the lawn for, uh, you know, for four to six weeks, no problem whatsoever. So hopefully that helps. Um, it's, again, when it comes to the higher nitrogen FERTs, it's not so, I mean, the, the, the number, yes, it has more nitrogen per volume as a percentage, um, but the, it's all about application rate. You know what I mean? You can take a 22016. If you apply it at one pound per thousand, you're putting out less nitrogen than say humic max at a low at a at a at a, at a higher rate. So you, it all comes down to um, how much of the product you're putting down at a time that really you know figures out really equates to how much N is going into the into the soil. So hope that helps, man. I will the, I will be thinking good thoughts for you tomorrow. You saw I got my aeration done. I got I got the uh, the aerator on the lawn. Got the the pictures to prove it. Got the T-shirt to prove that I aerated it and everything. So good luck tomorrow. Have fun and uh, hopefully that helps as far as you know going a little bit higher on that application rate of Humic Max. Great stuff. All right, Two Trilla is here. He says happy Friday, everyone. I hope all is well and your lawn is looking mean and green. It's looking mean. It's looking like it got like it got like it got punched in the face right now. It's not looking very green right now, but uh, you know, it will cover cover. It's gotta get better before, it's gotta get worse sometimes before it gets better, right, Tutrilla? So, such is life. Robert Rainey's in the in the house, what's going on, Robert? Thanks for coming to hang out, sir, I appreciate you. And then next up is, we showing our grass uh, lawn care LLC. Evening, Ron, how often are you watering the lawn and what time of day? All right, 
So right now I'm on a two week uh, irrigation cycle, twice per week. Um, on the back lawn, I am running a 15 minute cycle um, twice a week on that. On the front lawn, I'm running 10 minutes. So the front lawn is not getting as much water as the back lawn, but really it won't hold much more than that. So, you know, I got a question from a viewer. This is actually a great talking point because I got a, a question from a viewer about this a couple of days ago. And they told me, they said, hey, listen, I run my irrigation on my lawn every day and I run it for like three minutes in the morning and three minutes in the evening and my lawn looks great. I do it every single day. And I said, do you have any fungus problems in your lawn? He says, no. I said, did your grass look great? I said, yes. Is your watering bill you know, crazy expensive that you can't afford it? He said, no. I said, Let's keep doing it. If, it. if the grass looks good and you like and you and you're liking how it looks, um, especially and this person also tried. Um, they also tried doing um, like the heavier watering less frequently, like like more along the lines of what I do. And they didn't like the results. They did, the lawn didn't look as good when they did that. So, you know, watering is um, the, the, the textbook answer is Bermuda needs an inch of water from all sources over the course of a week when it's actively growing. All right. Full stop. That's what it needs. Um, but there's more that there's more than just that, because, again, like a, like my front lawn, which is a slope. I can't put, you know, an inch of water. I can't run an irrigation, run an inch of water on on the slope at one time, um, or really even over like in, in in two settings because it, the amount of water I have to put down, most of it's going to run off. So I, I answered your question as far as um, how often I'm I'm doing it and how and the amount the 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 the, t the cycles, the timing I'm using for running my irrigation cycles. But when it comes to irrigation, every lawn is different. Um, your water pressure makes a difference, right? So don't say that Ron's doing 20 minutes or 15 minutes in the back lawn and that's what he's gonna go, that's what I'm gonna go do on my lawn. It's different, right? You have to, I have a video actually talking about how to figure out exactly how long to run your irrigation that I'll post here in the chat for you in a second. Uh, we show it, uh, grass lawn care. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at the turf. Um, and it will tell you when it needs water. Something that can help with that is hydrotain. Something you can also that's going to help you know take the edge off if you miss watering or you're not doing enough is to get out there and keep up with your your watering. So, or sorry, is to keep is to keep up with with uh, with hydrotain, like the moisture managers. So hope that helps, sir. Um, if you have any other questions, let me know, and I will try and find that video for you on watering while I search for the next question. Yep, here we go. Boom, I got it. I got it, guys. Thank goodness for search, right? Google is, um, you know, Google's pretty awesome on, on their search engines. So, all right, um, so this is, uh, I'll just call it watering. And if, I, if there's any spelling errors, I'm typing fast, so don't hold it against me. So there you go. That video talks all about watering, some tips and tricks and websites you can go to to get, um, to help you get a good result. All right, next up is Jason Shriver. He says, what's the best way to kill crabgrass in a Bermuda lawn? Best way to kill crabgrass in a Bermuda lawn. So the best way to not have a crabgrass in a Bermuda lawn is to use pre-emergent, like not to have it there in the first place. But if you, you're you there and you got crabgrass, uh, the the best, or to say the best, or, or one of the most effective herbicides for crabgrass is called quinclorac. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a really, really good herbicide, especially for crabgrass. Um, even though it works very well against crabgrass, it works better if you apply it to young crabgrass. In other words, if you wait, if you were, if you have crabgrass all throughout your lawn now, uh, Jason, and you were to go after it with quinclorac, you're going to get a much better result than if you wait until like late June, early July, and then decide that you're going to spray quinclorac on the lawn when the crabgrass is already living its best life. It's in great shape. Um, you just, it's just not going to be as effective. So you want to really, you really want to just prevent crabgrass in the first place. But if you, you, you know, for whatever reason, you didn't get your pre-emergent down or, you know, you didn't apply it properly or just for whatever reason, you just have some breakthrough. That is where something like quinclorac uh, can work well if that is, if crabgrass is primarily uh, what you're after, primarily what you're after. So I'll put a link here in the chat for you um, to, um, to the one that I'm, I'm referring to. You are going to want to use a surfactant with this. Be sure to read the instructions, read the label. It gives you lots of great tips as far as um, applying it and how to get um, how to get a good result rates and all this type of things as far as using which as far as which adjuvants to use with it and how to use them to get a good result so definitely read the label um obviously for all herbicides but but for this for this one you really you really really do want to read uh read the label so all right next up let me get this get this to you and paste it before i go to the next question I'm slow, Ron. You're slow tonight, man. Come on, do be better. All right, next up is Lance from BK. He says, summer is finally here. What's going on, Lance? It is. Lance, summer is finally here. Thanks for coming to hang out and um, and and 
make us aware of that. Um, is it officially summer? I thought summer was a little bit later than now. I'm not sure we're officially in summer yet, but I mean, the heat feels like it. All right, next up is Josh Bronco. He says, they just started digging my for my pool this week. Oh, 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 you know, here's the thing. When I saw my neighbor getting the pool put in his lawn um, installed, now granted, it looks amazing now. It's like a Disney World pool. It's a crazy, the pool's awesome. Like one of the best pools I've ever seen in the back of a house. But whenever I saw the equipment show up and I saw what they were doing in the grass, this was me. No! That was me. That was me. I mean, it is, it's a very, it's a very, very savage process. So be, be, be prepared for that. Um, Josh, uh, it's, it's going to completely destroy your lawn. So don't, don't go into it thinking, Hey, they're going to be able to kind of compartmentalize where they tear up the entire, well, how much you got? 4,000 square feet. Um, it's going to be destroyed. And, and as you're already seeing that it's already covered up in, in dirt and I'm already out there with a rake trying to expose grass blades again, dude, it's going to be unless, and also true, unless you've got a contractor that has everything lined up to where they're able to get the pool done quickly, it's going to be a process. Like just, just go into this knowing that once the pool's installed, you're going to have to do a lawn renovation on some level because it's, it's, it's really traumatic. It's really hard on, on you know, the Bermuda. So the good thing is you have Bermuda, so it's going to come back. But uh, you know, I would not, I would not waste a bunch of time trying to preserve what you got because they're going to be out there with heavy equipment and skid stairs and dump trucks and doing all. The, it's just, just, just wreaking havoc. And it's best just to turn your eye, just turn away, avert your eyes until it's done. That's the best advice I can give you because I, I saw it happen her firsthand, and it was, um, it was painful. It's painful. You know, it wasn't even my lawn, and it was painful. All right, next up is Samuel Smith. He says, I overdid my top dressing with some areas heavier than others. How do I fix that? I feel like the grass is dying. So if you have a leveling rig, Samuel, what you can do is you can um, you can move, use it to move some of the material around to kind of expose those grass blades. If you have Bermuda, it's gonna be fine. Like even if you try to kill Bermuda, when, when you wanna get rid of Bermuda, you can't. So going heavy, um, while not my cup of tea, not what I really recommend, the Bermuda, the grass will eventually find its way through it and will recover. Um, it's gonna be fine. But if you wanna, you wanna get rid of it, if you're really worried about that, get your leveling rake around and just simply, you know, work the leveling rake and, and kind of plane off a little bit of the uh, the top dressing mix. Um, but again, if it's not running off, it's not making a big mess, then you might just leave it and just wait because the grass will grow through it. You're not going to kill the Bermuda. Bermuda's not going to be dead. You're not going to have like a big bear spot, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's just going to take longer for it to grow through. Hope that helps. But again, for this, you know, not to, not to use an example, but this is a reason why I say go light. Go light, right? Because the, the, you're doing less, you're putting, you're introducing less stress to the grass. It's going to recover faster. Your lawn's not going to look like a parking lot, um, you know, for as any longer than it has to. So there's a lot of reasons to go multiple times light than go one time super heavy, in my opinion. There's people that disagree with me, but um, you know, there's more than one way to, to, to get a great result in your lawn. All right, next up is Justin, uh, I'm saying Cherapy. He says, my seven-year-old son, wow, my bad. He's my seven-year-old son says, ask why my grass doesn't look like Ron's. Tell him, tell, tell the little whippersnapper at seven, that he needs to get out there in the morning and mow the lawn like Ron does and do all the stuff that he does. And then our grass can look like that. You know, he can't be throwing shade on you, telling, asking you how your lawn doesn't look like another man's lawn. I mean, come on. I mean, I know he's only seven, but you know, I, I, you know, I get it. I, I appreciate the kind words. Though. I appreciate, I appreciate the admiration from the seven year old, but just realize that this is season seven of, um, of working on my lawn. So it's like, I've been doing this for a while. Like what you, like what you see here, like this is, did not happen overnight. I mean, granted, you can get to 85% of this in a season. You know what I mean? You can easily get to, you can, you can get to a lot that looks really, really good, very comparable to this in one season, in the course of three months. Alex did it. But that extra, that last 15%, that last little X factor, that's what takes time and, you know, just being um, really diligent, just being consistent at working on your lawn. But, you know, I, I get it. I'm glad that my, my lawn is, is the standard in the household. I appreciate that. All right, next up is Oxan. He says, aerating on Monday, excited. I believe an outlet is on the horizon for me as well. Thank you for the video you did on that. You're very, very welcome, sir. I didn't have as much time with the unit as I would have liked, which, you know, for me is kind of painful because I really like to put a lot into making the content as good for you guys as possible. Hopefully you guys didn't hate it too much because it was very much a rush job. Um, you know, but I, I did the best that I could given the time that I have. And, and it, it came out all right, given, you know, given 
the um, the time that I have with the unit. And I, I think you'll like the Yala. It's a very well-built unit. Um, the only thing for me is I wish it were a little bit heavier. And given also that I have a large lawn, I want a wider track. I want a wider cutting, you know, a, a wider um, width of cut. So 20 inches, while that's, that's good, uh, I want something a little bit wider considering right now I'm cutting at 26 because it just takes a lot more time to, to, to the 20 inch mower. It's a pretty big reduction in, uh, in the stripe action. We can't, you know, we can't, we don't want to go down in stripe action. We always want to go up in stripe action, not down, never down. Next up is Paco Greaves. He says, everybody hit that like button. I'm sure as heck did and I'm proud of it. I appreciate that, Paco. Thanks so much for the support. You guys, it, for the 146 or so of you in here now, if you guys would not mind hitting that like button, I really, really would appreciate it. It's, it's free for you guys to do. and It's a great way to support the channel. And then um, Samuel is back. He says, sorry, I did the leveling with sand and top dressing and it's heavy. Yeah, I gave you some tips there, Samuel. It, it, the grass is likely gonna be fine. It's just gonna take longer to grow through it. So I, I wouldn't sweat it too much. Again, you can use the, um, the you can use the leveling rake to, to plane some of the material off and that will help it recover a bit faster. All right, next up is Chris P. He says, can I use Tenacity as a post-immersion on fescue spraying the entire lawn and not just spot spraying? You can, Chris, you can absolutely do that. I guess the question I would ask is, do you have weeds throughout your entire fescue lawn? Because that's the only scenario where I'd really wanna do that, right? So if you if you only got weeds in a few spots, that's when you spot spray. If your entire lawn is like a, a salad bowl and you're trying to get it under control and get, you know, reclaim the lawn, that is where a broadcast um, you know, application of, of tenacity would make sense. Same thing for Celsius Uncertainty. You guys know in, um, in this video that I did um, on these uh, on these products, like I can show you guys really quick here. If we go to weed killers, boom, yep, two, and look at um, like certainty or um, or Celsius, either one of these guys. In the video that I did here, that uh, that shows using both of those together, I do show spot spring because my lawn was not infested with weeds. But you know that same combination. My neighbor that, again, they recently moved in and they didn't have like a lawn care service. Um, there's like, a, there's like a, a, a period of time between when they moved in, there was no lawn care service. So this spring, they had a big mess on their lawn as far as like tons of weeds, like kind of a salad bowl. And that application of Celsius Uncertainty uh, with a little bit of release zero in it, a little bit of a kicker, um, over the entire lawn, one application cleaned the lawn up completely. So I got rid of the POA, I got rid of all the broad leaves. It just, the lawn looks way better as far as not having weeds in it compared to how it looked before. So. I say all that to say, um, Chris, that if you need it, you know, if the lawn needs it, meaning that you, you've got weeds everywhere, then sure, you know, make sure you uh, use a surfactant with it, follow the application rates, make sure that you're using a calibrated backpack sprayer. Um, and by that, I mean that you know what your walking pace needs to be like to ensure you're putting out a gallon of product mix over a thousand square feet or whatever dilution rate you happen to use. I like a gallon per thousand square feet, but make sure that you, that if that backpack sprayer, that the concentration that you mix up is supposed to cover say 4,000 square feet out of a four gallon sprayer, that you're putting it down over 4,000 square feet and not like 2,000 square feet. Cause that's when you run into problems, okay? That's the only big thing I tell you outside of, um, you know, reading the label, make sure you wear your PPE and all that, all that jazz. But, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, yes, you can use another entire lawn if it calls for it. All right, next up is Daniel Barros. He says, I'm too new to have a worthy question, but I wanna tell you I appreciate all your videos. I appreciate it, Daniel, thanks so much for that. And as far as having a worthy question, I don't know what you mean, I mean, any question. I mean, how do I get my grass green? Uh, you know, that's that's a worthy question. I mean, there's not, I can't think of a question that's really, that would not be uh, worthy uh, for, for consideration. So I appreciate it anyway, appreciate the kind words, and thank you for watching the live stream, I appreciate the support. Okay, next up is Todd Hickey. He says, I did my first top dressing project about two weeks ago on 8,000 square feet, all wheelbarrow and shovels, uh, 9,000 pounds, took all day and it was not enough. Likely I need about 14 to 16,000 pounds. Yeah, so it's hard to say for me, uh, Todd, you didn't say how, you see how big your lawn is? It's 8,000 square feet. So 8,000 square feet, um, yeah, that's not enough. Eight, um, how much did you use? You said 9,000 pounds? Yeah, that's not, not nearly enough because in general, in general, um, and it depends on whether the material's wet or not, but in general, a yard of level mix weighs, that has like 70% sand, 30% of some organic material, whether it be compost or soil, weighs around a ton, weighs around 2,000 pounds. So if you have 8,000 square feet, you really needed closer to, like you said, 16,000 pounds of material to be able to adequately cover you know, that, that square footage. So it sounds like you know the like you just, you, your, your numbers are right. Just get more of it and you'll be able to, to, to finish up the job. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's a general rule for any of you guys wanting to top dress. Um, 
when you go to a place that's going to sell you top dressing, a lot of them will want to talk, will talk to you about it, talk to you about it in weight. You want to ask them about it in volume. So say, I need a yard. I want like, say I have a 5,000 square foot lawn. I want five yards of material because they could say, you know, I want, you know, we'll give you two, we'll give you, um, 10,000 pounds. We'll give you, you know, um, you know, five tons of leveling mix, but if it's really wet, you're going to get, you're paying for a lot of water. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that they're, if wherever possible, they sell you the material is as a matter of volume and not as um, a measure of weight. So hope that helps. Todd, it sounds like you got it all figured out, sir. And uh, hey, you know, mistakes are nothing but an opportunity for us to more intelligently begin again, right? So you'll get it done. You'll get it done. All right, let me get down here and get a a uh, a lot. A, um, let me see what I got here. I got a super chat from Mr. Josh Habib. It's pretty awesome. Nice. Mr. Josh Habib's in the super chat. And guys, if you guys don't know, Josh is the reason why we have the official Lawn Care live stream cup. Josh applied this as a gift to the channel. So I appreciate you as always, Josh. Every time you come on, I'm going to remind people of that. So get used to it. All right. Super chat received. He says, Happy Friday. Happy Friday, doctor. Some fresh giveaway merch is on the way. Ooh, guys. And that's another thing like all the clean hats, like the really cool hats. Josh is the man, so make sure you're sure Josh lots of love. He's sorry for the delay. Rumor has it there's a global shortage, a global pandemic causing product shortages. Uh, side note, my neighbor, I gave my neighbor the McLean so he can join the fun. Cheers, pal. Wow, bro, that you know what? You didn't get a new mower, but the fact that you gave your uh, your real mower, a real mower that you had before to your neighbor, we gotta clap that up, man. We gotta clap that up. It's pretty awesome. That's a very, very generous gift. And it's cool that you're spreading the, sp the stripe action. Good that you're doing that, man. Appreciate you, Josh. Thank you so much for uh, the uh, the love and support. And let me see, you had the same amount as LG, so you guys will share it. How about that? We'll say Josh and LG are the show sponsors right now. So that's very cool. Both of you guys are now have your name in lights on the Lawn Care live stream for whatever that is worth. Think about all the bragging rights. You can you can show it to your friends at work and be like, hey, look, that's me. I'm in the live stream. They probably won't care, but at least it's there, right? It'll live there forever, as long as YouTube's a thing. Okay, next up is Mike Havey. He's back. He says, hey, Ron, uh, let's see here. I also have the Carbon Kit, and should I throw that down as well as the Carbon Pro G? Yes, yes, absolutely. So the as far as biosimilants go, for the Miramichi Green biosimilants, I do, um, I do the Carbon Kit, which is something that I put together. I partner with Miramichi Green to put together, um, and I use that with Essential G. That is a product that I use. Carbon Pro G, uh, they're made by Miramichi Green. They're excellent product as well, too. If you got a site one nearby and can pick it up, um, you know, you can, frankly, you'll save some money on shipping. I mean, I don't make any money on it, but it's a great way for you to be able to use more of the product on your lawn, which is going to help you green, get greener grass, which I'm all for. So whatever you got to do to get it, get it and apply it to your lawn. That's that's the thing, um, big thing. But yes, to, to answer your question, you, you do want to use, um, using them together is a great idea because in Carbon Pro G and also in Essential G, um, while those products are, ha they have, um, the granulars anyway, have compost, a compost component to them and a biochar component. The biochar is really the, the sweet, the awesome stuff of that, that product, right? The charged biochar. Because really biochar doesn't go away. You know, it's, it's the, I think the half-life of it is something like 500 years. So we'll all be dead and gone. And the, bio, the, the, the biochar that you put in your lawn will still be there. Um, and the, the benefit of that is whenever you fertilize your lawn or you water your lawn, it, it's um, you can think of it almost as like a bunch of little safety deposit boxes that you apply that you're putting into the soil right below the soil surface. So that so as far as making uh, helping with nutrient availability, charged biochar is like really one of the best things you can do to your lawn. Now it's it's one of those things that um, it's really more an, of an investment type thing in the sense that you apply Carbon Pro G to your lawn. Um, are you going to see it turn green like two days later, like you will with a liquid fur? No, but are you going to notice that? Whenever you um, you apply fertilizer to your lawn, especially after you've been doing it for a while, that overall the color remains more consistent, that it goes into dormancy later, that it comes out of dormancy sooner, that that um, as far as you're, you're also able to get away with putting less water on the lawn, like all those things are going to be benefits of doing this. So I would I would absolutely use them both together. Um, again, I do. I did my um, my my June uh, uh, essential G application today because I aerated the lawn. I went down super heavy uh, with that. And then tomorrow I'm going to be applying the carbon kit. So for any of you guys that are in the live stream, don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so if you go to the golf course lawn store and we go to Miramichi green biosimilants, or if you go to the homepage, you can find it that way too. Um, currently essential G is sold out guys. And I can talk about this really quick. Um, we have more coming in stock 
uh, the end of next week. So if you, you can't place an order now because I don't want to have a bunch of back orders, um, but the week of May 23rd, so next, the, the, not next this Monday, but the Monday after that, um, it'll be, it should go back in stock by then and you can order it. Um, what you guys can do is go here and add your email to be notified when available. And then that way, literally as soon as I set it back in stock, you're going to get an email saying, hey, it's back in stock and you can go and you can buy it and you can you know, and enjoy all the awesomeness that is Essential G. So that it's, it's out of stock, but it's going to be back very, very soon. Add your name to the notify list so that you can be, you know, you can be notified whenever it comes back in stock. All right, so that's the granular portion of it. The carbon kit, there's a couple of different versions of that. And I'm not sure which one you have, Mike, um, but there is a 10,000 square foot version and a 5,000 square foot version. And then there's also a 901C version and a non 901C version. So which one should you go with? If you have a liquid fertilizer of choice that you already you already like, you know, you already got your vintage that you like to use on your lawn, then the non-901C version is the one you want to use because it comes with really zero, comes with NutriKelp, and it comes with biospectrum. This is what you get in the um the the, the standard 5,000 and 10,000 square foot kit. If you decide to go with the 5,000 or the 10,000 901C kits, those instead of having really zero, what you're going to get is this, which is, let me t t get, out the, get out the screen here so you can actually see it. Instead of release zero, you're gonna get release 901C, which is release zero with fertilizer in it. It's got 9% nitrogen and 1% potassium in it. So this is essentially, not essentially, it is, it's release zero with fertilizer added. So that's how you would choose between those if you decided that you were gonna go for the, for the um, which carbon kit. I am currently using the 901C kit because um, the fertilizer that I normally use, which is Turfplex, awesome fertilizer, by the way, um, it contains phosphorus, and I'm trying to limit how much phosphorus I put into my uh, my lawn, at least this first part of the growing season. So either one of these you're gonna have an awesome time with, either one are gonna, are gonna great, produce great results, um, and but that's how it all breaks down and how they are, um, you know, the, the how they break down and how, they, um, how to make the decision between which one you go with. All right, great stuff, great stuff, great question, Mike. I really do appreciate it. Next up is Luis Rodriguez. He's saying, hey, Ron. Hey, Luis. Hopefully you're doing well, sir. Thanks for coming to hang out in the show. Appreciate you as uh, as always. I think Luis works in the turf care industry. He always is able to answer those obscure questions. Hey, Luis, while you're here, what is this stuff, man? Um, not that. That's my lawn. <laughs> uh, what are these? You know, a viewer sent this in on their lawn. It showed, it showed up in their lawn. Any idea what that is? So if you've only been here for a little while, take a look and let me know what you think um, about that. It looks kind of gross. I'm not sure what it is. So I'll throw it to you guys. All right, next up is Dalen Krause. He says, hey, Ron, scarified yesterday. I plan to aerate Thursday, followed by leveling and top dressing. Is that too soon for the grass to recover from the scarify? Can you explain the difference between a scarify and a verticut? Great, great question. Lots of great stuff in this one. All right, so scarification is um, think of it almost like, um, also, it's also known as, as like power raking or turf raking. So think of like little, if you could take like um, like spring loaded um, fingers, like very th uh, thin spring loaded fingers that, um, at, that, that are placed on a reel, on a, on a, spinning, on a spinning cylinder, um, what it does is it scratches at the turf depending on how deep you set the, how deep you set it. And it's a great way for removing debris from the lawn. It's a good way for, for, um, for, um, for just getting, getting debris and getting trash out, out of the lawn. It also helps to align the grass. It helps to stand the grass up and, and align it. Uh, so that is scarification. Um, it's something that really most people do on, on, um, on non-creeping grasses. So if you take like a, um, like a fescue, or like a rye grass, like those types of grasses, those tends, those are the lawns that I, those are the grass types that I think about more when it comes to scarifying. People do scarify the Bermuda, um, but in general, scarification is really done on, you know, on grasses like a fescue or a, um, or a rye grass. Verticutting is um, take, again, the same cylinder, but instead of having little fingers, add little vertical blades. All right, and these vertical blades, if this, if the My Soil Test Kit is the surface of the soil, you'll set the blades at just, you know, a, a, maybe a couple of millimeters below the surface, just, just barely below the surface, not down here where you're trying to dig a trench, just barely below the surface. And the idea behind that is if you have a lawn like mine or a creeping grass like Bermuda, um, Kentucky bluegrass, um, or any, any kind of creeping um, uh, grass type, um, verticutting is going to cut a lot of the stones, it's gonna cut a lot of the, um, the, the, the runners, and it's a great way to help thin out the lawn. So if, so if you, by, by verticutting it, 
Um, you're not ripping all the sto all the stolens up, all the runners up, and kind of making a mess of the lawn, which tends to happen with scarification. Um, with verticutting, you're literally cutting them, you're kind of dicing them, um, which is gonna promote new growth because you take a stolen, right? Let's say it's it's running, it, it comes out, out of the crown, it begins running, um, and it tacks down here. If you verticut it, now you've got new growth from here. You got new growth from here. Let's say my, my this nub, this knuckle is a, is a is like a another crown, another um like another point where it tacks down. You have new new growth from here from where it started, and you have new growth from here. Um, you know because these two have now been severed. So it's a great way to help thin out, uh, particularly Bermuda, because what happens with Bermuda is when as as it begins growing um, in June and July and really begins to thicken up, what you'll find to happen is it can is all those runners can cause the lawn to get a bit. For lack of a better word, a bit spongy. So verticutting is a way to help reset that and get rid of that. It helps, it, it literally thins the turf out in a way that doesn't do the, the type of damage to it that say scarification does, in my opinion, on, on creeping grasses. So they are very different processes. Verticutting, in my opinion, is really more for a creeping grass type lawn. Scarification is better suited to like fescues, rye grasses, grasses that don't have stolons. That's that that's my my take on the matter. But again, there are people that scarify and verticut Bermuda and they do it all day long and their grass looks good. Um, but the, you ask for the, the difference between them and that's the difference. Hope that helps. Great question, Dalen. Let me know if I can help with anything else. Next up is Rusty's Creations. He says, hey Ron, Texas heat here, no rain in sight. Hydrotain went down earlier this week. How often should this apply for best results monthly? So the label says it will it will last for up to three months. I have never gone three months on it. What I tend to do is apply it every six weeks or so. Worst case, two months, like eight weeks, but six weeks is what I, I tend to uh, to go for on that. The product isn't terribly expensive, um, and given what it saves you as far as money, as far as running your irrigation, well worth it, right? Well, well worth it. So you uh, monthly is probably a bit much, but I'd say anywhere between that six to eight week time frame is a good um, number, is a good time frame as far as um, ensuring you're always getting the benefits from it while also not spending too much money because you're applying this stuff down every month because there's really no need to do it every single month. But again, according to the label, you can potentially get up to three months worth of coverage. All right, next up is Andrew Zimmerman Van. He says, hola, Dushi, Grizzlies from, from Holland. So Dushi is a very, so it's, um, I wonder, are you, I, wonder, I guess you're speaking Papamento, right? Because um, Dushi is a term of endearment, like, so... I, the island that I grew on is Stacia, but if you go to like Curacao and Bonaire, the, the, the language on Curacao, or the most commonly spoken language, is Papamento. And Dushi is a like a um, it's like a term of endearment. So it's not like he's not he's not being insulting. It's a it's a term of endearment. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew um, Van Summerman. That's a very, very Dutch name, very Dutch name. So uh, thanks for coming to hang out in the live stream. I appreciate the support. All right, next up is Zach Salinger. He says, Hey Ron. I'm about to purchase a California trimmer, mainly because I have a distributor close by and can service it. That is an excellent reason to buy a California trimmer. Any thoughts or opinions on it? I will be getting it next week, ready to real mow. California trimmer, um, it's a real mower. So as long as it's set up right, you're gonna get a great result with it. Uh, I am not a fan of the propulsion system of the trimmer, but that doesn't really matter, man. You can get a great cut with a McLean, with a California trimmer or a true cut. All of them can cut the grass well if you're dealing with a sharp mower and it's set up properly. The, the big thing I'd say is you have a dealer that's nearby that can work on it. So for that reason, I really am gonna lean more towards that. Even if, even though I like a true cut more, let's say in your where you are, I'm not sure where in the country you are, but ooh, nice, nice bass, by the way. Um, I'm not sure where in the country you are, um, but you know, if you don't, even though a Greensmaster or Toro Greensmaster will produce a better cut than a California trimmer, if you don't have a Toro dealer nearby or distributor that can work on it, wrong mower for you. So I think that the trimmer is the, is the mower. That's the that's the one for you. What I think really doesn't doesn't matter. The only thing I would say is make sure that it's set up properly. Keep it sharp. I can't stress that enough. Like as much as we are on our, our lawns mowing, it's really important that the equipment be kept really sharp to, for for a good result. For a good result. You know, one of these times I might pick a portion of my lawn and just and make it sacrificial and back the uh, the reel away from the bed night just a little bit so that it's not cutting paper and just mow that area for like a few, you know, for a week and show you guys the difference between like having a mower set up properly and not having a mower set up properly, what the difference in color you'll see on the lawn. I might do that. It might pay me to do it, but it might make for a cool video. So congrats on the mower, applause your way. And there we go. All right, Mark Hayes says it's called dog vomit fungus. I have to look at that. Is that really a thing or are you messing with me? Dog 
vomit. Let me Google uh, vomit fungus. It's a it's a it's apparently a thing. It is a thing. Wow. All right. Uh, very very cool. So uh, Mark Mark, you have uh, you've won the um, you know that's that's very very cool. Thanks thanks for so much for for answering that. If you tell you what, as a prize, I didn't really announce this, but if you want a um, you know I'm not sure if you ordered anything from the golf course lawn store, but if not. And if you'd like a golf course lawn sticker, I mean, that's all I got to give you right now. If you'd like a sticker, um, send me your address, like email me here, ron at golfcourselawn.com. Say, I was the guy that knew that it was dog vomit fungus, man. Send me my sticker and I'll see if there's anything else I can send your way. Um, any other cool stuff, um, do that and I'll send that to you in the mail. So, cause I appreciate you answering the question. So thanks for that. Dog vomit fungus. I learned something new tonight. So again, my email is just ron at golfcourselawn.com. Send me an email if you want the sticker and maybe and some other some other stuff I might be able to dig up to send your way and I will get it going. Appreciate the support. All right, next up is Jason Sneeze says, you got it, my dude. All right, uh, I, if you're talking about Mark, you're right. Mark was the uh, was the man. Uh, Todd says some kind of bacterial growth. Mark already knew it, guys. He he was the first one to get it right. He knew exactly what it was. He was like, guys, I mean, fungus is my game. You don't know me. You guys, you guys can't 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 step to me on my on my fungus game. It's dog vomit fungus, yo. Okay, next up is uh, I can't chicken Chen, chicken Chen. I think it says um, it says what's going on, Ron? Uh, lawns look great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Because I've got hybrid Bermuda and a lot of my runners are sticking up in the air and not sending roots down. So it doesn't feel super compacted, but can't real cut it. Huh. So a lot of your runners are sticking up in the air and they're not sending roots down. That's interesting. So how long have you been real mowing um, um, chicken or, or sea kin chen? Um, because if, you know, here's the thing, like, like, kind of like when you cut your hair, like the, the more you mow the grass, you can begin to train how it grows. So if you just started mowing, uh, started real mowing, I'm not surprised that the Bermuda is not co cooperating right away. Uh, the only thing I can also think about is um, if you did pre-emergent and you went really, really heavy on uh, on the rate, I mean, that can that can you know limit or prevent how well the stolons tack down as they're running. It's called like root clubbing. I, you know, I, I, that's pretty uncommon unless you go, unless you're going, you know, way above the um, the, the the specified rates. Outside of that, um, I can't think of what else. If you're saying your soil feels super compacted, you, sir, um, or ma'am, I'm not sure if you could be a girl, um, are, are a great candidate for aerating your lawn. So what you're going to do is get one of these bad mama jammas. You can rent one at your local big box store or equipment rental place. And you're going to do battle with running this on your lawn and that is going to do a lot to help relieve compaction. If you can hang on until Mon until Sunday, hopefully I can get it done, I will have a video that will show the entire process, explain some tips and tricks on how to get a good result, some things you really wanna pay attention to, so watch that video before you go out and get an aerator. And um, and yeah, that, that will that should help with your compaction, your compaction issue. I mean, Bermuda should still root in fairly well, it'll grow in anything, but if your lawn is like super, super compacted, that is not helping um, that's definitely not helping the, the the grass to send out roots and to spread and just to grow in and be healthy in general. So if you've never aerated, consider doing that. I think that will help. You know, that will help. I, I don't think I know it will help. It will help your lawn. Uh, great question. And I appreciate you uh, chiming in. Let me know if I can help with anything else. Okay, next up is Dalen Krause. He says, also, before I top this, I plan to put down Humic Max Humichar. <laughs> You're going really hard on all the carbon. Humic Max, Humichar, and the Carbon Kit and Turfplex. Would it be best to do all of that two to three days before or the same day? So here's what I would do, Dalen. I would do, um, you could do the Carbon Kit, any of the liquid ferts that you want to put down, I would do those um, either the day, a couple days before or a couple days after. Either one will work. If you want to do a couple days before so you kind of get them in the grass and get the grass, you know, you're starting to, to grow a little more aggressively, that makes a lot of sense. Everything else that's granular, I would wait until you, um, I would do this part of your um, your top dressing or aeration project. So say, say, you're, say you're aerating, then the Humic Max Humichar um, can go down then. So you would aerate, apply your biostimulants, Humic Max and Humichar, um, and then top dress on top of it. If you are not aerating, it still kind of applies in the sense that I would still do your, um, your liquids first, so Turfplex and the Carbon Kit first. And then I would apply your um, your biosimilants, Humichar and or Humic Max um, 
um, and your fur like prior to um, the top dressing going down and then top dress on top of that. So regardless of whether you're aerating or not, I would apply the granulars prior to the top dressing being applied to the lawn. Because if you think about it, those need to get down into the soil to work and you know, top dressing is, it has like a soil component to it in many ways. So why would you like, you know, top dress and then lay the stuff that has to get past the top dressing um, on top of it? So apply that first, top dress on top of it, and then you're good to go. You're just, you're just like fast tracking the process. And if you aerate, even that much better. Great question, hopefully that helps. Let me know how your top dressing project works out. All right, uh, Clint Brock says, bro, T-necks down on Wednesday, still at half an inch. Uh, push real sand soon. I want to hear the talking points to convince the wife into the liberty. Man, you are not going to try and get me in between you and your wife on a real mower. I mean, I, I will say this. I mean, you can tell her that, you know, you take a lot of pride in the lawn and you want, you know, the lawn to be you know, the best lawn in the neighborhood. You want to be to the talking point of the neighborhood. And when she comes home from work, then she drives home. She sees a very appealing lawn that stands out from the lawns around it. And that by having a powered real mower, you're going to be able to do that, uh, you know, at a, at a more efficient, uh, more efficiently than a push reel. You'll be able to mow the lawn faster, which means more time with the family. Uh, if you're getting the the Liberty, I believe that one is electric. So you're also like, you know, you're checking off the, um, you know, the green, uh, the green box as far as being more environmentally conscious. There's a whole lot of reasons. I mean, I, I might go so far as to say, you know, you love the planet and you want to do your part while also getting a great lawn and hence the Liberty is a great, great purchase. And because you love her so much and you wanna spend time with her more, you wanna get away from this push reel more, which is taking more time and go to a powered one because it would be faster. That's that's what I would go with. It may or may not work, but that's the best I could come up with in, a, in like you know, 15, 20 seconds. Let me know how it works for you. Your mileage may vary, it's the best I could do. All right, next up is Todd Hickey. He says, no R15 seed available. Uh, super seed supplier is supp suggesting Yukon as a close alternative, similar price point. I have a Tiffway 419 yard and I have never overseeded suggestion Eastern North Carolina. Okay, so Todd, first of all, I'd, be, I'd ask you why you want to overseed. That's that's thing one. I mean, there are, Arden 15 is a beautiful grass type. I do love it. It does look awesome, right? There is that. But Tiffway 419 also can look really nice if it's well cared for. Um, I know that Tiffway and um, Arden 15 play nice together. They look They look fairly nice together. Um, the seed heads from Arden are a, lit, are a bit bigger than the seed heads that the Tiffway 419 throws off. So there is that. But overall, as far as two grasses that, you know, when you, when you look at my lawn, if you look at like this picture here, that lawn is Tiffway and Arden 15. It's a mutt lawn, right? So it's a bit of, it's a bit of both, right? And overall, the color looks fairly even. Um, and the growth is also fairly even between those two. I don't know if that's going to be true for Yukon as well. But again, I would question what's the reason why uh, you'd want to, um, you know, why you want to oversee the, uh, the the 419. If it's a way to fix a bare spot in the lawn, not a great way to do it because whatever's causing the lawn to be bare currently is just going to resurface again after you put seed down. Um, and because I've never seen Yukon and Tifway together, I don't, I can't recommend that. I can't, you know, for most people, I don't recommend overseeding Bermuda anyway, because um, it's it's expensive for the, from a standpoint of seed. Um, most people are doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, and uh, not only expensive from a seed standpoint, um, but also from a water, the amount of water you need to use to be able to get it to grow in properly is also quite a bit. And it's not a one year thing. What you tend to see is the first year when I seeded my lawn, it looked okay, but it didn't look, it didn't look as good as it looks now. You know what I mean? So it's it's uh, it's going to be a multi-year thing getting the two grass types to blend to where it kind of looks even. So that's why for the most part, I just recommend to most people not to do it because they don't, like most people are doing it again for the wrong reasons. Um, and it's also a cost, it's pretty expensive to do and get a good result um, from the process. That makes sense. And I don't know what UConn looks like. So for that reason alone, I'm not going to recommend it. Hope that helps, Todd. Um, you know, we'll see what, just, just hang out, see what, um, what Pennington comes out with as far as a replacement for Arden 15. And if you really love it, you say, wow, this is the grass for me, then smoke your, your Tiffway, like burn it down and then go with uh, whatever they come out with, Arden 17 or whatever they happen to call it. All right, hope that helps. Let me know if you need anything else. All right, next is Jackie Bear. He says, that fit, that picture looks like uh, Fuligio Septica. I've seen that happen in my mulch. That's another option. So Jackie Bear is saying that. Um, 
the dog vomit or dog vomit fungus is um, that it's a pretty good match. I think that's that's what I'm seeing. When I look at the pictures here, that matches what I see on the lawn. So um, thin cut if you're here, dog vomit fungus is what it's called. There's probably a probably a better, like who knows, fuligo septica might be the actual, like the Latin name, the actual name for it. But um, dog vomit fungus definitely looks like what he's got going on in his lawn. All right, next up, LG says, Ron, looks like you're back in fighting shape. Yeah, man, I'm trying to, you know, I, I, try, I try to not get out of fighting shape, but you know, you know how it is, man. You know how it is, it's constant effort, constant effort. Getting old is not easy, so you always gotta, you always gotta work at it, man. All right, JG's back. JG's in the house too, LG and JG, y'all are both back. It says, happy Friday, y'all. Very cool to see both of you guys back in the live stream. All right, next up is Archie Amos. He says, evening, young man. I always feel like I'm talking to my dad when someone calls me young man. He says, uh, did lawn leveling, uh, did my lawn leveling, added essential G, and now it is raining. Question, do herbicides hinder grass growth? Uh, do they hinder grass growth? I mean, I mean, temp they can temporarily, depending on the ones that you uh, on the ones that you use. You know what I mean? So yes, yeah, so they if you if you um if you apply a herbicide and it's the type that you know causes some stress to the to your existing lawn the grass is going to grow a little bit slower for a period of time but that only should be for you know, a couple of days a week at the most it's not going to be a, it's not it's not like pgr in other words if you were to go out and apply like i don't know say something like dismiss right which tends to discolor a lawn right it's pretty it's it's a, it's a decent herbicide but it's as far as one that is going to put some discoloration into your your bermuda dismiss is one of them um, is, is the Bermuda that got, that got hit with dismiss going to grow a bit slower for a few days, maybe a week? Yes, but it's not like it's a growth regulator or anything like that. I would not use it for that, that purpose if that's what you're, um, you're asking. So if the question is, Hey, I, I applied certain to yourself, sure. I applied some of the herbicide to my lawn and the grass seems to be growing a bit slower at the time. Uh, that's completely possible, but it, it should be relatively temporary and good job on getting the essential G down and the rain. Nothing like, nothing like free water, right? Tough to beat free water. All right, next up is Lois H. She says, a large patch showed up in my yard. Research results, it's dog vomit slime mold or scrambled egg slime often found on bark mold. So thanks, y'all. You guys are, got the answer. Y'all came back with it. Um, I think Mark uh, was the first. But um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting the name, right? Dog vomit slime or dog vomit fungus because that's what it looks like. It's, pre it's just pretty gross. It, looks like someone, it doesn't look like someone threw up on the lawn, right? So... Thanks for that, Lois. And you said it's often found on ball, on bark and mulch, and I do see that. So if we, um, you know, I can show you guys here. It's very, it's very similar. Like what you guys are saying is exactly um, is exactly right. So we go to images on the Google, and you can see that that looks along the lines of what he's got going on in his lawn. This one here looks like it's about to uh, to pop. This um, this guy. You see the little red stuff there. Maybe that's the the red that we saw in his picture. But uh, but yeah, that looks like what he's got going on on his lawn for sure. So thanks guys, thanks for everyone for chiming in. I appreciate how we all came together to solve this problem, which is really cool. No, I can knew I could count on you guys. Knew it could happen. Knew it could happen. And he says, uh, so you're saying it happens on bark and mulch. He says, or in lawns in urban areas after heavy rain or excessive watering, their spores are spread by the wind. Lois is laying down the knowledge tonight. Great stuff, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for that, Lois. All right. And next is uh, Papa Mo's Low. He says, I had a spot around three feet around, look similar to dollar spot webs, but they look slimy. Allowed headway G, applied headway G, and it disappeared the next day. Thoughts on what it might have been? Okay, so you had a spot three feet around, looked similar to dollar spot webs, but looks slimy. It, it could have been dollar spot. Here's the thing, Papa Moslo, I'm trying to think, do you have zoysia or Bermuda? Um, at any rate, in Bermuda, dollar spot normally does not, is normally not an issue if you are feeding your lawn properly. So if you have a Bermuda lawn that is, that ha is getting enough nitrogen, while you might see the little spider webs on your on your lawn early in the morning, I see them on my lawn occasionally, they never stick around very long and they don't cause a problem. They don't cause any injury to the lawn. So um, applying the Headway G, yes, that absolutely is um, can help with that because the propiconazole in Headway will target a, a dollar spot. But for most, um, again, most warm, or not most warm season grass, but like for Bermuda anyway, uh, dollar spot typically is not a thing if you're feeding or not, or not an issue anyway, if you're feeding the lawn properly. So 
Hope that helps. I'm glad Hedwig took care of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, Hedwig's a great product. You know, I mean, getting both the Azoxyshobin and the Propaconazole in, all in one is a is a is a good good combination. It's a great combination for residential lawns. And you know, this time of year is the time to apply it if you're trying to put down a preventative fungicide. We have that in stock at the Golf Course Lawn Store. So feel free to check it out if you are so inclined. Thanks for that feedback, um, Papa Moslo. Next is. Eric, he says, hey, Ron, I closed on my house in Austin. I was able to sneak and throw down some humichar before the sod was laid. The builder did a horrible job rolling the lawn, dips everywhere. That's not uncommon, Eric. What you might find is once, take a sip here. Mm, I'm back on the premium stuff tonight, guys. I got the Milo's out tonight. All right. Um, it's not uncommon that for a new lawn, when they apply the sod, it takes a while for it to settle. Even after it settles, depending on how good a job they did preparing it, it's not uncommon for there to be dips on uneven spots in the lawn. But we could fix this. We could fix this. Uh, you just have to top dress it. You know, that's that's it's going to mean some work from you. But top dressing is will will fix the issues that you're talking about as far as dips and uneven areas of the lawn. I've got a video. I've got a big video on top dressing, and then I've got a shorter video on just leveling small areas of a lawn. If that's something you want to look at doing too. I will find and post that in the chat for you now so that you've got it. And uh, you can take a look at that. I think this video, the end of this video that I'm posting links to the bigger video that shows doing the entire lawn. So you'll be uh, you'll be covered either way, Eric. Um, appreciate the question. And hopefully that video is useful as far as helping you get start your, uh, your journey as far as leveling your lawn, getting rid of all those dips in your lawn. Appreciate the feedback. Uh, happy Friday the 13th. It is Friday the 13th. Oh my. Oh boy. Hopefully nothing bad happens, right? I mean, something bad happened to my lawn today. Look at this. Look at, look at how, look at how, how it hurts, guys. Actually, I'll show you the, the more, the worst one. It hurts. Look at it. Look, look at it. It's nasty what happened. The core error to this machine did a, did a baddie, about a bad thing to the, to, to my lawn, right? Sure did, but it's, uh, it's worth it. It's gonna, it's gonna look good after it's all said after it's all said and done. You know, it was a worthwhile, worthwhile sacrifice. Necessary evil. Okay, next is Todd Hickey. He says that I have a similar area. Uh, in It's inside a circular driveway with a tree. Shade makes it difficult to for the Tiffway to thrive. Thinking about replacing the Tiffway with a more shade tolerant grass. Suggestions? Uh... Without seeing the pictures, it's hard to say. You know, the, you know, when Super Sod was on a couple weeks ago, they um, they're talking about um, Tiff Tough. You know, their sod, which requires a little bit less sunlight, but it still requires sunlight. If you want to stick with warm season grass, Todd, I would lean more towards Zoysia. Zoysia does better with less direct sunlight than Bermuda does, and frankly, it's a very pretty grass. So if you have like a circular driveway, like when you're entering, you have like a circular. Like, the, like one of those circle drivers that people drive around to go to your house. Zoysia is a very pretty grass as far as like a, a lawn or a grass that is not going to see a lot of heavy use because it sounds like it's just more of an ornamental portion of your lawn. Uh, zoysia is a great choice for that. I would not put zoysia on a lawn that's going to be heavily used because it doesn't recover from injury as quickly as Bermuda. But for what you're talking about, a little bit more shade and you want something that's going to you know look really nice in a, like as far, again, for a more an ornamental um, looking lawn, then zoysia um, would possibly do the trick. I, it'd be good to see pictures if you don't mind. So send me pictures here to ron at golfcourselawn.com so you can take a look at it um, because you still are going to want five to six hours, five to six hours of direct sunlight every day for Zoysia to really do well, uh, whereas Bermuda needs like all the sun. You know, I, I used to say like seven, eight hours, but really Bermuda, the correct answer is all the sun you can get it. The more sun, the better. All right, next up is Arch Amos. He says, should I add the cocktail you just talked about Behind the essential G, uh, biochar and humichar. It's your call. It's kind of duplicate. You're kind of duplicating. Um, you're just adding extra. I mean, those products, they're similar. Um, I've never used humichar to know what kind of results you would get from it. Um, but but I believe that I believe that humichar is charged biochar as well. I, I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. But the one thing about, with essential G, um, Archie, is that the biochar in it is charged, meaning that the, the crevices and pockets that are in it are already filled with good stuff that helps improve the quality of your soil. So it's 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 a net giver when you apply it versus a taker like raw biochar would be. Um, can't really comment on any of the other on the humichar. Again, I've never used it, but people that use it seem to like it. So it's kind of kind of your call. 
if it were me, I would likely just put down more Essential G. So if you're asking, should I do Essential G and Humachar, I would just do more of Essential G if it were me. If your budget permits, I'd just, just throw more of it down. All right, next up is Todd Gleaves. He says, PGR, is it still good to use for us even if we aren't mowing low uh, two-inch Bermuda cut? How long after new sod would you consider um, PGR? Yeah, there's still benefits to it, even if you're not mowing short, Todd. Uh, I mean, the thing with, it's typically used by people that are mowing their lawn shorter so as, as a way to not have to mow your grass every single day, right, depending on your height of cut. Um, but yeah, it absolutely will work on longer grass too. If you have two inch um, Bermuda, you can put PGR down and it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna slow down, it's gonna slow down growth. The, the thing with mowing your lawn at two inches, really you're, you're on a week, you know, once a week, every five day type schedule to maintain the grass at that height. So you may not need PGR from a standpoint of, um, of slowing down growth if you're able to get out there, you know, at least once a week and mow your lawn. But if you want it to look to even tighten up a bit more and just to slow down the growth, I would consider doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of plant growth regulator. The stuff that I recommend is called Primo Max. We carry it on the golf course lawn store. Uh, I couldn't find a good section or figure out which section I wanted to put it in. So you'll find it under the liquid fertilizer, uh, the lawn fertilizer section. So go to lawn fertilizer. And then on the second row is Primo Max. So you can mix it with... Um, with Turfplex, or you can mix, you can do what I do, which mixes it with 901C and Nutrizolve, which is currently sold out, but it's going from back stock soon, um, with that, that guy, and that's a great concoction for using uh, Plant Growth Regulator to also prevent the, the tip burn that you can get, um, you know, slight tip burn that you can get from using um, PGR. So hopefully that helps. The answer is yes. If it were me, I would, I still would. And, uh, and yeah. That answers your question. All right, next up is Rich V. He says, um, hey, Ron, do you see any problems in putting down a granular lime and fungicide at the same time and watering it in? Nope, no problems with that whatsoever. Nope, they're completely, they're completely different. Um, they work completely differently. No issues with applying a fungicide and also doing your lime application and doing uh, running an irrigation cycle to save time. Nope. No problem at all. I would I would do that. If you need lime, go ahead and put it down. And now is a great time to apply a fungicide, um, a, a preventative. You know, um, question. That's a good point. While we're talking about fungicides, because a question I've gotten in email a bunch of times this week. So let's go through that really quick. And I have that as one of my talking points. So your question, your uh, your comment gives me a chance to do that. So when it comes to choosing between Headway G, Acelaprin, and um, Caravan G. So again, you go to the Golf Course Lawn Store and go scroll down to the fungicide section right here. And so out of these guys, right? The question I get is, hey, if I did a Celeprin, do I need to apply Caravan? And the answer is you really shouldn't because a Celeprin is already an insecticide. If you have got your insecticide covered, there's no reason to use Caravan because it's an insecticide and a fungicide. The, w the only reason, the only time I would use Caravan G is for a couple of criteria. One, you don't care about uh, the lack of armyworm coverage because it doesn't, this because Caravan G, the insecticide that's in Caravan G does not cover armyworms. Um, and you're fine with only having azoxystrobin. So if you're fine with only one fungicide, one insecticide that is, are great, work, I mean, you can still get a great result with it as far as preventing, um, you know, uh, brown patch, large patch, a lot of the common lawn diseases that, that plague um, lawns this time of year. Uh, and a good fungicide that's going to prevent... Um, um, a good fungicide is going to prevent, I already covered fungicides, but as far as a good insecticide that's going to keep grubs out of your lawn, Caravan G, as far as a one and done, is a great way to go. If you've applied a Celeprin, you really should be using Headway because this is a standalone straight um, fungicide and this is a standalone straight insecticide. The best combination is these two together. So you do like either liquid and Celeprin and Headway G, or you do the granular Celeprin and Headway G, because now you're doing really one of the best in-class insecticides, and you're also using, in my opinion, one of the best in-class fungicides in a combination that, 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 that is gonna do a great job um, you know, covering a broader range of lawn diseases and a broader range of lawn damaging insects. So hope that helps. I got like a bunch of email this week about what to use and when. If all you care about is fungicide, Headway G. If you want a fungicide and insecticide, uh, Caravan G. If you want the best in breeds, so you want the best of both worlds, um, and you know the best product in both in the respective areas, get a Celeprin and then get Headway. So, 
beat that to death, answer the question. Um, I've got like a bunch of email this week on it. So I want to talk about that because obviously some people are confused about which way to go. So I wanted to cover that. And again, we have all that in stock at the golf course lawn store. Now is a great time of year to apply it May and June to get your preventative fungicide and insecticide down. Okay, next up is Dalen Krause. He says, sorry about the last question. Sorry, last question. Dude, it's totally not your last question. Every time someone tells me last question, it's never the last question, but prove me wrong. We'll see. He says, can you possibly work on something to show us the weak spots in your lawn? Maybe help encourage us with the ugly spots in our lawn. Strug I'm still struggling with fungus recovery. Man, here's the thing. You know, ask and you shall receive, Dalen. I've already got that. I've already done a video on that because last year, you know, every, I was getting videos from, or comments from people saying, you know, your lawn looks amazing. And you know, it's not, I can't really relate to it because there's no issues and you know, there's not really any issues in it. And I'm just like, no, there are, there's a whole lot of problems in my lawn. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, the majority of it looks good, but there's still some struggle spots. So I've got it. I did a video last year. didn't get a whole lot of views, but I did a video on that very topic that talks about, um, that pretty much there's always something, no matter, no matter, no matter what you do, um, I mean, probably save Augusta National. There's always some area of your lawn that needs improvement, that has some struggle spots that are on the struggle bus. So I'm going to send this video to you, Dalen. I mean, and it will show you the problem areas, um, problem areas in Ron's lawn. So enjoy that one. Um, so yeah, so watch, watch this and you're going to see some of the areas that are, that are just weak in my lawn. And some of them still are this year. And some of them are better this year, but it's, there's always something. So take a look at that. And that will give you some encouragement that, you know, lawns just don't, you know, don't, don't snap into existence and are awesome overnight. Every lawn has areas for improvement. So hope that helps. Uh, watch the video and, you know, let me know if there's something else you want to see. But that it's already been done. I did it last year. All right. Next up is Todd Hickey. He says, I took your advice and I got a leveling rake. Good job. Well, you know what? Normally I only clap for mowers, but we're going to start clapping for leveling rate purchases too. It's one of the best things you can do. Is there's, there was a 40 inch, two inch version and a 30 inch version available. My advice to all, get the 30 inch, the 42 inch is too heavy and hard to manipulate. Yeah, um, I could say that. That's why the one that I recommend, um, the one from Standard Golf is a 30 inch. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, you know, the bigger one, you know, bigger, bigger is better when it comes to, you know, everything, you know, it's like they, they have the Texas approach when it comes to, to leveling rakes. And to your point, a bigger rake is heavier. It is, um, if you don't have larger areas of your lawn that are relatively flat, you can have parts of the rake like getting high centered or catching or grabbing. So a 30 inch rake is a really, really good option. So this is, um, this one from Standard Golf is the one that I, I normally recommend to people. I've had a really good response as far as people, um, as far as people liking it. Let me, so I can show you if I can bring it up on the screen right now. I think I can do that. There we go. And it's on sale right now. That's that's cool. That's also awesome, right? So this rake, um, great rake, 30 inches, made in America. So that's also awesome too. So you're supporting, supporting the US economy, which is also a great thing. Um, and again, I've, I have yet to get any negative feedback on this particular rake. And if you feel like getting this guy and want to support the channel, um, I'll throw a link in the chat here where you guys can pick that guy up. But I, I definitely agree with you, Todd. I have a 40 inch rake. And while I've gotten used to it, it is heavy. It is, it is, um, it is heavier, so I, I totally get what you're after about recommending one that is not as um, not quite so not quite so heavy. So um, we shall see if I can find this. I think I, I think I've got a link to that. Maybe um, let's see. I think I do. I do. Yay! There you go. Lucky for me. Wait, so here is a link to um, leveling rake that you get if you guys are, are looking to top your lawn this year um, and feel like supporting the channel. Here's my affiliate link for uh, for that. So. And it's going to take you to the standard golf one, which is the one really to get. It's great value for money. And right now it's on sale at a hundred bucks. That thing's a steal. Absolutely should get that if you're going to get a leveling rake this year. All right. Next up is Matthew Beliski. He says, I have a breakout of dollar spot or brown patch or, I mean, the two would look kind of different, but anyway, he says, I cannot seem to find any good info on how to properly ID mowing at 0.65. On Celebration Bermuda, any advice? I have pictures if they help. Sure. Um, if you want to send pictures, Matthew, you can email them to me here at ron at golfcoursealon.com. I'll take a look and let you know. But I will tell you um, what I'm going to write back to you is just to get headway. 
That's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you to get headway because um, that way you're covered either way. If it's dollar spot, you know, if it's dollar spot, it's this has got propiconazole in it, which will help you. And if it's brown patch, it's got azoxystrobin, which will also cover that. So either way, this is what I'm going to recommend to you, um, regardless of what you show me in that um, email between those two. Headway is where you want to be. And again, we got that on the Golf Course Lawn Store. Feel free to pick that up. That's what you're going to want to use for, um, you know, based on what you're, you're showing me. But do, send me a picture. I like to see it anyway. I like to see pictures of, of lawn fungus. I'm kind of weird that way. I like to see like lawn disease, death and disease in lawns so I can know what to avoid and try and help you guys avoid. So email me and I'll take a look and I will email you back. But you already know what my answer is going to be. So, all right. Next up is Ratman2121. He says... Is it, hey Ron, is it even possible to get a decent cut from a rotary since the trend seems to be leaning towards real mowers? Yes, yes, you can get a decent cut with a rotary mower. I mean, look at BYD's lawn. He, he um, only rotary cuts his mower, uh, only, rotary cuts his mower <laughs> only rotary cuts his lawn, and it looks good. You know, it looks good. So it's, the, the thing is, here's the thing. A real mower, a cylinder, also known as a cylinder mower, you know, if you're British, for the Brits in you, a real mower is the healthiest way to cut your grass. It cuts like a pair of scissors versus cutting like a machete. Now, can you get a good cut with a rotary mower? Yes. If you do the same things that you have to do with a real mower, which are one, keep the blade sharp. Like I can't stress enough, like a real mower with a dull blade is just as bad or worse than a rotary mower with a dull blade. You know, so the sharp equipment makes a huge difference in the quality of cut that you get. Um, also your particular grass type, you didn't tell me what kind of grass you have, Ratman, but if you have like a fescue or you have, uh, you know, rye grass that you're mowing taller, or you have St. Augustine, then a, a rotary mower really is a better choice because those grass types tend to be like, I mean, rye, you can go shorter, but, but, but definitely, definitely with the fescue or the, uh, St. Augustine, those grass types thrive at taller cutting heights that are not really great for real mowing but they are perfect for rotary mowing. So your grass type ma matters in a lot. Um, but if you have Bermuda or Zoysia or any of the warm season grass types or rye or a Kentucky bluegrass that likes or can tolerate being cut shorter and thrives at shorter cutting heights, then a real mower is the better choice. But it's, it's not so simple as just simply saying that real mowing is better than, than rotary mowing. Real mowing is a bigger time commitment because you can't be out there once every two weeks with a real mower. You gotta be out there a couple times a week if you're really serious. So it's a bigger time commitment than a rotary mower. Um, but if, if all things being equal, like you have equal amounts of time, you've got the time to do it and you have the desire to do it, and you have a grass type that is designed to be real mode, then at 10 times out of 10, you're gonna get a better result with a real mower than you will with a rotary. But it doesn't mean that rotary mowers are bad. If, in, in other words, if you rotary mow your lawn twice a week, it's still gonna look better than people that only rotary mow their lawn once every two weeks. It's just not gonna look as good as a real mode lawn that's cut at the same intervals. Does that make sense? So. Uh, the trend is going towards real mows, but again, it's there's more to it than just which one cuts the grass better. It's also some of your time and desire and, you know, and also the, frankly, the cost. They're more expensive, you know, more expensive to buy, more expensive to take care of. So there's a lot of factors other than which one is better, like which one is better for you. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that other than just which one is better for your particular grass type. All right, next up is Melvin Otta. He says, my, this is my first time trying to level my lawn. I have clay soil and I have really deep spots like one or one and a half inches. What should I do, straight sand or topsoil? Melvin, I have the video for you. Long short of the answer is I would do a blend. I would do a blend of soil and sand. I would make sure there's definitely some sand in there because sand adds more structure. It's not gonna settle as much. Um, but I've got a video that will talk up that covers that very topic, you know, inch, inch and a half, got you covered. That's what this whole video is showing you um, how to take care of as far as a bumpy spot, bumpy area in your lawn. I mean, I had a lot of fun filming it and I think you'll enjoy watching it even if you don't end up not enjoying um, leveling your lawn because it's a lot of comedy, a lot of dad jokes, a lot of stuff that, you know, I think are funny and other people think are funny. So hopefully you'll find it useful. So there, it's there in the chat for you right now. Uh, let's see, um, rut leveling video and for all you guys that's it uh, right there so hope that helps i would not use straight sand and i would not use straight topsoil i would use a blend of sand and soil if you're only going to use a straight anything i would do the um topsoil versus the sand but you're just going to get out there and really like compact it down like put some down step on it put some more down step on it really compress it in 
um, to prevent it, to help reduce the amount of settling you're gonna get. The best, some sand and soil. A good blend is what I would go with. And that video is gonna show you exactly what I'm, I'm referring to. All right, next up is Chris P. He says, I'm taking out, I'm taking potash. Well, no, wrong one. It says, I'm taking potash out of my fire pit to sprinkle on the lawn. Found that it has high levels of potassium. Anyone done this? I know it's done in gardens. I've never done that, Chris, but I can't see why it wouldn't work. Um, you know, if you've if you've done it and you've gotten good results and you you notice that your your pot your um, potassium levels go up after doing that, like you did a soil test before you sprayed your fire pit on um, ash on the lawn, and then you did one afterwards, like with one of these, the so, the my soil test kit, the one I recommend, and it you saw a, uh, an improvement in potassium levels, then do it. Why not? It's free. It's free potassium, right? Not necessarily the easiest way to apply it, but if you got it and it's free, why not do it? Okay, next up is Mauricio uh, Salinas. All right, he says, good evening, Ron. When will you um, have your have for sell in your store the 1608 Country Club Humic Max 12.8 um, version, the newer version? I ordered last, the eight uh, version last month, want to reorder soon. So here's the thing, guys, and I already told the Academy members this, is the Humic Max that is in the store right now like once that sells out, I likely will not be able to get more for this season. Like if you guys are, in, again, not to blame supply chain, but it is supply chain. Like the price of urea um, um, has gone up literally 95%. So the cost of replacing Humic Max now is crazy expensive. It, I'll put it this way. It's the, the, the price that it's at right now um, is, is just, is just enough. I mean, I raised the price some just to, as a, as a tester to see how people would tolerate the price increase, but really replacing Humic Max now at the price that it's offered at would mean selling the fertilizer at like $80 a bag. And that's just not, that's not reasonable. It's just too much money. You know, it's a great fertilizer, but that's, that's just a less, a lot, you know? So, um, and as far as that goes, so there's not two versions of it. I've spoken to Lebanon about this because if you do the math, on what's on the amount of um, of humic acid in the bag per the label, um, it works out to 8.9%. They say 12.8% 12 12 on their website, but if you do the math, it works out to 8.9%. Um, and also you look at the label, it says 8.9%. So that's what I put on my website. Um, they have not changed theirs. And I, I, I spoke to them, I called them last year when this was when I, where I, this confusion was going on. Cause I was saying, hey, listen, the label says this, um, but your website, you guys are saying 12.8, 12 12 which is it? And the person that I spoke to says, label is law. Um, perhaps whatever we have, what we have on the website, maybe what we were aiming for, but that is not what, like whatever the label says, that's what's in the product. So 8.9% um, is correct. 8.9 you know, slash 9% is, is correct. I don't believe there's a second version that I'm aware of anyway that has that, that has the, um, the, the, the increased amount in it. Not, not that I'm aware of. So hope that helps, Mauricio. If you like Humic Max and you want to get, you want to have some for the season, stock up because there's not that much of it left in the store. And once it sells out, it's probably not gonna get replaced this year. I'm gonna have to wait for the pricing to come down before I um, I restock that because it's just it's just too expensive. I can't in good conscience sell an $80 bag, an eighty dollar bag of fertilizer. I mean, it's just, it's, that's, it's great, it's awesome, but that's too much. So um, if you like it, buy it up now while you can. All right, next up is Alex M. He says, I'm looking for a riding mower too, but I can't spend more than four to five K. I have a 13, to 16 degrees slope on the front lawn, is there a better option? I don't know, Alex. Here's the thing, I am not an expert when it comes to riding mowers. For real mowers, I'm trying to think, 16 degrees, that's a pretty, that's a pretty decent slope. You can, you could push, um, you can, you could cut that with a, with a push mower, but I don't, I don't have any options. I'm not gonna be helpful for you on this one as far as, you know, a $5,000 budget, which riding mower is gonna be the one to go with. I'd be careful um, because if you get one that, ha that if you're gonna be using that mower on a slope, make sure you get one that has a roll bar because for safety reasons, if something happens, it tips over, you don't want it ending up on you and just, you know, just make sure you get one with a roll bar if you're gonna be using it on, uh, on any kind of slope where there's an, a possibility of it, um, of it tipping over. So sorry, I'm not more help on this one. I can ask around. I know BYD has some content on his channel on riding mowers, but I believe they cost a bit more than four to five thousand dollars, but check out his his his, uh, his channel out. I know that the Toro Titan, which again I don't have any direct experience with, but a lot of um, I think um, Alan has one. A couple other people have them, and they seem to really like them. That might be more in that price range, and it's not that that's not their pro level, um, uh, you know, ride on mowers. So look into the Toro Titan again. I don't have one, but the people that have them seem to really like them. So hopefully that helps. Sorry, I am not more useful. Doesn't matter which one you get. 
You make sure you get one with a roll bar if you're gonna be using it on a slope. Okay, next one, next up is Todd Gleave says, any recommendations for eliminating the common Bermuda popping up on my in my Tahoma? Not really, man. There is um, there is a herbicide that I, I keep saying I, I wanna try out, but I'm too chicken to. That's called, I think it's called Acclaim that is um, said, that is labeled to target common Bermuda. Um, the label doesn't say anything about hybrid Bermuda, but it says common. And I, when I reached, I called them, I called, I think it's Bear Who Makes It. I called the manufacturer, I, I, can, I can look here real quick and find out who makes it, but I, I did give them a ring. And I asked them, hey, so this your, your label says common, does that mean I can spray this on a hybrid lawn that has common in it to remove it? And they said, oh, I don't know. I mean, we've, you know, We've, I've never tested that, and the only way for you to really know is for you to test it. So the, the long short of it is I, I don't know of anyone that's cracked that one as far as, um, let's see who makes it. I think it is Bear. Is it Bear? No, I don't know who makes it. Yeah, it is Bear. It's, it's a Bear product. Um, so I'll, I'll put this in the chat for you, um, Todd, to look into. But I don't know, the long short is outside of like physically removing it, I don't know of a way to eliminate common Bermuda in a hybrid uh, Bermuda lawn um, that's not going to also damage the hybrid Bermuda. Look, take a look at this product. I mean, read the label. And if you have a small section of your lawn that you want to try it out and see, you can. But I, um, you know, they're so close. I, I, I almost think that it was that it's probably going to damage the hybrid as well. You know what I mean? If it doesn't, if it kills the common, I can't see how it's not going to injure the hybrid as well too. So there is that. That's the one product that I found that, that is supposedly labeled to do that, but I've never actually tested it. And when I called the manufacturer, they were not sure either. So there you go. Hopefully that helps. Um, you know, maybe just keep mowing, keep reduce your mowing height and just learn to live with it. You know, I, I can assure you that you notice it more than anybody else. So there is there is that. All right, next up is Matthew uh, Beliski. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. I aerated my Bermuda last weekend. I may have uh, some breakout fungus. I think I already gave you that one. Um, give, I'll give you an answer what my answer is going to be to that, Matthew. So hopefully that helps. You said, if you had dollar spot, azoxystrobin isn't going to really do anything for that. It's, you need to use propiconazole. So again, my um, recommendation is going to be, uh, if you want to use take the fungicide approach, is to use something with propiconazole in it like Headway. So, uh, and then also putting down some nitrogen is also a good idea too, but if you're going after it from a fungus, from a fungicide approach, you need some propiconazole. So headway or straight propiconazole if you have that. Okay, next up is Mike G. He says, hey Ron, can you um, tell me the perks of joining your academy versus just watching your vids and the live show? Well, the academy um, is much more direct. Like I don't think there's a single video in the academy that is over... 12 minutes long. I think the longest video in the Academy is like a top dressing video. So as far as not having to listen to me gab on and on and on and on and getting the answer to your question as quickly as possible in the most direct way as possible, that is what the Academy is designed for. It's not like the YouTube videos, the content on YouTube is designed to be helpful, but, but there's a certain style of making content on YouTube that you have to do for it to work well, for it to, for it to get distribution for YouTube, for the algorithm to pick it up and for it to be distributed, right? And um, that, that what, YouTube, what YouTube wants does not necessarily lend itself well to a course that is designed to just, just go through the, 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 the details um, around you know, the, the different nutrients that are in your soil and what they do and why biosimilants are important and on, on um, the importance of mowing and all, this, all the stuff that, that goes into the course. Um, the other, um, but, but to answer your question, if you wanted to go through like all my live streams, you can probably find, I'm trying to think here, you'd find the answer to most, a, a lot of what's in the course sprinkled throughout my live streams. But what, what, the, what the course is, is, is a lot of that knowledge distilled into a, a method, into a, a package that's a lot more digestible, not going to take you hours and hours and hours to go through it. Um, so that's what, the, that's what the course is designed for. In addition to the learning portion of it, there's also um, the, um, which I think is also one of the coolest parts, is the private Facebook group. So if you, if you think I'm a hardcore lawn nerd, there's also some of the guys that are in there that are, that are just as hardcore as I am that are, you know, that some of these guys have prism gauges and, are, are, and you know, they, they have, they, they, in addition to the stuff that I teach, they also come with a wealth of knowledge. It's also very helpful. So getting access to that is something that you only get if you're in the course. Um, 
Um, what else? Something you purchase one time, and as I add more content to it, you still get that the new content for free, so you don't have to worry about like, you know, it's not a subscription in the sense that you buy it and you have to buy it again. What else? There's currently a discount for certain products for um, for some of the Miramichi Green products if you're an Academy member. So if you're going to be using like Essential G or uh, the Carbon Kit or any of the products from Miramichi Green, there's also there's a discount that's currently in the store of uh, that that only Academy members um, get. So that's a thing. So there's a way for it to almost pay for itself. And uh, so yeah, so you have to kind of decide whether it's for you or not. If that is enough, I mean, on the on the store, there's a breakdown of, as far as what's in the course details. Also at golfcourselon.com, there's a video explaining exactly what's in it, what you know, the breakdown of how the course works, what's what you can expect, um, and and there you go. So if you think there, if you if you don't want to watch all my live streams and you want a more, you want everything distilled, then the course is, is great. In addition to all the other perks that you won't find on YouTube, so. Hope that helps, Mike G. Kind of your call. It comes with 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't like it, I will give you your money back if you um, if you uh, you know decide you try it out. And you don't really you don't really care for it. But um, but yeah, to answer your question, most of what's in the course, other than like the some of the soil modules, like the micronutrient modules, um, a lot of it you can find sprinkled when I answer certain questions throughout like the almost two years worth of live streams that I've done on YouTube. So. If you're fine with going through a bunch of live streams, then you know you probably don't need it need the course for that portion. But there's other things that the course comes with that again, the only way you can get them is in the course. All right. Next up is Rich V says, Do you have a uh, recommended product to kill moss on an asphalt driveway? It's shade, but it's from the neighbor's trees. So yeah, so Demir gave a relatively inexpensive way of doing this. He says you take um, a gallon of water and mix like five ounces or so of dishwater, of dish dishwater, of dish soap with that water, that's um, an inexpensive way to get rid of the moss. There's also a product from um, from Scott's, like their Moss X product, like that's also effective against um, moss. I can show you um, that what I'm talking about, but just go, go to, to Amazon or Google and just look up Moss X and you will, uh, You'll see what I'm what I'm referring to, but as, if you want to try the cheap approach or the free approach first, you know, get get some water, get some dish soap, and that will help. But if you want something that is a bit more potent, then you can go with one of these guys. Any of these, it comes in a granular, comes in a um, hose and sprayer, uh, shaker jug. Tons of different ways for applying this, and you can find that uh, on on Amazon. So, if you you know if you decide you want to go for that, by all means, uh, give it a shot and, uh, and let me know how it works out for you, Rich. That is what I would um. I'd recommend, I mean, but here's the thing you gotta realize, in, until you get rid of the conditions that are causing the moss to be a thing, you're gonna just keep treating this over and over. It's not like you're gonna apply, you know, this the Moss X or, or some other product and it's gonna go away, it's gonna cure the problem. Because it's really, to, to, to get rid of moss, you want to change the conditions that are causing moss to thrive. In this case, sounds like your uh, your driveway. So if you can anything you can do to reduce the shade, that would be good as far as, um, you know, as far as a long-term approach for getting rid of moss in your lawn. And if you like supporting the channel, um, here is a link to um, Moss X on Amazon. It's an affiliate link that you can use. So feel free. All right, next up is Adrian Frazier. He says, hey, Ron, what are your thoughts on a toe aerator? I've never used one, so I can't say, but I can't, I mean, just thinking about it, I can't see why they wouldn't work well. As long as it's heavy enough to do to penetrate the ground well, like the tines are long enough and it's got some weight to it, I don't see why a toe behind aerator would not work well. Um, yeah, and if you have a bigger property, frankly, this makes a lot of sense. You know what I mean? Like almost like a, um, yeah. it's like asking, do I think that a, like a gang reel, like a toe behind gang reel or like a, um, a ride on gang reel mower is good. Yeah, if you have a need for that, um, and it's set up properly, you should get a good result with it. So yeah, if you have a bigger property, by all means, the tow behind should um, is, a, is a good idea. It's gonna save you time. Because like the, the example, the area that I'm using, I was using today, like this guy, the Ryan, I think that guy is like 20 inches, maybe 18 inches in width. I'm, don't hold me to that. I think it's 18 to 20 inches. So if you have a really large property, that's not gonna be the way to do it. You know, you're gonna want something like what you're talking about. All right, next up is G Free. He says, hey, Ron, and hashtag Stripe Action Gang, that Alex Sterling real mower is awesome. I can see you with one yourself. Yeah, man, I mean, it's it's a cool mower. Here's the thing about it that I like the most. Like the, the thing about the Sterling, I would not probably, I would likely not use it to mow my lawn because it's not wide enough, but the fact that it has the catcher on the front, 
I could get a Sterling and just get like the Verticutter for it. Because that would be, I mean, that's a really expensive way to get a Verticutter. But, you know, being able to Verticut the lawn and have all the debris that comes off the lawn go right into a basket so that I don't have to Verticut it and then go and rake up the entire lawn and dispose of all that, like as far as a time saver, like that would be awesome. Like that, like having a grass catcher, a verticutter with a grass catcher on it, it sounds like it's like a kind of a basic thing, but it really isn't. And as far as saving time, it's a huge time saver. Um, but as far as using it for, for mowing, I would lean more towards like their C27 or maybe even the 34, like one of their bigger mowers, bit more weight, uh, wider cut, like that would be more my thing for, for mowing purposes. But I could see using the Sterling just like the verticutting cartridge on my lawn. I think that has a lot of benefit. All right, next up is Kevin D. Jones. He says, hey, Ron, I forgot which T-jet nozzle to use for T-necks. Thanks. All right, so the one you're going to want to use is the foliar tip, Kevin. Um, so I've got one here. I've, I've left one here on the desk because it, it, it happens that every week I get this question. So uh, if I can get it to come out, um, here you go. This guy, yeah, this guy here is the one that I would recommend. So let's come over to the good camera, and I will show you here. This is the tip the the T jet the foliar tip this is the one you're going to want to use for T-necks and for um, the carbon kit any of your foliar apps so like your herbicides um, any of those that's that's going to be your go-to if you want you can also use this guy like their air induction tip this is like the medium tip if you're out there spraying on a windier day or you just want a slightly just a, just a slightly larger droplet size this guy will work well but the T the uh, the foliar tip is really the one that you're going to want to go with. If you want one and you don't have one, I will give you a link here to be able to pick one up. Um, and again, they're not that not that expensive. Great investment in in uh, in just getting getting a great result with uh, your liquid applications on your lawn. So I will get I'll throw that in the chat for you right now. Make sure it's right. Yep, looks like it's what's twelve bucks right now. Delivered with Amazon if you got Prime. So at Kevin D Jones, there you go. That's the link to the follow your tip. So check that out. And uh, and let me know. Yeah. So the foliar or the air in the, this or the air induction tip will work too. But really, the foliar tip is is the best. Okay. Next is Robert Rainey he says thoughts on spring in the late evening versus early morning. Thinking about applying carbon kit now before rain in the forecast. You can do it. You can do it now. There's no. There's not. I mean, six half a dozen. It doesn't really matter, Robert. You can. You get good results either way. Um, if you if you got a bunch of rain in the forecast tomorrow, the uptake of the carbon kit is really quick. Really uh, talking to Miramichi Green, they said really all you need is a couple of hours. So if you're spraying it now and it's going to sit on the on the grass overnight, you're going to be good to go. So yeah, I would absolutely go for it. You know, it's, I'm I'm sure I answered your question a bit late. So hopefully you said hey, I'm just going to you know send it without Ron's answer. But yeah, the answer is by all means go forward and spray, sir. Do your thing. Do your thing. I'm pretty sure he did anyway. No, no one, Robert. He's 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 that kind of guy. He's like a send it kind of guy. All right. Next is Troy Ridley. He says, "Hey, Ron, my Bermuda is nice and green. That's good." He says, "I also I may have to look into PGR for the first time. I have a two gallon uh, pump sprayer for 5,500 square feet. I use granular products. Any suggestions?" Yes. Yeah, so if you are going to go with a um, plant plant growth regulator and you have 5,500 square feet. What I would recommend is this guy, is Primo Max. Reason being that even though this seems like a very simple thing, and I didn't, you know, until I started using it, I didn't realize how awesome it is. The fact that you have a built-in measuring cup to know exactly how much product you're putting into your backpack sprayer, or in your case, your pump sprayer, is really a, t a huge time saver. You don't have to get out, and I can't really reach it because I don't have it here in front of me. I don't know where I, I don't know where I did with it. I don't, I don't see it. Anyway, I, I have like a, um, a pitcher that I've shown you guys before that I often use for measuring out product and I can't find it, so I can't show you guys. Um, but this saves you a lot of time. If you have a two gallon pump sprayer, let me think about the rates. The rates for Bermuda, um, just for someone that's starting out, I always recommend 0.25 fluid ounces per thousand square feet. So a quarter of an ounce mixed with a gallon of water over a thousand square feet, right? So really, you know, for your first time, I really wouldn't want you. You could go, do go a high, go with a higher concentration and get it and get um, you know two gallons to cover 5,500 square feet. But for the first time using plant growth regulator, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that you just do three fill ups. So what's gonna happen is, given that you're gonna do two gallons three times, that's gonna get you around 6,000 square feet. So close enough, right? 
is you're gonna do um, for two gallons, you're gonna put it, you're gonna put half an ounce. So 0.25, so halfway between two and three times two, so half an ounce. So 0.25 plus time plus 0.25 equals half an ounce or 0.5. That is enough for two gallons of water covering 2,000 square feet. So I would get a good foliar tip like the T jet I was I just linked in the chat, and I would use a half an ounce of T nex or of, of Primo Max or you know whatever you happen to go with. But I mean Primo is what I would use because you get this built into it. Um, a half an ounce of Primo Max. Um, with two gallons of water and apply that over 2,000 square feet. So, so it's a gallon per thousand square feet, two gallons gonna cover 2,000 square feet because you have 5,500 square feet. That means about three Phillips thereabouts to cover your 5,500 square foot lawn. And again, I'd really recommend Primo Max. We have it on the Golf Course Lawn Store. It's not that expensive. And there's a video showing you how to apply it. Um, and I think you like it. I mean, I, people that get into PG, I'll tell you one thing though. If, once you start using Plant Growth Regulator, you're not going to want to stop because it's it's the way it makes the turf look, um, the fact that it reduces mowing frequency, the the, the additional uh, depth and color you get a little bit from it because the grass isn't growing as, as much, so the leaf gets a bit older. All those benefits are are pretty awesome in addition to like some seed head suppression and and um, just, again, just tons of benefits to incorporating something like Primo Max into your lawn care program, especially if you have Bermuda, especially if you have shortcut turf. So. Give it a shot. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And again, I've got tons of content that show you how to get a good result when using it. If you have any other questions, let me know. I'll do my best to help you out. Okay, next is Tim Jackson. He says, what's up, Ron and everyone? Fighting three different diseases, but everything is recovering fast and good in San Antonio, Texas. Well, that's good. That's good. Tim, I'm glad that, I mean, I'm sorry you're fighting like lawn disease. I hope you mean lawn diseases. Um, uh, I'm sorry that you're dealing with lawn diseases, but I'm glad that they are recovering, which is good. Your lawn is doing good from it. So which is, that that's better than the alternative. All right, next up is Gary Burnside. He says, hey Ron, I have a few bare spots. Can I make repairs with seed in the summer months? Okay, so a couple things, depends on the kind of grass you have is how I'm gonna answer this question. If you have Bermuda or Zoysia, the answer is no, because you really shouldn't, you know, here's the thing. Bermuda is a very, very aggressive growing grass. Um, assuming it's getting enough sunlight and that other conditions are are good that like, you know, you don't have any like a big rock or boulder right underneath the um, underneath the surface of the soil that's causing it to not be able to get good roots. It will fill in on its own. Like if you have a spring dead spot and you have Bermuda lawn, it's going to fill in over time. Um, so the, 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 the issue with using seed on a warm season grass like Bermuda is whatever the conditions are that caused that area to be bare, they're still there. So even if you are able to throw down some seed and water it like crazy and you got it to grow, eventually it's gonna die off and you're gonna have the same problem all over again. So we need to figure out why you have the bare spot, Gary, and remedy that versus going after, versus using grass seed to solve um, the problem. So I, if you, again, if you have, I'm assuming you have Bermuda because you're talking about seeding in the summer months. So if that's the case, I would not, I would recommend not doing that. So uh, let's figure out why you have the bare spot. In a lot of cases, it's shade. So Bermuda needs a lot of sunlight. When I mean sunlight, it needs to be direct. So not passing through trees, not passing through shrubs. Um, it's got to have a lot of direct sunlight on it for it to do well. If you find that the areas where you have the bare spots are in a shaded area, then we have a couple of the choices. One, you can you know do get rid of the shade or do something to reduce the shade, like trim trees back, trim shrubs back, that kind of thing. Uh, or you can turn that area. You can use it. You can grow a different grass type there that needs a little bit less sun, like zoysia. Or you can um, just turn it into like a decorative area, like put mulch or pine straw or something else there, or something along those lines. But I, I would not. I would try to steer you away from grass seed for warm season grass anyway, because you, you typically don't need it. It's, it's a, it's a band-aid fix that is not going to fix the problem. Um, especially, it just, especially if it's Bermuda. Now, if you have a fescue lawn, then yes, seeding is definitely a strategy to help fix bare spots because fescue does not spread like Bermuda does. It isn't, it isn't, it's not, it doesn't fill in on its own, giving heat and sunlight and, you know, enough nutrients like Bermuda will. A fescue lawn, absolutely seeding is a strategy, but I would not do that if you have fescue in the summer, like you would do that like like now, like late spring, early spring, late spring, and then also in the fall would be the time to um, to repair bare spots uh, in fescue. So hope that helps. Um, again, I'm just, I'm trying to steer you away from seed because seed's expensive, water's expensive, and I don't want you to get out there and try it and get frustrated because we need to fix whatever is causing the problem to be there in the first place. 
Great question, and I'm sure other people can benefit from it, so thanks you for asking that. All right, next up is Tim Teo. He says, hey, Ron, love your channel. I appreciate that, uh, Tim. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And then next is Texas Guru. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, indeed, uh, Texas Guru. And then next up, we have Rich V. He says, Ron, I am trying to decide between the Yard Mastery Backpack Sprayer and the Flow Zone Typhoon 2. Do you have a preference? All the videos compare the Yard Mastery to the Flow Zone to the Typhoon 2.0. Thanks. Okay, so it's what's funny. I mean, of all the videos I've done, I've got the, the for some reason, I don't understand why it is, but there's no video has gotten more hate and more like people are just uh, angry than that video I did comparing the, the Typhoon 2 to the Yard Mastery Sprayer. Here's the thing. There's not that much difference between the 2.5 and the 2.0, in my opinion. The 2.5, so here's the thing. Let's do the history of flow zone sprayers. And I'm sure some of them will close it and chime in and say, no, it's completely different. It's revolutionary. Da, da, da. But here's, here's the, the, the history in a nutshell of the Typhoon anyway. So you had the original Typhoon, which was not that great. Then you had the Typhoon 2, which had the dual rocker switch, right? So 90 PSI, and I want to say it's 60, 60 or 45 PSI. I mean, it's a low, lower rate. I don't know what the higher one is, but the high, no, it's actually, that's not true. It's 115 PSI, I believe, for the high rate. And then the lower rate is something lower. But you had a dual switch, right? So it's either high or low. It's all you had. And then um, your, um, Flowzone also had a version of the Typhoon, which was a Typhoon that had the potentiometer, right? So you could like, it was variable. It was like the Typhoon, Typhoon 2 V, I believe it was called, which had the variable potentiometer, which sounds cool in theory, but it's kind of useless because if you are using this to, to spray products on your lawn, you need to know exactly what pressure, like what the flow rate the sprayer is putting out for the sprayer calibration and for the, for to know that you're using the tip properly and sure that you're just, you're putting the product down at the correct rate. So the potentiometer cool for other things like pressure washing and whatever, but for lawn care apps, not so awesome. So the, enter the 2.5. The 2.5 is essentially, in my opinion, the, the take the tip potentiometer, get rid of it. So you have like the variable settings. There's very, there's different, there's different um, stops along the way, we have different um, different pressures along the way. Um, so you solve the problem of the potentiometer because now you're able to lock in and know exactly I'm not like, I'm at 45 PSI, now I'm at 60 PSI, I'm at 70, 85, 115. So you have like different like detents that lets you know exactly what pressure you're at, right? Which sounds cool and is cool. Here's the thing though, in practice, most people don't use all those settings and because here's why, what it would require is if you had, let's say, we'll take like the T-Jet tip, right? Let's take like the, this foliar tip. With a 2.5, because it has the five different settings, you would have to do a calibration for every single one of those settings to ensure, what you, to know what your walking pace needs to be if you're using my rule of one gallon over a thousand square feet. So most people find a setting and they stick to it um, and they do a calibration based on that setting and they just they leave, they leave the sprayer there. So I say all that to say that the 2.5 has more settings, um, but for a lawn care person, like for me, I would never use all of them. I'd find like one and that would be it. Now the Yard Mastery has a high and a low, kind of like the Flow Zone Typhoon 2 does, right? For the T-Jet, for, um, for the foliar tips, I tend to roll with the lower, the lower pressure setting. You know, you can, run, you can go high, you can go low. I tend to use a lower one. Um, and then I do my calibration and I get a great result. So realistically, you're gonna run either of these sprayers on one setting, once you figure out which one works for you and your walking pace and the, the spray tips that you're using. So now we have to look at the other things that set them apart. And for me, the thing that makes the Yard Mastery better than the Typhoon 2 is the fact that it includes these tips. So with the Typhoon 2, if you wanna use a T-Jet tip or like the, like the, the, uh, the foliar tip, or the flood jet tip, one, you gotta buy these separately. And then two, you have to buy a $15 adapter that, that adapts to the quick connect fitting that's on the flow zone to like a, um, like a, I don't know, a, 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 a detachable, like a, 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 a what, I, what can I say the, the words? But like you, get, you can unscrew the tip and that allows you to interchange spray nozzles. So that's it. So it takes you go from, from, um, from QD to interchangeable spray nozzle tip, all right? But you have to buy that. So the, the price difference between the two of them is relatively comparable. Um, they're, they, they're within a few dollars of each other, but the Yard Mastery literally comes with everything in the box. So you get you know a great sprayer, great same build quality, 
Um, you know, it's got metal wand, metal, you know, I mean, it's very, very, like the build quality of the two sprayers is identical in my opinion, um, because they're probably made in the same factory. Um, but the thing with the Yard Mastery is you get the stuff that people like us really care about, right? You get the, you get the, the adapter, you get two sets of, of flow of T, of T jet tips and you're good to go. So if it were me, if I were in the, if I were in the market right now for a backpack sprayer and a $300 backpack sprayer was in my, within my budget, I would no doubt every time go for the yard mastery. And again, I, it's, you know, I don't really care either way. I have both of them. I have the flow zone and I have the, the yard mastery. They're both great sprayers. I like both of them, but if you're buying one, get the yard mastery because it's, it's one and done. It comes with everything. Okay. Next up is hobbies at work is, um, he says, is Arden 15 sterile when you plant it from seed? Great question. You know, I, I asked that question to, um, Hancock seed. And I try to get a hold of someone from, um, from Pennington to answer it. And I couldn't, uh, according to, uh, the people at Hancock seed, they're inclined to believe that it is, that, that it is sterile. I would, and I, I would think that it is too, but I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I did research that very question last year and I couldn't get a clear cut answer if it, if it is or not. I would, I'm leaning towards it. It is though, uh, hobbies after work. So, but I don't know for sure. If you find out, let me know. But I, I, I'm inclined to think that it is. Okay, next is Jacob McGee. He says, I'm new here. This popped up in my feed. That's awesome. See guys, that's yet another reason for you guys to hit the like button hard or gently either way. I really appreciate if you guys do that because it, it does exactly what helped bring Jacob here. It sends good vibes out to the algorithm. It says, hey, people that care about turf, you know, turf care and, and, and getting their lawns in order and top dressing and all this kind of fun stuff it's gonna say, this might be for you. So if you guys wouldn't mind touching the like button ever so gently, the 160 or so that are in here, if you guys would not mind touching that ever so gently, I really, really would appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, next up is um, Heartfelt Fashion. It says, hey, Ron. Uh, wrong one. He says, hey, Ron, um, love the outfit while clipping your test plot grass. We need to book you for a fashion show. Great fit on the on the suit, my man. That's the one negative, I will say. So it was it's, it fits properly, um, uh, heartfelt, because that's the one negative for being someone that's like six foot four. So it's cool being tall because you're tall, you can reach stuff or whatever. But finding clothes is an absolute pain. So when you find stuff that actually fits, it is kind of nice. But yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. I'm, I decided to have a little fun. I was like in the in the middle between meetings for work, so I was like, eh, why not go outside and take a picture and make every, have everyone make fun of me, right? So I did. Okay, uh, Heartful Fashion said, "I'm following you, big guy. Just got the aeration done today, and top dressing with Super Sod arrives next week. Nice. I like it. I like it. You're doing it. You're doing it right, man. It's a great time of year to get that knocked out. His question is: While getting the aeration done, it started raining." It softened the soil and helped the machine pull more plugs. At first it couldn't pull, but but a few plugs because my soil was so hard. And that is something that, you know, it's kind of like I'm going through the whole video right now, but that is something that I'm trying to talk about in the video that you guys should hopefully see Sunday morning, is the importance of the prep work ahead of time to aerating your lawn. And one of the things you really need to do is run irrigation if you have it, or if you can and you don't have irrigation, you don't feel like dragging the hose around. If you can time when you do your aeration around when there's gonna be rain a day or two prior, that would be good because it really does make a difference um, with the soil being a bit softer from rain as far as the, the, the plugs you're going to pull out of it. You're just going to get a better result from the aeration process. So absolutely do that. It's a, it's a, I'm glad to hear that you did that, uh, you know, heartfelt fashion. And it's something that everyone should do. Like you water your lawn the day before. It's going to make a difference as far as the result you get. Okay, next is uh, Rehab. He says, uh, happy Friday, Ron. Going around with ketchup cups, setting up smart watering. Very cool. I like it, um, Brick Rehab. You're really trying to get it dialed in. I, I hear you. I hear you. All right, next up is Roger Lewis. He says, my lawn is White House green currently. That's pretty cool. That's true. The White House lawn is pretty green. He says, my lawn plan this month until the end of August is Scott's plus two summer guard and lime the first week of the month and lime only mid-month. Is this a good plan? Uh, it's a good plan if your soil needs lime. Absolutely. So if you have a more acidic soil, Rod, uh, Roger, um, then applying lime is a good thing to do. Uh, as far as the Scott's plus two summer guard, I don't, I'm not familiar with that product, but the, the, here's the way, here's the thing, regardless of whether you use 
a fertilizer from Scotts or you use one of the more, you know, one of the high, more high-end fertilizers that are on the golf course lawn store, the way to know which fertilizer you should be using on your lawn is to is by doing a soil test result. Like this, um, the one that I recommend is the one from My Soil. These are super easy to use, they're like 30 bucks. And by using this um, and getting your results back within a week, it's gonna say, hey, Roger, your soil is acidic or your, meaning your pH is low and you would, be, you would benefit from a lime application. Or it might say your pH is fine, in which case you don't need to put lime on your lawn. Um, and it will also tell you what your nutrient deficiencies are, if any, and will help you pick out the correct fertilizer that matches your soil. I'm gonna try and bring up a, um, a soil test here really quick, Roger, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about because um, me jibber jabbering is one thing, but a picture, an image is worth a thousand words, right? So let me see if I can log in here, see if I can get this to work. Uh, all right, here we go. All right, demo gods, be with me. All right, let's see if this is gonna work. Okay, so if I go over here, this is my my soul um, portal, my, my, my panel, and whenever you, you get a soul test, you're gonna get access to this too. You're gonna get an email, you're gonna be able to log in here and see your soul test results. So if I wanted to look back at, like say what my soil looked, lo looked like, um, we'll go to a recent one. Let's say um, the, the fall or the, or the winter of 2021, like of last year, right? So if I look, if I pull this guy up, you can see it's gonna say, hey, Ron, you're the phosphorus, right? Which is one of the macronutrients in your um, your soil is above optimal, a little bit high. Your potassium, you're looking pretty good. And the N, which is for nitrogen, which is the, the engine, the fuel that drives growth in your lawn is a, a bit on the low side. And it talks about all, it goes through all these other nutrients, some of which you'll care about, some of which you, just, you won't really care about. The things that really matter on this you need to pay attention to are these three bars here, which is your NPK, the three numbers you see on the fertilizer bag. And then also this bar all the way to the right, which is your soil pH. Because this bar, pH, affects the nutrient availability, which means it affects um, how well your, your grass is going to be able to make use of the fertilizer you put into the lawn in, in like layman's terms, right? So a soil test result is gonna give you like this information. And in addition to that, it's gonna say, hey, Roger, based on your soil and based on your soil test results, you can get this fertilizer and that's a great fit for your soil. Or you can, if you want a liquid, you can go with this fertilizer, also a great fit for your soil. So that's why I'm such a huge fan of soil testing. Again, these guys are like 30 bucks if you get the optional probe, which you only have to buy one time, like this here, this like super cool over-engineered stainless steel piece of tool. Um, if you do these two together, I think it's like 50, $55 or something like that for these two together. Um, and you get the answers to the test. Like as far as knowing what fertilizer you should be using on your lawn and what um, soil amendments for as far as to pH you should be applying to your soil, whether you need them at all, this is going to tell you. Because I can't really answer your question. I can be like, eh, yeah, that sounds good. Maybe it's gonna work, but this is gonna let you know for sure what you should be using. So if you've never soil tested your, your lawn before, I highly recommend doing it. It's really easy. I've got videos. Um, actually, I'll show you here real quick. If you go to the store um, right here, which is the Golf Course Lawn Store, um, we'll go just go home. On the home page, you can either go to shop and then soil test kits and pH adjustment. And if you scroll down here, you'll see the soil test kit I'm talking about. Yes, this is the one I'm talking about that has the kit and the probe. For $59.99, you drop into there, that's the test kit. And in addition, I've got a couple of videos that show you in detail how to use it. So um, how to take the, the probe, how to take the soil test kit, how to get the samples, how to mix them all together, send it out, wait for your results to get back. So super easy, we've got you covered from soup to nuts. Um, and I'd highly recommend doing that because then next week you'll be able to come into the live stream when you show up, hopefully you'll come back. And you'll be able to say, hey, I got my sold test results in and it says I need this. What would you recommend as far as a fertilizer goes? So hope that helps. It's a long-winded answer, but I wanted to give you the why behind um, you know, choosing a fertilizer for your lawn and how I recommend that you go about doing it. Okay, next up is VMH. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. What's going on, VMH? Mr. Crabgrass No More is in the live stream. Thanks for coming by. And then next we have Omar Ar Ar Garcia. He says, I have a TrueCut C27. Is it worth getting an Alex or a more professional reel mower? Great question, Omar. It depends, it depends on you. Depends on, um, it depends on how picky you are and how, uh, you know, how good a cut you want. I will tell you this, any reel mower that is powered, but has a rear drum, that is propelled by a rear drum, 
is going to lay better stripes than a real mower that has drive wheels like the True Cut. So True Cut still does a great job, especially when you put a groove roller on it. Does a great job striping your lawn, but um, but really it, it it is not as good as say something like a Toro Greensmaster, which has this really big heavy rear drum and a big nice groove front roller. Right, the Allet has the rear drum as well. And it also has a, um, I don't think they have the grooved roller on, on, at least on the one I had, but the Sterling I was, I was testing had a solid roller. Um, and it's going to produce better stripes, it's gonna produce a better cut than your true cut will. That is a fact. Is it, is it better? Is it, it's gonna be better? Yes. Is it worth the price increase? Only you can really, uh, only you can really decide that, you know, if it's, if it's worth it for you. Um, if it were me, if, if you didn't need the interchangeable cartridge system, then something like a pre-owned Greens Master is a great option. But if you do want an interchangeable cartridge system more, so you want to be able to verticut and also you know have different options for like a 10 blade or a, a six blade real real option, um, and some of their others like the brushes and the um, the aerator um, cartridge, then an outlet is definitely worth considering because you get all these different tools all in one mower, which is which is kind of nice. So it. it the best answer is it, it really depends on you, man. Uh, if having owned both, like I own a True Cut and I own a Greens Master, I can say it would be very, very difficult to, to go, to put the Greens Master away and go back to only a True Cut because the level, the, 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 the cut quality is on another level. So hopefully that helps. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things you have to kind of see it yourself to appreciate it, but it is, if you have your True Cut and you like it and you're happy with it, stick with it, but a Greens mower will be better. All right, and your other follow-up comment is, oh, oh, okay, is it okay to plant annual flowers or flowers in a mulch bed after throwing down prodiamine? Mm, great question. It should be fine, uh, Omar, because the uh, the flowers that you're planting tend to have all the roots attached. Like, they've already got the, a, a relatively mature root system developed. So as long as, you, you know, you dig out, you're going to dig out a hole, which is going to disturb that barrier, that pre-emergent barrier anyway, and then you drop the, the flowers in there then you should be fine. Now, if you're planting them or trying to grow them from seed, you could have some challenges if you use pre-emergent in the mulch bed. But if you're using an, like an existing plant already growing and you're just transferring it from the pot and into your mulch bed, I don't see why that would not work out okay. I've never done it, but I can't see why that would not, why it wouldn't work. You should be, should be just fine. Okay, uh, T1000 says he hit the like button. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. And then Steve McQueen says, found your channel last week and I'm amazed. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm, I'm glad that I'm finally starting to get some traction. All the years of making horrible content and trying to really focus now on making better content and just sticking with it is starting to pay off. So I appreciate the kind words. It has not been a short process or a slow going process for sure, but I'm glad that it's, it's beginning to work. So appreciate that. All right, next up is uh, uh, Wilson Miranda. He says, what is the maximum height of cut for an 11 blade reel and to have it still look good? So it's different between mowers, but if you're talking about a Toro, per their documentation, they recommend that you keep, um, you limit your cutting range to 0.25, a quarter of an inch on the low end, and up to 0.75 or three quarters of an inch on the high end for an 11 blade reel. So if you're cutting, so for, for someone like me, an 11 blade reel is perfect because I really cut, I don't, not really, I don't, I don't cut above three quarters of an inch. And, uh, if, and right now I'm cutting at 0.625 is what the bench height is set to. So 11 blade is right there. That's a sweet spot for my, for what I'm doing on my lawn. And um, for the outlet, um, oh, he told me, Roland told me, but it's around the same thing. Really, once you're like uh, 0.75 or lower, you're getting into 11 blade reel status, if that makes sense. So. It's, uh, it's really about cutting height, and if you're, gunning, you're cutting shorter than three quarters of an inch, then 11 blade reel you would benefit from. Okay, next up is uh, Osas Konar. He says, hey Ron, thanks for all you do. I received my Caravan G. I ordered from the Golf Course Lawn Store. Yes, I'm glad that it made it safe. I'm glad to hear that. I always like to hear that. And I plan on applying it tomorrow. I have some dead spots on my lawn. I think it's a fungus infestation. So it depends, Osas. Without seeing the pictures, it's really difficult to tell you what kind of fungus it is. There is spring dead spot, which um, again, that problem started last fall and your lawn will recover from on its own. If you have a situation where you have a ring and there's like, so the ring of like dead grass or just or heavily discolored grass, and then there's a spot in the middle where it's still green, uh, that could be a large patch, could be brown patch, and those um, Caravan G will help with. Azoxystroma is gonna be great for that, for, that, um, for, for those, um, 
those um, fungi. So the big thing it's going to do is it's going to it's going to stop it from spreading any further, which is going to allow the lawn to heal on its own over the course of the next you know three weeks or so. So when you put it down, don't think that oh I'm going to apply the fungicide and the lawn is going to you know it's going to pop back green right away. What's going to happen is it's definitely not going to get any worse, and then within the, over the co next couple of weeks it's going to look a lot better. It's going to recover. Um, because you have an active um, fungus problem, an active disease problem in the lawn, I would highly recommend that you do a follow-up application of fungicide 28 days later. But I would not use Caravan G's. Because remember, Caravan G's, your insecticide and fungicide, 28 days from now, we don't need to smack the lawn again with insecticide all over again. You've already got that covered with the Caravan. So 28 days from now, after you apply your Caravan, Go, go go out with Headway G. So you, we also carry a Headway G on the golf course lawn. So you'll see that listed uh, there. I'll show you really quick. Save you time. I may as well show you because I got it up. So you have this. You're going to apply that tomorrow, which is great. In 28 days, apply this. Apply Headway. Use this to ensure that we you know we we get all of it. We don't have any bounce back or any any um, you know fungus re rears its ugly head again. Um, so just just to know that if you do a celeprin, use Headway with it. If you use Caravan, use Headway as the follow up afterwards. Don't do two applications of Caravan because you don't need to do the insecticide twice. Great stuff, sir. Thanks for sharing. I'm sorry you're dealing with some lawn disease in your lawn, but you got a great product that's going to help take care of it. If you have any questions or need any help um, with it, with anything else, you know, feel free to email me or just drop a comment in one of the videos, and I will uh, I'll get back to you. So thanks for the support. Really do appreciate it. Next up is NJ Pike Man. He says, I live in New Jersey. I bought a new house that has Bermuda grass in it in the backyard. In Jersey, Bermuda, that's interesting. This is kind of kind of cool for, for Bermuda for Bermuda. Um, can I do can it do well in New Jersey or should I consider replacing it? Um, it can do well for like a month or two. It's uh, Bermuda. <laughs> I have to ask you, um, NJ Pike, man. I mean, does it does when the middle of summer hits, does the lawn look good? Like, do you like how the lawn looks? Um, if you like the Bermuda and if you like, you know, how it looks in your lawn, then you can keep it. But I would say that it is not, it is not the the it would not be my first um, choice for grass for New Jersey. I would go with uh, if you want a taller lawn like a fescue or a rye or Kentucky bluegrass. That is a better fit for New Jersey because, because of the fact that you guys have colder weather for so much longer in the year. You know what I mean? You're gonna, you know, you guys really are only now starting to warm up. Whereas here in the Southeast, you know, Bermuda has been like love and life or in, in, since in, like early March, it's been coming out of dormancy since March. So it's your call. If you like the grass, you like how it looks and you want to keep it, that's fine. But just realize it's your growing season where the, where the grass is going to look really good is going to be shorter compared to what you would have if you had with say a rye, a fescue or a Kentucky bluegrass. So it's your call. Um, if you decide to do it, I absolutely would do a full renovation, meaning I would go, I would use a non-selective herbicide to kill the Bermuda. You'll probably have to do a couple of rounds of that and then replace it with uh, whatever you decide you want to go with, whether it be, you know, fescue or rye or, or, or KBG. So hope that helps. It, it's really up to you as far as which way you want to go. But I can just say that Bermuda would not be my first choice for... New Jersey. It's just just the wrong grass type for being up that that given that that it's that cold for that long of the year. Okay, next is Zach um, Salinger. He says, "What is your opinion of malorganite? Is that a fur that can be used all by itself during the season, or do other furs need to be used along with it?" So the answer to your question is: Is it um, can it be used by on its own? Yes. Is it all you need? It depends. It depends on what your and depends on what your soil test results say, right? So, if uh, I think the formulation in malorganite was it's is it a six zero four? I forget. I should know that. I know it's six percent nitrogen, and it has some. Um, was it six four zero? Maybe. Let's see. My uh, malorganite um, um, uh, analysis. Let's see. Analysis. Yeah, it is a six four zero. So it's got yeah. So nitrogen, a bit of phosphorus, and no potassium. So would I say that it's all you need for your lawn? No, because most lawns need potassium, right? All like kind of like nitrogen. Potassium is something that your lawn needs to be replenished. You need you need to you need to keep that in your soil. So I would say just on that alone, it is not enough. Now, as far as which fertilizer that you could use to augment, um, to you know help, help supplement a um, malorganite. A soil test is really going to give you the answer to that. You know, I, if, if it's even the right fit for your lawn, that's that's what that's what these are designed to tell you. They're designed to tell you 
what the nutrient levels are for the macros, like your NPK. And based on that, you're going to know which fertilizer you should be using on your lawn. But in general, Malorganite's a great fert. I use it for a number of years. Uh, I've got good results with it. I get better results um, ever since I started regular soil testing and started using products that match the results of my soil test. So take that for what it's worth. Um, a point about Malorganite that's that's kind of uh, kind of a sticking point for me is that it's gotten a bit expensive. So I remember when you could buy Malorganite for less than ten dollars a bag. And now it's more along the lines of $17 a bag when you can find it. And for that price, it's just, it's it's kind of pricey. It's too much for only 2,500 square feet of coverage. You know what I mean? So that for those reasons, I don't really use it anymore because one, it's hard to find. And then two, it's expensive for what it is. So hope that helps. I mean, I still like Milo. It's a great fert. People love it and still swear by it. And there's nothing wrong with it, especially if your soil test results say that its formulation is what you need. Uh, but it is expensive and there are better options, in my opinion, uh, for less money. So hope that helps, Zach. Let me know if I can help with anything else. Next is Mike Hammer says, um, Ron, can you use the Lansy compost spreader to apply carbonized PN and other Mir Mir Miramichi green products? I would use a, no, I would not really. The, the, the holes in the compost spreader on the compost spreader are too big. You're gonna, you're, you're gonna end up putting it down too heavy. Um, as far as other Miramichi green products, no. So the, the answer to, to the Lansy compost spreader is no on both accounts. The Carbon Pro G and or Essential G are designed to be applied with a broadcast spreader. Again, the holes in the compost spreader, way too big for that. And Carbonized PN, Carbonized PN is the only one you might be able to do, but you're gonna end up applying it really heavy if you decide to use that to do it. I would much rather uh, use the method that I showed in the video, in this video that I'll link here in the chat for you, recent video that I did on leveling your lawn. And in this video, I used um, the soil cubed uh, compost, but the same, the exact same thing would apply to uh, carbonized PN. As a matter of fact, I've got a video that will show you carbonized PN. Said last year I did, a, I did a carbonized PN video. So Mike at Mike Hammer, um, this is uh, this year's video, and then um, I will also link to you last year's video that actually does uh, feature carbonized PN, and I'll show you how I did it. I just pretty much spread it on the lawn, and then I just worked it in with the uh, with a leveling rake. So um, to answer your question, no, I would not use the, the Lanzi compost spreader for applying any of the Miramichi green products. I would use either a broadcast spreader, or I would use like the casting method that you're gonna see in the video that I am linking to you now. So uh, last year's video. So you got two videos in there, the one from this year, which shows you the casting method and how to apply it and use the, the rake, and then last year's video, which happens to feature carbonized uh, PN. So look at both of those and you should be good to go. Hope that helps. All right, next up is Joseph Robert. He says, happy Friday, Ron, and everyone, I'm late, double cut, and turf flex tonight. Very, very cool, Joseph, I like it, I dig it. You're uh, you're putting in putting in that work, man. Uh, that's that double cutting and then going out and spraying afterwards is not a, uh, you know, I don't know how big your lawn is, but that's, you know, that's getting it, so that's a lot. All right, next is uh, CR, it says, hi, Ron, what can I use to help my Bermuda to fully come out of dormancy? I, it just seems to be taking longer this season. So. Okay, so CR, a couple of things. Um, you know, we're starting to get heat now, so the lawn is really gonna begin to wake up. If you've not scalped your lawn, like if you've not like taken the height of cut down low, that is something you can do that's going to help the lawn wake up a bit faster. You know, you could have done that um, in March or April. You can even do it this month too. There's, no, there's nothing that says you can't scalp your lawn this month, but had you done it sooner, your lawn would be further ahead as far as green up. Uh, outside of that, um, Let's see, lowering your mowing height will help. And then the next thing out of out of the cultural practices, right? Meaning so either scalping it or going lower or mowing more frequently is I'd wanna take a look at the nutrient levels in your soil. So I, I wanna make sure you have enough nitrogen in the soil so that the, the, the grass has what it needs to really begin to take off. And the way you're gonna know about that is, you know what I'm gonna say, is to get a soil test done. So get get a soil test done if you've not done one as yet this season. Again, we have them in stock at the Golfers Lawn, lawn Store. Um, and that's gonna tell you what your nutrient levels are. If, you're, if your nitrogen in particular is low, that can be part of why the, the lawn is struggling to come out of dormancy as, compared to the lawns in your area. So, uh, you know, do get a soil test done. It'll, that's gonna give you the answers to the test. Also consider taking your height of cut down low, like doing a, a slight scalp. That's gonna help as well too. 
And a combination of those things between fertilizing, increasing your mowing frequency, and mowing a bit shorter are going to help, are going to speed up how quickly the lawn greens up. Hope that helps. Um, you know, sorry that your lawn's a little bit behind, but um, we can fix this. It can get better. All right, next is Ricky A. He says, hey, I talk about scalping. Just, hey, I scalped my lawn and I was cutting low, but I don't think I can keep it that low because my yard is not leveled right now and it looks dry, but I water every day. Do you have any advice for me to do? I think you said advice for me. Okay, you, have, you don't have anything else. All right, uh, so yeah, so Ricky, cutting low. You didn't see how low low is, but if you're cutting an inch and a half or lower, uh, really, you're gonna have to be to mow your lawn twice a week for it to look good. So two times a week is what it's gonna take for the lawn to, to look good. As far as it looking dry, could be a lot of things. You say you're watering every day, but if the soil is compacted, you know what I mean? So it's like, if your soil is hard, that could be you're putting a lot of water on it, but, but a lot of that water isn't getting absorbed into the soil profile. So that's where something like lawn aeration, which I did today, and I'll have a video on Sunday that you can check out on that, comes into play. Like that's a good process that you can do this time of year that is going to help improve, um, you know, that you get, it's going to help you get more out of anything you apply to your lawn. So as far as like when you water, the water is going to have a way to get down into the soil easier because you're going to be relieving compaction. If you're going to fertilize it, because again, the soil is opened up, you're going to be able to fast track those those nutrients into the soil. So there's a lot of benefits to, to, um, to aerating your lawn um, outside of just water, um, improved water retention. Uh, the next thing I would say as well, too, is if you've not considered a moisture manager, something like Hydrotain, I'd highly recommend that. So what I'm talking about when I say Hydrotain is go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop, and then go to moisture management. And you have two choices. You have a granular or a liquid um, option. The easiest version to apply is just to get this, the, the one that goes on the end of your hose. So you use a hose end sprayer. Um, spray that over your lawn, and that's going to help reduce the amount of water you have to put on your lawn by up to 50%. So it's a pretty big um, benefit as far as um, preventing your lawn from drying out for up to three months. Now, I don't wait that long to do another application. I tend to do it every six to eight weeks, um, but you can go longer than that if you you know if you need to. So I consider uh, incorporating something like Hydrotain, either the granular or the liquid, or if you want even super easy mode, again, the hose end sprayer into your program, that's gonna help you with um, with keep keeping water, keeping you know moisture in the soil. And then outside of that, I don't, I'm not, I don't have anything else for you really. I mean, you're cutting low, make sure, you're, make sure you're, that your mower is sharp so that you, know, you don't end up, um, despite the fact that you're, that you're mowing it, you end up with like dull looking grass because that's something people will tend to have if they're, if they're mowing their lawn frequently but not with sharp equipment. And that's about it, so I'd say aerate, after you aerate, apply Hydrotain, and uh, that should help things. That should help improve things because if you, if for someone that tells you they're watering their lawn every day, and it still doesn't look good, then um, I think it's a compaction issue, and it could also be a nutrient issue, right? So get you know start fertilizing if you've not done that as yet. And the way to know which fertilizer to use is to get use one of these guys, a soil test kit. So hope that helps. If you need anything else, let me know. All right, next up is Mauricio Salinas. He says, what is the difference between Essential G and Carbonized PN? Great question. So Carbonized PN is the basis for all the Miramichi Green Granular products, meaning that if you look at Essential G or Carbon Pro G, Carbon PN is the, the foundation of those products. Carbonized PN is a, it's not a, it does not come in prill form, meaning it's more like a top, it's like topsoil, right? So you need a manually spread it or have like a very specialized spreader to be able to spread carbonized PN. Um, it's the composition of it is it's half compost and it's half biochar. So it's really only two ingredients within carbonized PN, compost and biochar. Now take Essential G. Essential G has car the biochar that's in carbonized PN. It has compost. It also has reclaimed coffee grounds in it. It has humate and it also has a bit of silica in it as well. So it has as far as... Um, uh, carbonized PN and Essential G, you can think of like Essential G as carbonized PN with a with more ingredients added and then turned into a prill. So you can actually put it down using a broadcast spreader. So it's the the, the two are both by Miramichi Green. They're both excellent products. Um, depending on what you're going for, like if you're trying to top dress your lawn and you and you you know you had the budget to buy a lot of carbonized PN, I highly recommend it. You're gonna get a great result. Your lawn is gonna be super green. Like if you wanna see what carbonized PN will do to a lawn, I'll show you here really quick. 
Uh, if we go back to shop and mirror green biostimulants, and then you go to carbonized PN, right? Which is, I, I really like to recommend this as a top dressing product. Uh, I need to expand this. It's not easy to use whenever I, um, I have the size of the screen set up to where it's easier for, um, for it to show up properly on the screen, but then it makes it makes it more difficult to go down here. Okay, so if we move down to here, this is the lawn right after applying carbon, get my face out of the way. This is the lawn right after applying carbonized PN. And then this is the lawn after carbonized PN 10 days later. So there's no fertilizer that, in addition that was added to this. This was strictly from carbonized PN. And you can see, hopefully it's coming out in the picture, how like how vibrant and how deep the color is, like how, how, how the lawn just pops from this. Um, because you, you're talking about literally one of, one of the richest um, compost products that you can apply to your lawn. So for top dressing, it's, it's incredible. But for you know, covering a large area or doing, um, you know, something you can do on your lawn regularly, it's just not convenient because it's not a prill. It's not, it, you need, you need like a, you need like either a shovel and a way to, to manually spread the stuff, or you need like a very specialized spreader that like one of these rotary um, spreaders that they use on golf courses to be able to use carbonized PN. So that's what Essential G comes in. You can use it in your Earthway, in your Scots, um, and it essentially is carbonized PN with some more goodies added to help enhance the performance. So hope that helps. If you need anything else, let me know. All right, next up is John Rob Will. He says, wrong one. He says, what's up, Ron? Is 901C a fast release fertilizer? I'm currently um, using um, high bricks and I'm looking for a new liquid to pair up with it. Um, so yeah, so as far as it being something that's going to release the nutrients over the course of, of four to six weeks, then yes, it, it, it meets the bill for that. It's not like um, uh, like the Greens Plus, like on the store, we also carry a liquid fertilizer called Greens Plus, which is this, has a slow release nitrogen in it. Um, 901C, you'll apply that, and within two to three days, you're going to see a, a color response from it. Um, so as far as the fert you're referring to, I am not familiar with that one, but if it's a quick release fert and you want to, you know, you want to be able to um, pair up 901C along with that, by all means you can. Something you can do is if you have a liquid fur that you already like, John, instead of using nine, um, 901C, use Release Zero. Because remember, these two guys, 901C and Release Zero, are essentially the same product. One has fertilizer in it and one does not. So Release Zero, Release Zero here, and 901C, both, they both have the 10% micronized carbon. They both have... Um, other stimulants, other other um, other micronutrients in them. So from that standpoint, the formulations between them is identical. The only difference is with release 901C, you got the 9% nitrogen, 1% pota um, potassium. With release zero, the idea is that you're going to add a fertilizer of your choice along with that uh, to get the results. So either one will work, but if you have a, a liquid fertility you already like, then maybe consider release zero instead of release 901C. But you can certainly do both. You can certainly use 901C and that FERT, just make sure that you are being conscious of the application rates so you don't go too heavy. You know what I mean? So you gotta make sure you're you're not, um, you're not managing how much nitrogen that you're putting into the lawn when you start mixing multiple liquid FERTs. Hope that helps. If you have any other questions, let me know. All right, we got a super chat that I gotta run down here and get from Mr. Lance F. Super chat received. Thank you so much for that, Lance. I really do appreciate the all the love and support. Thanks for the super chat. And let me see if I can find where I was. Oh my Lord, this is always the worst part of scrolling down, but I did it. I'm getting better at it, guys. I am improving. All right, next is um, Justin Sharpie says, that image you keep showing appears to be slime mold, in my opinion. So, so we're hearing slime mold and I'm hearing dog vomit um, fungus. So it sounds like there's a couple of runners for that thin cut. So you, you got a couple of different um, opinions on what it could be, so. Hope that is helping you out. The the like the 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 uh, the audience is coming through as always to come help get you the answer uh, to your question. Next up is Steve S. He says, "Hey, I just moved into this house and the previous owner was horrible to it. I'm tired of raking the sweet gumballs um, that are pressed into the soil. So many dead leaves under the grass too. So I'm not sure what you mean um, by the gumballs, um, Steve S." Um, Raking the sweet gumballs that are pressed into this. Oh, are you talking about literally gumballs? Like gumball gumballs? Like the kids, like they just, they literally, are you talking about literally like chewing gum? Um, that's a first. <laughs> that's a first. I've not heard that one before. Uh, so, but here's the thing, Steve. The fact that you now have the lawn and that you're paying attention to it, 
you're not gonna be raking gumballs and other trash out of the lawn forever. So right now is like the pain phase where you're trying to recover the lawn, you're trying to you know get it under control. And in your case, in addition to debris, like you know dead leaves and gumballs or some of the stuff you have to get rid of. Once you get ahead of that, you're gonna, you know, the lawn's gonna, it's gonna start, it's gonna really wake up and start doing well. But given that it was neglected for a long time, you can't expect to be able to turn it around overnight. But I always tell people, you know, the lawn didn't get where it was overnight and you're not going to get it back into like, you're not going to turn it into a golf course lawn overnight. But if you're consistent in your work and what you're doing, you will get a, uh, you know, you will get a good, a good result. And, you know, while I, I forget to do this, Lance F also had the same amount for his super chat. So I got to add him as a show sponsor too. So we got Lance F in there as too. Cool. So Josh, LG, and, and Lance F are now sponsors of tonight's live stream. I appreciate it. Someone's got to beat 1999 to be able to, to knock them off. I think these guys are going to hold on to it. The way it's going. All right. Um, I have a few couple other uh, super chats and super stickers. Let me run out here and grab those really quick. I appreciate it. The first one is Cameron. He says, video game controller jumps up and down excitedly. Super chat received. Thanks for that. And then John Rob Wills says, Super chat received. Thanks for all you do. I appreciate that, John. Thank you for all the love and support. I really, really do appreciate it. You helped me pay for that um, aerator rental that I had today. So thank you guys so much for um, the, the financial support. It definitely, definitely helps out. Next up is Grasshopper Lawn Care in Georgia. Says, happy the Friday the 13th, everyone. It is Friday the 13th. It was a good one. Um, and then next up is uh, Steve S. He's back. He says, I'm Jonesing to dethatch or scarify. Yeah, I'm not sure what kind of grass you said you have, but if it's one of the grass types, like, you know, a fescue or, um, you know, one of the taller, one of the, uh, the taller grass types that can benefit from like scarifying or just they can just use, they can use for a good help, benefit from a good clean out, then scarifying um, is a good idea. Maybe even for Bermuda, right? In your case where you've got a lot of trash in there and you want, you want to get it cleaned out, even though I don't regularly scarify Bermuda, in your case, it might be a good idea, you know, given that the lawn's been highly neglected and you're just trying to get it cleaned up, you know, to help the lawn be able to start doing its thing well. All right, next is Huey Dewey. It says, uh, I've learned a lot watching your videos to fix my grass situation. I've removed the thatch and tomorrow I'll be doing a soil sample. Then it will be on to the other steps taught in your videos. That's awesome, man. I really, really appreciate that, uh, Huey Dewey. I'm glad that you are finding the content useful and that you are um, you know, taking action and actually doing the things that are gonna help you get a good result. Soil testing is huge, huge, hugely important, especially if you're really serious about getting a good lawn um, there's nothing, nothing like knowing what you should be applying to your soil and soil testing is going to, going to tell you that. And given that it's not that expensive, it's something that really everyone should be doing. All right. Um, next is, um, thin cut says, uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, hey, Ron, if you want to send a sticker to him, I'm sending one of mine as well. LOL. Yep. I still think I have your stickers in the drawer, uh, thin cut. So if I've got one, I will send it over to him. If he sends me an email saying, Hey, I am Mark from the live stream. Next is Ken Kong. Ken says, my side, my side yard is slanted like your front. I absolutely hate cutting it. It seems you don't showcase the front near as much as the back. You hate it too? Um, yeah, so no, it's not so much I don't showcase the front as much as the back. It's just the, the back is a lot more impressive. I mean, I've got pictures of the front. I do show it off. Um, and, and as far as cutting the front, I don't hate it. It's just, it's, um, they're both about the same. I mean, I don't dislike cutting the front more than I like cutting the back. The front's smaller, so I'm able to cut it faster. So I don't really like it's not really like one is better than the other, but I mean, this is a picture of my front lawn. This was from a couple of weeks ago and it looks good. And it's the big thing with it is like, to your point, there are challenges with mowing it as far as having the mow diagonally, but it's not bad. I've gotten, you know, I've gotten used to doing it over a number of years and I get a pretty good result with the way I, I cut it. But um, yeah, they, they've all got good points to them and they've all got problem areas to them. The back lawn has problem areas. Like the, the front lawn, for the most part, tends to remain fungus and disease free uh, for the most part. And the back lawn tends to struggle in some areas with that. So there's no free lunch. There's always, you know, there's always a, a gotcha somewhere. But uh, but as you do a bit more, Ken, you can, you can get better at it and you, you might even start enjoying it. You know, try mowing diagonally. That's something that I started, I did, I started doing you know, years ago and it made a really big difference in the quality of cut and help reduce the pain factor of mowing a sloped lawn. LG says dog vomit equals slime, mode, slime mold, harmless other than the fact that it blocks the grass blades from receiving sunlight, easily rinsed off with a, with a water hose. So there you go. LG saying nothing to worry about, clean it off, rinse it off, and you're good to go. Nothing to worry about, thin cut. 
he's adding some additional. So, so you know, Mark told us what it is. LG said, hey, it's this and this same thing. And just break your garden hose out and you're good to go. So LG always trying for extra points. That's just the way he rolls. Next is Thaddeus B. He says, hey, Ron, I'm planning to switch from Centipede to Bermuda. Good choice. He says, any advice to help the process go smoothly with great results? Yeah, so I'm not sure how you're planning to go about that, Thaddeus, but really I'd say the um, the scorched earth approach is, is likely gonna yield a better result. So if you wanna kill off the centipede, if you wanna go after it with, um, I think Quinn Clorac will kill centipede. So if you wanna use it, or but if you're gonna wanna go just straight non-selective and use glyphosate to burn down the lawn, get rid of the centipede and then sod Bermuda, that can absolutely work. If you're trying to do them both at the same time, don't really recommend that. But if you decide to do, you want to do that because you don't want the lawn to look ugly for the period when you're transitioning from the centipede to Bermuda, then what you're going to want to do is use a selective herbicide that will damage the centipede, but is uh, safe for Bermuda. So I, I'm almost positive that quinclorac um, will damage. Let me check here really quick, just to make sure I'm giving you good information. But I'm almost positive that it will damage. Yeah, it is. Don't use it on centipede. Yeah. So almost positive. So centipede is safe for. Or sorry, um, quinclorac is safe for Bermuda, but it is not safe for centipede. So if you apply quinclorac at you know at medium to higher rates, it's going to damage the centipede, eventually kill it. Whereas Bermuda will tolerate that fairly well. So depends on which way you want to go. I would recommend doing scorch earth, burn it all down, and bring the Bermuda sod in, and you know prosper but it's totally up to you which way you want to go uh, about it. Um, I would not try and do both at the long at the same time long term because they look different, they grow differently, and you're just not going to be happy with having a centipede and Bermuda lawn. Next is Herve Luc Lucidisu. He says, um, happy Friday, Ron. Just wonder if you have a phone number I can send some of my photos of my lawn so you can recommend to me what I can put on. And by the way, when can I water my lawn after applying weed and feed? So what I do have is an email address, um, Herve. If you email me here, ron at golfcourselawn.com, I can take a look at the pictures you have and I can help you out uh, that way. And then as far as applying your water your lawn after weed and feed, um, it depends on the weed and feed. So if it's a um, if it's a granular product, and if it's, it depends on the, it depends on the, the weed and feed products. So if you have, you have some weed and feed products that have post-emergent herbicides in them, meaning they are designed to kill weeds that are currently growing. And in the case of those, you want the lawn to already be wet, apply those to the lawn, allow them to dry on the lawn. And then if you want to water the next day, you're fine to do so. If you have a weed and feed that is a, um, it's got some fertilizer in it, typically potassium, um, but it also contains a pre-emergent, then that you want to water in right away. So it depends on what kind of weed and feed you're talking about, whether you need to wait a, wait a day to water in or you want to water in right away. If you, if you don't know which one, um, do you don't know which one, then the safer bet is to apply it, you know, um, apply it and then wait a day before watering it in. But it, the, the label should tell you that. The label should provide guidance on uh, you know whether it needs to be applied to wet or dry grass and as far as watering intervals after application. So hope that helps. If you need anything else, uh, let me know. Again, my email address is here, ron at golfforcelon.com. I will try to help you out. And you said, I tried to send it, but I didn't want to want to email, I'm not sure. I'll tell you what you can do is, Herve, if you want, you can text me at the store's number. So if you go to the golf course lawn store, right, right here. The phone number we have up here, um, if I move my face out of the way, uh, the 770-863-8018, you can text that number and I will get it and I'll be able to go back and forth with you that way if you wanna send me pictures that way too. So that will help as well. Use the phone number that's on the golf course lawn store in the upper right hand corner and I will get the pictures you send to me uh, that way. It's probably, the reason why it's not going through an email is probably a size thing if the pictures are too big. Uh, they'll get blocked or dropped by the uh, by by some mail servers. So you may need to either make this picture smaller or you can text the pictures to the phone number for the golf course lawn store. All right, next is, um, what do we have here? We got um, T1000 talking about a fed out fellow Est Austonian, but the next we'll, we'll comment is from Dwayne Hopkins, where he says, hey Ron, happy Friday the 13th. I really liked your new outlet video. It looks like a quality mower. Although I don't have plans to buy it, it's great to see where battery powered real mowers are going. Yeah. Yeah, it is really cool. You know, it's 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 a very it's a very cool mower. It does a lot of things that no other mower really does, right? So, I mean, or, or at least at that that are also of comparable quality. Because because even though 
you know, in the live stream, some of the, or not the live stream, in the video, some of the comments I got from people were saying, oh, well, you know, it's a, it's just an ego or it has like ego handlebars or it's ego electronics. I'm not paying, you know, five grand or whatever for the mower because, it's, you know, it's, it's got basically an ego mower. Here's the thing you got to realize, guys, is that like designing electronics is really hard. Like designing consumer electronics is very hard. And then designing consumer electronics that have to work in, you know, harsh conditions, like being like outside where they can get wet and dew and moisture, that type of thing is also another order of magnitude difficult. So it makes sense to me that Allet would partner with Ego um, or Greenworks or one of these manufacturers that makes a bajillion lawn care tools every year and has figured out like what works and what doesn't work from a standpoint of electronics and switches and batteries and all that kind of stuff and allows them to work on the thing that they are good at, which is designing the, the chassis of the mower, designing the interchangeable cartridge system, um, you know, that kind of stuff, the actual mowing part of the mower, the electronics portion of it. Um, you know, again, I guess there's some comments where people were saying, you know, it's, 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 there's too much ego parts in it. And I'm like, I mean, that's kind of a good thing. It's kind of like, you think a good example, not to beat this point to death too much. If you look at like one of the most reliable luxury car brands, which is Lexus, um, Lexus is built by Toyota and Toyota builds a ton of cars every year. Right. So they have a big, a huge pool to pull from when it comes to like building reliable switches, a reliable engine, reliable exhaust. I mean, just all the stuff that breaks tends to break in luxury, luxury cars like Toyota has all this stuff figured out because they have a ton of cars that they build. Right. So it makes sense to me that it's um, it's that they're using, you know, their know how as far as designing an interchangeable cutting system. Um, but at the same time, also, you know, relying on electronics that have been vetted and that are more reliable and that, frankly, you don't want to like I, I would have more pause of buying that mower if they did their own electronics versus them using one from an established source. You know, so that's, you know, for, for what that's for that's worth. But it is cool. It's a cool mower. The one thing I kind I really do like about it is the verticutting aspect of it and that it has the, gra the, the grass catcher so I could literally verticut my lawn and not have to go rake it up afterwards. That is pretty cool. That's that's a nice that is a nice feature. It sounds really basic. And I don't know that that alone would be worth spending like five grand for me to get one. But it's it is a cool feature. But I appreciate you watching, uh, Dwayne. Let me know if I can help with anything else. And I, I'm, I think they're going to sell a lot of those mowers. It's a pretty, it's a very nice unit. They did a good job with it. All right, next is Sean Scott. He says, good evening, Ron. Temps are rising in Virginia, and now the snakes are out. Any ideas how to keep them away from the house? Already got rid of one. Thanks for your time. Um, there is, someone was talking about some natural repellents for, sn for snakes. I think, and it was around like fragrances, like, um, I don't know if it was like um, like peppers or, or something along those lines. They, they, there, there were some things you can apply that are snake repellent. I mean, you can probably go to Do My Own or, or, or some other place and, and look for and search for snake repellent. And they'll have they'll have something. I don't know off the top of my head. Here we go. Yep, there you go. Um, snake out snake repellent. I don't know what's in it, but it apparently is for keeping snakes away. It looks it's got, yeah, so cinnamon. So it's got cinnamon oil, clove oil cedar oil, so pretty much things that are probably irritants to the snake's sense of smell to help them stay away. Uh, so you can look you can look that up. I will, um, I'll put a link here in the chat for you so you can take a look at that, Sean. So at Sean Scott, take a look at that. That might, well, that could help you as far as keeping, uh, keeping them away. I've never used the product, but it's, um, you know, it makes sense to me that like some kind of a fragrance that would be irritating to the snakes would be a good option for keeping them out of your lawn. All right. Dwayne Hopkins is up next. He says, I applied some triad herbicide and it worked great at killing the weeds. Awesome. Like to hear that. I use my T jet tip. I had some yellowing and it's the two and it's, I had some yellowing and it's 24 inches in width because of my spray pattern. Is there any other tip you use? No, the foliar tip is the one I would go with, but then again, that's, you know, that's a perfect, that's a, that's a great um, example because, you know, people will, will talk to me and they'll say, hey, I can get Triad or I can get like uh, some other product that has like 2,4-D in it or Celsius, or sorry, not Celsius, or or, um, or like um, Spectracide. And, you know, that's a great product. Why would I go and spend more money on Celsius? And what you're t experiencing is exactly why Celsius is an awesome herbicide. Because as long as you're not like a hooligan with application rates, like you actually apply it the way you're supposed to apply it, you really, really should not get yellowing of your turf when you apply Celsius. Now, the negative to that is that it costs more. It's more expensive um, than Triad is, but the benefits are it kills a whole lot of stuff. You can, uh, you can apply it in higher temps, and it tends to not cause the yellowing that many of the less expensive, that, but equally, but also effective 
um, herbicides tend to have. So that just, just when I saw that, it was like a, something that popped to mind because people ask, you know, why is it so much more money? Why should I get that when I can just buy something that's like, you know, 40 or 50 or $60 that will kill the weeds? I'm like, yes, it will kill the weeds, but it's also going to discolor your grass in most cases where Celsius will not. So hope that helps. Um, Dwayne, as far as tips, not really. The, the, the foliar tip is the one that I would go with if you happen to be, this one here is the, is the, the go-to. If you happen to be spraying on a day when it's a bit more windy, not a windy day, but there's like a, a, a light breeze and you want to minimize drift, then you can go with this guy, which is a uh, their air induction tip. I like to refer to this as like the medium tip because it still puts out a droplet size that's fine enough for foliar apps, but it's a little bit bigger to where the wind isn't gonna be able to move it around quite as easily. So if you want something a little bit heavier or a little heavier duty or slightly larger droplet size than the T-Jet foliar, then the air induction tip is the way to go, this guy here. And if you want one, I will, um, I think I have a, a link for that in, in that I can put in the chat for you. So here we go. So this is the air induction tip. And I even give you the model number. So if you decide that you don't want to buy it from Amazon, I don't want to use Ron's link. You can just go look it up and you can buy it elsewhere. So you have, you have options, giving you options. Hope that helps, sir. Let me know if you need anything else. Devin is in the house. He says, what's up, Ron? Good turf, good, good, good Friday turf talks going on, Devin. Thanks for coming to hang out, sir. Still need to get you back on the live stream. I still need to send you that thing I said I was going to send to you and I still haven't sent yet. I'm, I'm a bad, I'm a bad friend. I'm taking too long to, to get that out to you. I know it. I have not forgotten, but we got to get you back on. And then next up is Alexander Lee. He says, enough about lawns for a bit. How do you like your eggs? Why you gotta come in and troll me, man? Why you gotta be like that, Alex? So if you guys don't know, Alex is my neighbor next door. You know, you'll see him in like a lot of the videos that I do as far as um, the top dressing videos, the aeration videos. He's often the guy that's getting all those really, really crispy and sweet shots when there's anything moving and there's someone holding the camera. It's Alex, so give him lots of love. And as far as eggs, here's the thing. I'm probably gonna get hatred for this because a lot of people are gonna tell me I'm, I'm like being too basic, but I'm just a scrambled eggs kind of guy. You know, I grew up, I grew up in the islands and like runny eggs are not, I mean, for us, it's not really a thing. Like we eat mainly like eggs that are cooked are scrambled. So um, like sunny side up or over easy or just any kind of like if I, if I can like poke, like poke the yolk and it like starts getting runny, like it grosses me out. So I know like I'm probably the minority on this one, but I don't like runny eggs. I like, I like my eggs well done, cooked, uh, scrambled is what I normally go with, but I could do, you know, I could do like an omelet as long as it's, or like, as long as it's cooked, cooked really well, I'm good with that. I don't really care for runny eggs. So I know it makes me kind of basic, right? Next is Eric B. He says, Hey, my bro, Ron Moss outworked like, uh, worked by turning, worked out by turning black, rake it out or let the heat kill it. Best rake to remove moss without damaging the grass. Uh, rake is best. Also a celebrant, keep out ant mounds. I still see small ones. Okay, a lot in that. So as far as getting the rake, the grass out, I would just rake it out. Um, a, a grass rake should do the, should do the tricks, like a like a grass rake with the um, like in the metal the metal finger grass rakes. That's a good way of doing it. That should should get the moss out without doing too much damage to your existing grass. So that's what I would go with. A cellar print for ants? No, for ants, what you're going to want to use is a product called Advion, and Advion is one of my favorite products for. Um, for just keeping ants out of your lawn. It's, um, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you how, what it is and how I would use it. So it's called Advion Fire Ant Bait. I will um, post a link here in the chat for you, Eric. And let's talk, this is like literally one of the first um, products from Syngenta that I used. So with Advion Fire Ant Bait, it comes in a two, it comes in a bag, but, but the way I normally buy it is in a two pound jug uh, that has like a little salt, a pepper shaker um, portion you can flip up, right? The way you can use this product to keep ants out of your lawn is buy this. It's going to be like 40 bucks, not super expensive. And I think I put it, I put a link in the chat there for you. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to walk the perimeter like immediately around your house. So like you know, the patio all around the house and you're going to go out and, and spray the granules all around your house. The next pass you're going to do is you're going to walk the perimeter of your lawn. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to keep one, the ants away from like the common areas of your, your house. And then by putting it on the outskirts, you're gonna you're gonna do things to push them, push the ants into. I mean, it's not really nice, but you're pushing, you're keeping them out of your lawn and into the neighbor's lawn or wherever else they happen to come from. So a band around your house, immediately around your house, and then another band around the perimeter of your property. 
Um, and that's, you know, then you're going to be covered as far as ants go. Um, the two pound jug on my lawn, I am able to get away with buying one a year. One, one really cute t tends to last me like a season and a half. So like it's for 40 bucks, it's really, really good product for keeping ants away. That is what I would recommend. A celeprin is not for that. A celeprin is more for grubs, bluegrass weevils, like lawn damaging insects, not so much so for ants. So hope that helps. If you need anything else, let me know, let me know. All right, so next up is two shots of vodka. I'm winding down here, guys. He says, um, Ron, just scalp the lawn, getting ready to leave tomorrow. Would you put down prior to leveling? So let me, oh, you, prior to level to leveling, you mean tomorrow. So you scalped, you're getting ready to level. What would I put down prior to leveling? Okay, so if you, well, you're doing it tomorrow. So if you don't have it already, if you don't have it already, you're not gonna be able to, to, do, to do much with it, right? But if I could, we could Thanos snap, right? I could like drop, you know, drop a care package into your garage right now. In that care package would be a fertilizer that matches the soil, uh, the, the, which, is, which your soil needs. So for your fertilizer of choice that matches what your soil needs, so that would be a thing. Um, if you didn't have one or you didn't do your soil test results, like, uh, like a starter fert will be good too in a pinch. I would also give you essential G and I would go heavy with that. Like I would go really heavy with the, with the granular um, biostimulants. I think that's really great right after aeration or really after even scalping when the, when the lawn is opened up. It's a great time to apply those types of products. Um, if you are an area where it gets hot, so the Southeast US, then I would go out with like also a granular hydrotain. So I would do um, I would do your fertilizer, a um, essential G, I would do granular hydrotain, and then I would top dress it. Like I, that's exactly what I would do. Like what I did in the video last year, um, this time of year, is what I would do on your lawn. Now, if you don't have any of those things, uh, the fertilizer is something you can probably get your hands on between now and tomorrow or before you start top dressing. And you can, if you don't have your fert in stock, get like a, a basic starter fert and apply that. Just something to kind of, you know, give the, the 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 grass a little bit of a kicker to to grow through the top dressing a bit faster. It's gonna help it recover a bit faster. And outside of that, don't go too heavy and have fun. Have, have as much fun as you can top dressing a lawn. How about that? All right, next is Win Charity says, good evening all, cutting uh, grass with a rotary gives you a short shag carpet Real mower gives you a low pile carpet. That's a good way of, that's a good analogy. It's a good analogy. So if you're cutting it regularly, you know, you get more of a shag carpet, taller grass look. And if you want that low, um, like Berber carpet, or that kind of like a really like, you know, like really tight turf, then real mow. I'm more of a real mower type person. All right, next is Donald McFarlane. He says, hey Ron, have you used Dirty Booster Plus? I don't even know what that is. So the answer is no. I don't know what that is. I've never used it. Uh, next is Justin Winters, AKA the big idea. He says, I just got the time cutter zero turn with my, with a ride, with a ride with, for less than 5k. And it's an awesome on slope. So there you go. So for the person that was talking earlier in the chat, I forget your name, but if you were was asking for a good, uh, uh, ride on uh, mower, ride on rotary mower, that's a zero turn for around four to $5,000. Justin is weighing in with the time cutter that he really likes done by Toro. So probably a good product. All right. Next is uh, Javier Sola saying opinion on the Pro Vista St. Augustine. Mm. So I don't have St. Augustine. So my, my opinion is based on what I see Alan saying when he talks about it. The fact that they've done, they've engineered a, a variant of St. Augustine that can tolerate glyphosate is pretty cool because it say, allows you to save, I guess, on herbicides. You can just kind of use glyphosate for everything, which, I mean, I, I, when they say it will tolerate it, I wonder if it, if, it, if it literally will not injure it at all. That might be the case. If so, very cool. Um, outside of that, some of the benefits about it is that it's supposed to take less water and have a better color. Like, you know, you know all the things that the newer grass cultivars are supposed to have. Alan's lawn looks great, but Alan could grow anything and make it look great, right? So I... I, I I guess what I'm saying is if I were if I were in a St. Augustine person and I were going or I were going to start a lawn with St. Augustine, Pro Vista would be one of the ones that I would consider based on what I've seen from people whose opinion I respect uh, that, you know, they've gotten good results with it. So but not from my direct experience, because obviously I don't have it, but it's not it's definitely one that would be in the running for me. So that's uh, that's my opinion on it, Javier. Uh, hope that helps. Appreciate the question. Leon Harris says, what are your thoughts on liquid fertilizer? Love it. You talk about it. I love, love me some liquid fert. I, I like to use liquid fert in, in, 
combination with granular. So I use granular first to do the heavy lifting. And then I use a liquid fert like 901C, like um, like release 901C along with Nutrizol for the micronutrient to get, um, to help fill in the nitrogen needs for the lawn, for the, the monthly nitrogen need for the lawn, and then help um, keep the color and growth, you know, more even. The nice thing about uh, granulars is that it's easy to get like a, to apply a heavier amount of nitrogen using a granular. But what tends to happen is you get a green up and then it sort of begins to taper off. The nice thing with liquids, at least the way that I use them, is that by applying them every couple of weeks, you're able to have the color remain relatively consistent um, and without pushing a lot of excess growth, right? And because I use plant growth regulator on my lawn, like, I'll actually get here and I'll actually show you the, what, I, what I use. Because I also use PGR, um, which um, and the one I'm using is, is Primo Max. Um, I like liquids because it gives me an option to, to be able to do all that at one time. You know what I mean? So I can apply, I can apply my plant growth regulator. I can do my liquid um, fertilizer apps. Um, and it's a good way to get like micronutrients and um, biostimulants. Like there's, there's a lot of benefits to, to, to using liquids along with, uh, with granulars. So if you go to the Gulf Force Lawn Store and you go to the lawn fertilizer section. So the ferts that I use that I'm currently using are the Release 901C, uh, this one right here. And I use it along with Nutrizolve, which has been, been obviously very well received this year because it's currently sold out. We're gonna get more of that in stock soon, but 901C and Nutrizolve, these two I use together along with Primo Max. So that's, from, from a standpoint of applying plant growth regulator, that is my stack for that. But um, what I do every two weeks, if you wanna know the complete package, is I use the, the Golf Course Lawn Carbon Kit, which is, let me go over here to Miramichi Green Biosimilants. So that is the Release 901C, that's a microbial product called Biospectrum and a kelp product called NutriKelp. So I use 901C, I use Biospectrum, and I use NutriKelp, all of those which conveniently come in a kit that saves you a bit of money and time. And I, with, so, I'm sorry, with that, I mix a bit of um, the Nutrisolve micronutrient, so which has your iron, your zinc, your manganese, boron, copper, pretty much all the micronutrients that are in that product. And that is what I use every couple of weeks on my lawn to produce really, really nice color without a lot of ex excessive growth. I also will mix some plant growth regulator in with that. The one that I use is Primo Max. Comes with a convenient measuring cup that's also available on the Golf Course Lawn Store. So it's, it's I like a hybrid program, I guess is what I'm getting to. You know what I mean? Because there are some products that are, there's are, there are advantages from applying them in liquid form and there are some there are some products or some certain nutrients like your like your NPK where applying those at higher rates um, in from a granular makes a lot of sense. So I use a hybrid approach. I don't do all liquid. I don't do all granular. I do liquids and granular together. So hope that helps, Leon. If you have any other questions, let me know. And then Beavis says, "Oh snap! I just bought the carbon kit today. Awesome, man! I'm gonna give you applause for that. Appreciate the support. Thank you for picking up the carbon kit. Thanks so much for that, Beavis. Let me know how it works out for you." Next is Calvin Tubbs. He says, hey, Ron, first year real mowing, really loving this man, cutting at least twice a week, getting ready to apply hydrotain next week. Um, thanks for the excitement and lawn care. A couple of you sent me a couple of pictures in email. I'll take, take a look at them, Calvin, once I get through with the live stream tonight. If you're fine with it, I will show them on the live stream next week. But uh, I appreciate that. I'm glad that you're getting into real mowing and you're really enjoying it and that you're just enjoying the process, right? Because it's a ton of fun. Tons of fun, and it's it's a great way to kind of make, you know, to get that lawn that dominates the neighborhood. Have the lawn that everyone's talking about, and I think that, you whether know, we'll admit it or not, everyone on this on the live stream at some level wants that, right? You want the lawn that your neighbors are going to envy a little bit. So I'm glad that you're getting that, Calvin. As always, let me know if I can help with anything else. Okay, Eric B. says, hey, Ron, uh, use Stress Blend 7020 only in cool, cool grass in summer. Best not to use higher end for it in the summer for cool season grass. Already bought the lawn care for it prior to knowing more about the lawn care nut uh, program. Yeah, so uh, for cool season grass, it makes sense to use a lower nitrogen fertilizer like Stress Blend because you're not really trying to push a lot of growth during the summer months. So like Kentucky bluegrass, your fescues, your rye, they tend to see stress in higher temperatures, right? Hence the name Stress Blend. So the um, the... 
um, the 20% potassium that's in that fur will helps 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 with 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 um, the movement of water with moisture. That was one of the, one of the things that potassium does helps with the movement of 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 vital nutrients and water throughout the plant, which is helpful during the summer months. So yeah, I completely agree with that. Using the stress blend during the summer month for cool season grass makes a lot of sense. You could use it for Bermuda as well during the summer months, but really Bermuda is a grass that you can feed all throughout the time when it's growing. So I would not necessarily say that stress blend is the best option for Bermuda during the summer because Bermuda loves summer months. It loves heat, right? It loves heat and it loves nitrogen. So um, I agree with that with with your um, what your your question as far as using stress blend for cool season grass uh, during summer months. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, TD Sims says, are there some real mowers out there for people on a budget? Yeah. Yeah, there are TD. So it depends on what your budget is. You can start with like a push reel mower. Uh, Scott's has their new pro uh, push reel mower, which is pretty sweet. It's got like a seven blade. I think it's an 18 inch with a cut and it's got an eight. It's got a, um, a seven blade reel in it, which is kind of cool. And I don't know if I, yeah, I think I got a picture. I got a video right here, right here. So this is it. This is the, the new the new hotness, 18 inch cut. This is the Ron Henry edition from Edwin. As you can see, you put the sticker on it. So I appreciate that. I got to show it off. So as far as like getting into real mowing, just to seeing if that, if it's for you, then a push reel mower by far is going to be the most economical way to go, right? So this mower you can have for um, under 150 bucks or 10, not that expensive. Um, and that's going to at least get you a taste into real mowing to see one, do you like it? Do you like having to get out there a couple times a week? And this is something you want to make a bigger investment in uh, bef um, before, you know, you know, you don't want to go out and buy, spend several thousand dollars on a powered reel mower if you don't know that you're going to like the results you're getting with the push reel mower and if you just have the time to do it. So if you do and you say, yes, hey, no, I don't want a push reel mower. I want to go up and go out and a step up. And that's where we can get into mowers like True Cuts, like McLean's, like California Trimmers. You can buy those mowers pre-owned at reasonable prices. Like Alex got his for like 650 bucks, I believe, and his still runs great. You know, you may have to do some maintenance on, on them occasionally, but for $650, $650 to $1,000, you're going to be able to get into a quality pre-owned um, mower, like again, a California Trimmer or a McLean or, or a True Cut, any of those, that's going to serve you really well. And then after that, and then you start getting into the greens mowers, which are going to, I don't like buying a greens mower for really for less than $2,000, $2,500, because the ones that cost less than that tend to either need, they need something. They either need like another reel or they need a fresh bed knife or they need, you know, they need, they need something, they need some money put into them to get them right. Whereas if you can get more closer to that $2,000, $2,500 range, you get a mower that in most cases has got a fresh, you know, it's got a fresh reel in it, it's got a fresh, you know, it's, it's, it's ready to go. It's also been serviced, so you don't need to do anything with it other than start it up and start mowing your grass. So there you go. That's the gambit. That's the range. You know, everything from $100 to $150 for a push reel mower up to the sky's the limit. You know, you can, you can spend five figures on a reel mower if you buy a brand new one. Um, but if you're looking at the pre-owned market, which is what I would recommend for someone that's getting started, you can get a really nice mower, like a, like a very, very, very nice mower um, for anywhere between $650 to $2,000, depending on, you know, which kind you want to go with. Hope that helps, a TD, and uh, let me know what you end up going with, right? Okay. Be visit. I just ordered one on Amazon today. So cool. You just got one of them. Let me know how it works out for you. Uh, Beavis and Robert is down. He says, I it's down and I'm settling with a cup of coffee. See, I knew it. I mean, you were asking me, but you just wanted like an accountability partner. You just wanted someone else to say, Yeah, man, it's a good idea to go and do it now, which you knew I was going to tell you. So you went and did it anyway. I got you. I feel you. We're here. We're here. All right. Troy Ridley has a great question. He says, How long will Primo Max last in each application? So, per the label, you'll get three to four weeks of regulation out of an application of Primo Max when applied at the correct rates. And assuming you don't get like you know really crazy conditions, like you know tons of like tons and tons and tons of rainfall or tons of um, you know other other in other conditions that could help that could re slightly reduce how long it, it it regulates the lawn for. So, figure three to four weeks is what you're going to get. Now, a strategy that I'm I'm trying out this year, Troy, is instead of applying Primo Max at the rate that's recommended for that monthly application, which I've done in the past and I've gotten good results with, is you can reduce the rate, like back it down, and then apply it every two weeks. So if you are doing the spoon feeding program like what I do, which is I'm out on my lawn every couple of weeks anyway, then putting a little bit of Primo in there, a little bit of Primo in the tank along with my, fert, um, my fertilizer um, makes sense. 
And so far, the first application seems to be working pretty well, right? Like it, I, the long winch regulation really nicely. Um, there wasn't a ton of, there wasn't hardly any discoloration. And tomorrow I'm supposed to apply again. And we'll see when I do the second app, if I get any discoloration or anything along those lines. So I'm testing it. I have no reason to think that it's not gonna work, but it, so the, the, the question of how long it lasts, um, per the label, four weeks, right? Per the label, it's gonna be four weeks but you can make it to where it lasts relatively indefinitely throughout the growing season, depending on how you apply it. So hope that helps. Um, prior to trying out this new program that I'm on now, I was applying it only once per month at the beginning of the month, and I got great results doing that. So if you just wanna keep it simple, apply it once per month at the rates that are spelled out in detail on the product label, and you're gonna get good results. Next is Tanique and says, um, hey, Ron, I have finally caught the live stream. Hey, welcome, you're here. I have perennial ryegrass and I often have birds dripping up the lawn. I have used an insect grub applicator in the past and still no change, any ideas? So the, the, the birds might not be going after grubs. They might be also going after earthworms and I have the same thing. I just deal with it. You know, it's just, it's just something you're just gonna have to deal with. If you're putting down a good insecticide like a celeprin, that will keep the grubs out of your lawn so they won't be going after those. But it, they, especially after rain or after you run irrigation, like birds are pretty smart. They'll sit there and they will, after I run irrigation on the lawn, it never fails. They will, they'll like swoop down and start looking for earthworms, you know, cause the water gets in the lawn, the earthworms come up and they go after them. So it might not be, uh, they might not be eating something that the insecticide or grub control is going to take care of, in which case you just have to just live with it. So, and that's what I do. I mean, I, I get the little, the, you know, they get their little beaks in there and dig out little small holes in the lawn. And when, when I mow it, it gets mashed down and I just, you know, life goes on. Bir birds got to eat too, right? So I don't, I don't sweat it too much. All right. Uh, Troy Ridley says those backpack sprayers are three to $400. Yeah. They're closer to the $300 range, Troy. They're great sprayers. You can use, um, you can go with a less expensive sprayer. Like there are sprayers in the hundred to their hundred fifty dollars to two hundred dollar range that are also excellent too. There are there sprayers at Home Depot that you can go buy that also work well too. The the float the Typhoon Two or the Yard Mastery sprayer are likely to be the last sprayers you'll buy. They're very very high quality, well built sprayers that you're just not going to wear out, and they're just they're, they're built to a very very high standard. They're just really really just great equipment. Um, now, can you get a good result using a less expensive sprayer? Yes, because when it comes to backpack sprayers, in many ways, it's the Indian and not the Arrow, meaning that you know I can take a you know Ryobi sprayer or some spray, any sprayer you can go, I can take out the shop at Home Depot and I can get equally good results with that sprayer that I can with a Yard Mastery sprayer. But what's gonna happen is many times the, the flow rates are gonna be lower, so it's gonna take me longer to get the job done. Um, if, if I use it as heavily as I do my yard mastery and flow zone sprayers, it might not hold up as well. Uh, the battery runtime might not be as good. So those are the things you really get into when, when you buy a more expensive unit, you are buying less hassle. You're buying the fact that it's, it's a, a better built system and it's just not going to, it's not going to break or just do dumb stuff. That's going to make it irritating to use. That's what you're paying for. you like the irritation factor with a Typhoon two and the yard mastery is very low. Whereas the irritation factor with less expensive sprayers, the, the newer ones were actually pretty good, but like you go back five years ago, a cheaper sprayer was kind of a headache to use. You know what I mean? So um, it's it is still, it really comes down to the Indian and not the Arrow when it comes to backpack sprayers as far as getting a good result. But I highly, highly recommend either the Yard Mastery or the Flow Zone if you are in the market for a sprayer at that price point. If it were me, I would buy the Yard Mastery though because it's one and done. You buy one thing and it has everything you need for your lawn. Okay, next is Brandon Rods. I think, um, actually, TD Sims says, says I'll um, check out the Sunjo reel mower. These $1,000 reel mowers make me feel, made me feel sick thinking about dropping that much on a reel mower. Yeah, but the thing with also that too, TD, and I get it, reel mowers and rotary mowers are different in the sense that like a rotary mower, I mean, a $1,000 rotary mower is probably gonna be just fine too, but a real mower, they tend to be better built, meaning that, you know, you buy a good real mower, like a good true cut. You know, my neighbor um, finally replaced his, I think last year, and it was something like 20, it's over 20 years old. So a, a good a good real mower that's well cared for will last a very, very long time. Whereas with rotary mowers, they'll also last a long time too, but they, they, they don't tend, unless you start getting into the higher price point, you know, the, the $600 plus mowers, like the, your um like your Hondas or some of the nicer Toro motors, they 
they tend to be more disposable than a real mower is. So realize that you're spending more, but you're also getting something that you're not really gonna replace as long as you take care of it. Next is Brandon Rodas. He says, what variety of grass do you recommend for filling in thin or bare areas due to shade in a Bermuda grass lawn? Great question, Brandon. There aren't really any uh, grass seeds that I, you said what variety of grass you recommend. Um, as far as Bermuda, there's none. So Bermuda is not growing in the area that's, that's, that is shaded. I would not try and go get a Bermuda grass seed or a different type of sod or anything like that. You're just wasting your time. Because what, what's gonna happen is you're gonna put the sod down or put the grass seed in and you might get it to germinate, but it's gonna slowly die off because there's a reason why Bermuda isn't growing in that area. Now, if you're getting some sunlight there, using something like zoysia, can work. Zoysia still needs a good five, five, six hours of direct sunlight to do well. So if you, you know, the area meets those requirements, you could consider putting zoysia in the area to get, you know, a nice green lawn in that, that spot where Bermuda will not do well. Um, or you could also just eliminate the shade if, if possible, assuming it's not from your house. If it's like for a tree or shrubs that you can cut back. Uh, and then the Bermuda should do better in those thin areas. So the, the, the big thing I would say is, uh, Eliminate the conditions, if you can, eliminate the environmental conditions that are causing the grass to be thin in those areas before you take the more drastic approach of changing grass types or you know trying to bring in different types of grass or trying to put on seed because all grass needs direct sunlight. All of them do. They need it at various levels, but um, they all need it. And you know, even though zoysia will do well with less sunlight, it does even better with more direct sunlight. So, you know, you give it, you give it more light, it's gonna do even better. You know, it just can tolerate less light than Bermuda can. Uh, so I hope that helps. I would not get out there and get seed or anything like that and try and fill in those bare areas. You're, you're kinda uh, just wasting your time by, uh, by doing that. All right, Alan says, where can I get some straight um, potash, preferably SOP? Like, Alan, I'm glad you asked. Because here recently on, the golf course lawn store. We added a straight potash product. So people were asking about it both in email um, and, um, and not in the live stream, but also in the in YouTube comments. So we added a product that is a straight potash product, just like what you're looking for. So you go to the golf course lawn store, go to lawn fertilizer, and then you will scroll down because this is kind of a specialty product and not everybody needs it. But what you've got is exactly what you're looking for. It's a 0048 and it is a sulfate of potash. So it's got the good potash, like the less, the the, the lower sodium um, potassium in this product. So there you go. If you want a, a straight SOP product, we've got you covered. Go to the Golf Horse Lawn Store, go to the lawn fertilizer section, scroll just a little bit, and you will find it there in a granular bag. So hope that helps. And let me know if you need anything else. We just recently added that, so you can be, uh, you know, you can be among the first people that get a chance to get your hands on some of it. Let me know how it works out for you. Uh, let's see, what is up is next? It says, Champ says, why is that not allowed in New York? I'm not sure what you're referring to, Champ, but it's just like a lot of products just aren't like, I mean, between New York and California, New York, California, and Washington, like a lot of those states, like, and also Vermont for some things, they're just not labeled for use in those states. Like they just, you know, whenever Syngenta or whoever the, the manufacturer was that makes a particular product was going through and getting the, the registrations, like, like New York said, nope, we're not, you're not, we're not gonna allow you to sell that product in our state. So you can't. So it's blame your state. Um, you know, it's not really, it's not the manufacturer's product I'm sure, um, problem. I'm sure they'd they want to sell their stuff anywhere that people want to buy it. It's more of a state thing than uh, the, a product thing. Like, will it work on grass in New York? Yes, but it's not, you know, it's not legal to sell it there and it's not labeled for use there because it's New York. Sorry, I can't, you know, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's, that's really, really what, what it comes down to. All right, next is Roger Lewis. He says, Ron, thanks for the soil test guidance. I'm on it. I'll let you know the results. Very, very cool, Roger. Um, I, I think you will, I mean, the, and when you get the results, if they are not what you expect, they are not bad. Remember, soil test results are just, they just are just that, they're soil test results. They're just, all they are, are knowledge to help you know what you should be applying to your soil to get the best results. So wherever you are is wherever you are, and we just go from there and improve things. All right, next up is Lewis1980. Two, he says, hey, Ron, love your channel. Appreciate that so much. Thanks so much for that. He says, I switched to a real mower this year for my Bermuda lawn. When is your recommended last time frame on leveling the yard? I'm in Georgia as well. Thanks. 
early August, late July, early August is when I was about as, as late as I would go on doing that. Uh, Lewis, you still got plenty of time this year. You got, you can do it now. I mean, we're in mid May, so you could easily get another, you could get two top dresses this year easily if you wanted to. Like you could top dress this weekend, you know, if you wanted to, and then you could do another one in, you could really do three really. You could do one now, you could do one in June, like mid to late June, and you could do another one in like late July, early August. So you're still early enough in the season that you could technically top dress your lawn three times if you were a serious glutton for punishment. Uh, so yeah, there's plenty of time to do it if you, uh, if you are so inclined to do so. Next is Chris Dada. He says, my grass is not greening up the way I want. I did a soil test. I added lime. I did soil amendments, ultra high on the potash. So went with a double dark 16.000. Unfortunately, the grass is not double dark. All right, so how long ago did you apply the 16.00? Because that should do it. That should be a pretty good um, hit of nitrogen to really get the, the lawn going, Chris. Uh, you know, it sounds like from a standpoint of nutrients going into the soil, like you're in good shape. Um, what about your environmental conditions? Is the grass particularly tall? Have you been mowing it already? Have you, you know, can you, is there anything you can do as far as cutting it a bit shorter to help get a bit more heat into the, uh, into the soil, into the lawn? All those things will help in addition to the stuff you're already doing. That's, that's, that's where my mind's really going with this. Cause you, everything else sounds good. You know, you got, you got your soil test results done. You did, you did a lime, I guess, based on the soil test results. Uh, the double dark 1600 is a good fur that's got plenty of nitrogen to get you going. And so now I want to say like, what are the conditions like? Is the grass super tall? Like, have you never scalped it, you know, from, um, when it was in dormancy? If not, I might consider doing that. Uh, and then if you're open to it, try taking the cut of the height to cut down just a little bit, since that's going to allow more heat and sunlight to get into uh, the soil. It's not super green anyway yet. So it's not like it's going to hurt anything to, uh, to do that at this point. Here's the thing though, on the next um, week or so here, where are you? you're not in Georgia, are you? You didn't say? Okay, well, if you're in Georgia, the next week or so here, we're gonna start getting a lot of heat. So we're supposed to start getting into the um, uh, high 80s some days, even low 90s. And that is going to really make Bermuda start to really fire and take off. So I don't know where you are in the country, but if you are in the Southeast, the heat's coming and that's gonna help your lawn, you know, be able to pick up um, if, if it's been lagging behind a little bit. So sorry you're dealing with that, but it will get better, I promise. All right, next up is EL. He says, hey, Ron, just subscribe to your channel. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate the support for that. Thanks, you, thanks for that, um, L. If I can help with anything else, let me know. I've got tons of content on various lawn topics. Um, I don't know where you are in your lawn journey, but if you want to see at a very high level how to get your lawn better, go to the Golf Course Lawn Store and then just go to shop and just click on shop. And I've got a little infographic here that tells you like, you know, the, the method that I would make, recommend for improving your lawn, which is one, step one, eliminate weeds. So, you know, once you figure out you have weeds in your lawn, get a set of herbicides that are correct for your grass type. We'll use those to clean up the, the, the weeds, do a soil test. We probably heard a lot of that mentioned tonight in the live stream. Fertilize your lawn based on those soil test results. And then the thing that you really is gonna set your lawn apart from everyone else and help you have the lawn that everyone in your neighborhood is gonna envy is mowing. So mow, mow, and mow some more. And then along with that, you can begin incorporating the biostimulants and some of the other products that uh, that are on the store. But these, this is really the blueprint. This is what you have to do to get great looking turf. And uh, again, I appreciate the support. I appreciate you subscribing to the channel. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know, let me know. All right, uh, next is, um, let's see here. Uh, John Grorill says, um, Malorganite or Site One carries um, uh, 50 pound bags of Malorganite for 50 for 20 bucks. Still kind of pricey for the amount of coverage, but better than the 2,500 square foot option. I did not know that. I did not realize that, that Site One carry Malorganite. I'll have to check my local Site One here in Buford and ask them, hey guys, you guys have Milo and see if they're selling for 20 bucks. I'll uh, I'll find out. I didn't. I did not realize that that was a thing. All right, next up is EL with his question. So he subscribed and he has a question. He says, what is your intake on corn gluten for lawns? So the, 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 the jury's not really out on that one, L. So some people talk about using corn, corn gluten as an organic um, pre-emergent of sorts. Uh, some say, you know, cause it has some nutrient in it that you can use it to feed your lawn. So I, I, that part of it, I do believe. As far as it being having pre-emergent properties, that I don't, you know, I, I've seen, you know, half the half of people say yes, it does. And so half people say, yeah, it just makes the weeds grow faster as well, too. 
So I, it can't hurt. It cannot hurt to apply it to your lawn. But I guess the question I would have for you is, um, what's the reason why you would lean towards corn gluten um, for your for your your nutrient program for your lawn? If you have access to it and you get a lot of it just for free, then sure, that makes a lot of sense. But I'd want to know why you're seeking that out particularly for feeding your soil versus uh, you know even some of the organic options or even some of the more uh, synthetic ferts that that are available that do a really good job. Um, so just I'm just just out of curiosity. But that's that's my take on corn gluten on corn gluten. I don't use it myself. Um, there are people that use it and they really like it. But for me, I don't see where it really fits into my program. It'd be just one more thing I'm doing without a real need for it, if that makes sense. So again, thank you for, for subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate the support. And if I can help with anything else, let me know. Next is Victor Stams. He says, hey, Ron, great to see you continuing the weekly knowledge sessions. I have a question about Scott's ProVista grasses. Do you have any thoughts on it? This is my second ProVista question. I think I've already answered that. I think I don't have any direct experience with Scott's Pro Vista. The only experience I have with it comes from Alan Hain, Lawn Care Nut, and he seems to really like it. You know, from what I understand, it's supposed to be like the, you know, the alpha and the omega of um, of St. Augustine grass, you know, less, you know, less water requirements, better disease resistance. You can spray glyphosate on it and it won't kill it. So uh, you just got a lot of benefits to it. I've never used it personally, so I can't, I'm not speaking from experience, but Alan's uh, take on it. it seems to be really good. He seems to really like it. And he, I believe he recommends that that particular grass for people that want St. Augustine, you know, want a St. Augustine lawn. So that's, that's my thoughts on it. I mean, it looks good. If I, if I were, put this way, if I were doing a St. Augustine lawn, ProVista would be one of the, one of the options that I would be looking into. So that's the best I can do without actually having used the grass myself. Great question. All right. Uh, Zizu says, Hey Ron. Hey Zizu. He says, I have these weeds that kind of look like nuts edge, but have wider leaves. I applied some Roundup and waiting to see what comes. Um, I put a photo of it here. Any advice is appreciated. So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to post a photo in here, Zizu. Uh, what you can do is you can email it to me, ron at golfhorselawn.com. Like send me an email there with the picture and I'll be able to tell you what I think it is and how to, um, how to treat it. If you already went after it with Roundup, I mean, that should do it, but I mean, I'd be really, really careful about that because especially if you're using, there are different Roundup products, but if you're using the non-selective Roundup, the one with glyphosate, then you want to be careful because even though that may kill the weeds, it's also going to damage the surrounding grass. If the weed you're talking about is a sedge of some sort, that's what you're, that you're saying, it looks like nut sedge, um, and you have warm season grass, I would not use Roundup. Instead, I would use a product called Certainty. As far as products for killing sedges, as far as like, for warm season turf anyway, this is for warm season only. So for Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, Centipede, Bahia, pretty much all the, all the your, um, your warm season grasses, this is what I would use because this will take care of all sedges and it's not going to damage your Bermuda. It's not going to damage your existing grass. Again, assuming that it's a warm season grass. I would not use a Roundup as a means of targeting weeds in your lawn because eventually you're going to end up damaging your uh, your grass. So I wouldn't I wouldn't use a non-selective herbicide on my lawn. That's only for driveways, mulch beds, you know, areas where you don't really care um where where, where you're not trying to grow anything that you care about in. You know what I mean? So uh, for sedges, certainty is by far the best option in my opinion for warm season grass. So if you've got that, I would consider looking into that. It's a it's a great great product. And again, if you want to send me a picture, Ron at golfcourselawn.com. Thanks for the question and the comment. All right, Cameron is here. He says, just moved into a new construction home. Soil is compacted and mostly clay around the house and sandy further out. Would aeration and added adding sand help the drainage? Standing water is instant when it rains. Yes, yes. So um, the... The aeration is going to help the clay soil to take up a bit more water. It's going to help with that. But what I would really recommend, Cameron, is if your budget will allow for it, is in addition to aerating, top dress your lawn. Like top, like one of the best benefits I got out of top dressing my lawn, in addition to making it smooth and look really awesome, is uh, the ability of the 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 soil to, to, to draw moisture away from the surface, to draw water away from the surface. Before I top dress, when I kind of like you, I would get a rainfall and you know I'd have rain sitting there for 
24 hours you know after the rain stops like a big puddle still on the lawn that just would take forever to drain away as soon as i the first time i top dressed it all that stopped so yes aerating is going to help it's going to help improve things but i would also consider doing a top dress if you're if you're open to that because that's going to help improve the issue with uh with, with standing water sitting on the surface of the lawn this does assume <laughs> this does assume that your lawn is not shaped like a bowl right like it just it just assumes that there is somewhere for the water to you know to go like the, the the way that the builder contoured the lawn is such that you know the water can drain off the property um but it just takes forever and a day to do that and a little bit of water that sits back tends to just settle on the top so i'm assuming that the lawn was contoured properly that it can drain but that water just sits and pools on the surface if that's the case aerating and top dressing will help you a lot if it's not the case where it's a bowl then we need to fix that we need to fix the contour of the lawn to where it drains properly and then still aerate and top dressing is going to get even better so hope that helps sorry you're dealing with it but it can get better if you do those things that i'm talking about literally aerating top dressing your lawn one of the best things you can do for um keeping for helping improve drainage and just just, just it, and plus it looks cool the lawn just looks really awesome after you're done doing it all right 79 Midrelino as a question he says sandy soil on bermuda from runoff can i top dress with a compost to amend the soil tests show a bit low on ph and nitrogen okay so you need a little bit of lime too then i scalped in the spring and applied carbon and slow release fertilizer carbonized pn sure so there's a lot going on there in that comment um 79 Madrilino. you can top dress with compost to help introduce more organic material yes if that's the question yes carbonized pn excellent choice excellent product um you know if you, especially if you have a smaller lawn where you can buy a bunch of this stuff and use it to top dress your lawn you're you're going to get a really nice color response from it and it's one of the best products you can use for the, what you're talking about as far as introducing organic material into your soil now for your soil test results showing that you're a little bit low on on ph and you're showing low on ph your soil ph is low and your nitrogen is low you're going to want to add lime to help bring the ph up and then nitrogen you're going to want to just add you know nitrogen to help feed the um to feed the, the the soil to help feed the grass now as far as ph goes as far as to kind of geek out a little bit in case you care is if um if you look at your soil test results, I'm not sure which ones you, you, you used, but if you use, if you looked at the ones from my soil, and I think I can bring those back up here. So in a case like, okay, I'll show you an example. Let's, let, we'll go for, for a ride here. So in the case of my soil test results from last year, I think this was, was yeah, the winter. Um, if you, if your pH is low, and this is a bad example because my pH isn't low, but if your pH is low, like yours, the thing you're going to want to look at is your ma the magnesium levels in your soil. So in the case like mine, like what you're looking at here, where the MG, where the magnesium levels are adequate, or they're a little bit on the low side, but they're okay. In this case, you could apply a calcitic lime. So for so for to raise pH, you're going to want to apply lime, and it comes in two major varieties. It comes in more than two, but I mean the two common ones are calcitic and dolomitic lime. If your pH, if your magnesium is low or you, or you want to raise it, then adding a dolomitic lime, because D is closer to M in the alphabet, that's how I remember it, um, makes sense. Now, if my magnesium levels were, say, they were up, uh, I'm showing you here, move my face out of the way. If my magnesium levels were more up here, like, you know, they're more in the middle of this or they're just a little bit higher, that's when I could get away with just using a calcitic lime. So if you need magnesium in addition to raising your soil pH, go with dolomitic. If you don't need magnesium, then go with calcitic. Either one's going to work, but if you're just really trying to optimize things, that's how you can choose between which lime is the better or better fit for your uh, for your particular soil. So hope that helps. If your soil test results have that in there, it you you know now you know which lime to choose, right? Which is great. Next is uh, let's see, it's John Riblo or Rob Robwell. He says, Cameron, I'm in a similar situation. Carbon Pro G helped a lot with my compaction. I still need to air it, but I've noticed a big difference. So yeah, so that's another thing too. Um, you know, adding um, adding a a a granular biostimulant like in the form of Carbon Pro G or Essential G can help as well. I still, I, here's the thing I always say though, I, I never recommend to, the, to anyone that, you know, use go buy Essential G if you're trying to reduce compaction. If you're trying to reduce compaction, I mean, will it help with that? Yes, but if you're really trying to reduce compaction and do it quickly, go aerate your lawn. Like that's the way to do it. Like, you know, you can do that and then add, you know, you can do, you can use some of the, um, 
what do they call like the liquid the liquid thatch removers the liquid um aeration products um, you can also add your biostimulants like, you know, Carbon Pro-G or Essential G. But the best way to remove for leaf compaction is to core aerate your lawn. To get, to get a, some, a guy like this, one of these guys, and do battle with your lawn for a couple of hours by removing cores, that's the best way to, remove, to, to um, re reduce compaction. That's what I did today, and I still put Essential G on down on top of it. So hope that helps. Let me know if you need anything else. Mitchell LeBlanc says, can you do a series on how to take care of cold weather lawn? I am, um, I have a 80% and 80-20 KBG and perennial ryegrass. Something I'm considering for this fall, uh, Mitchell, so I'm, against my better judgment, I'm considering that I have the possibility of overseeding my lawn in the fall with a um, with ryegrass. And in that case, it gives me, it's going to give me the option to make that kind of content. I don't have ryegrass in my lawn. I don't have a cool season lawn like most of the year. So I would have to overseed and introduce ryegrass to be able to make that kind of content. If I do that, I will be making that type of content. I'll make some cold weather content um, for you guys to make sure you're covered. But I haven't decided if I'm going to do it as yet because I'm kind of afraid with what's going to happen next spring when I have to get rid of the ryegrass. That's my, that's my, um, my concern. Oh, okay. And Calvin is, is clarifying it for me. He says, yeah, the sweet gumballs come from a sweet gum tree. They're a round ball with a sharp spikes. Horrible for stepping on barefooted. Thank you for that, uh, Calvin. I didn't, when he said that there's sweet gums, I'm like, I wasn't sure what he was talking about, but now I know. So thanks for that. Appreciate it. And uh, let's see what other questions we have. I think we are pretty good. We're wrapped. We're getting close. Next is Mike uh, Harvey. He says, which liquid fur do you recommend to use with the carbon kit? I bought the one with release zero, not 901C. Great question, Mike. Let us go for a ride to the golf course lawn store. So you bought the carbon kit that contains um, release zero, not 901C. That's fine. So uh, what that means is you can use literally any liquid for it that you want. The one that I would recommend, there's, there's two options. If you are doing a spoon feeding program, meaning you want to be out there monthly or every couple of weeks, you know, um, applying fur to your lawn to help, you know, get that even color, not push too much growth, then a great option is Turfplex. And I'm in the wrong section because I'm in the Miramichi Green and Turfplex is under lawn fertilizer. So yeah, so go to lawn fertilizer and then Turfplex is, this is what I would go to. This is what I ran last year and I loved it. Great fertilizer, contains some iron, bit of zinc and manganese in there as well. So excellent, excellent fertilizer. If um, you just want one product to use, along with your um with your carbon kit this is th that's literally what i did last year i did this and i used neutrozolve at a lighter rate so i used like neutrozolve at like three ounces per thousand when i was using the turfplex because turfplex already has some of what's in neutrozolve in it so that's option one for a relatively uh quick release fertilizer fast release fertilizer that you can apply every couple of weeks at a low rate to get good color even growth if you say ron too much work don't want to do that I want to apply fertilizer once a month. That's where you can get down into the Greens Plus. This is a 14-4-10. This has slow-release nitrogen in it. So this is a better option for someone that wants to apply liquid ferts one time per month and, you know, still get a pretty good result. So that's, you have two options. You can do either the, um, the Turfplex, which is kind of where I'm trying to steer you to, or you can do the Greens Plus, which is also a good option too. Um, and, and you're going to be good to go. So between the carbon kit and one of the, either one of those ferts, you're going to be in great shape. Again, Turfplex is what I ran last year. If you looked at my lawn from the videos last year and you liked how it looked, that's from the carbon kit and Turfplex. So hope that helps. Mark Miller is here. He says, Hey Ron, seeded a 500 square foot area with far Arden 15 and have watered three times a day. Seed germinated a few days ago. What should my watering schedule look like now that it's recently germinated? I would back it down a bit. You know, the, the amount of water you're putting on the lawn to get it to germinate isn't what you're going to need to use to continue to get the lawn, to keep the seed growing. I mean, I wouldn't allow it to dry out. You know, I don't, you said it just germinated. So, you know, let's say for the next, for the next month, you know, for the next month, for the next three, next two, eh. Months is not so long time. For the next three weeks or so, you know, next two to three weeks or so, I would say let's do a light watering. Let's do a light watering a couple of times a week to make sure that the ground never dries out and the the new grass has plenty 
of um, of moisture. So I don't, I don't want to go from like watering three times a day to watering once a week or not watering at all um, because that, you know, you don't want to stress out the new grass. So if you can reduce that a little bit and, and just do a light watering a few times a week, that's going to that's gonna help wean the Arden 15 or uh, off of like, you know, being punch drunk and getting water every single day and, you know, help it, help it, you know, start driving roots and, and just, and just kind of finding its way in your lawn, finding its way in the world. So that, that is what I would do. I would reduce it, but not so much that you introduce stress into the lawn. Great question. And congrats on the Arden 15. It's a great grass seed. Um, you know, given that you have 500 square feet, it's, it's cool that you were able to get it and get it, um, get it, you know, down on your lawn. So you got to send me pictures at some point once you, uh, once you find it. All right. Uh, or once you, once you, not once you find it, once you get it, once you get established and you're happy with how it looks. Um, Mark Miller says, yep, I figured I'd take a chance on seed instead of sod. Five pound, five pound bag was only $120. Yeah, sounds about right for RN15. The only fact, X factor was the water bill. And that's it, guys. For anyone that wants to do Bermuda grass seed or zoysia grass seed from, or grow zoysia or Bermuda from seed, you are literally doing it the hard way. And the water bill will be more expensive in most cases than the cost of the seed. So keep that in mind. Sod is way, way uh, cheaper from that perspective. All right, next is Mike Mathis. He says, I recently purchased a Toro Greensmaster 1600. And I want to touch up the face of the bed knife. What's the angle of the face of Toro bed knives? Thanks. I don't know that one, uh, Mike. I can't, can't help you out. You might be able to find that in the documentation. If you get on Google and you search for um, you know, Toro Greensmaster 1600, there's probably some guidance around the reel, around taking care of it, and and um and you know what angle, what kind of like what kind of angles you should use for for grinding them. There's there's tons of videos on on grinding reels and on different angles and and um and 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 that. It's a, it's, a, it's actually a pretty it's a pretty fun fun topic. But as far as which angle I should you should use, I don't I don't know that. I've never adjusted the angle of the the bed knife or any of the reels that on my, on my mower I've never done I've never done that so I, I take it down to you know to Jerry Pate whenever they're gonna just sharpen it up or it needs freshening up and they sharpen it but to my knowledge they don't adjust any of the angles like that is that's put into the reel and it's put into the bed knife when it comes from the factory like the angle that you really should be running them at and there's there shouldn't be a need to really modify that you know too heavily uh, so there is a um, as far as a bed bar, like the bed bar, there are two bed bars. There's a, there's a black one and a red one, and that can adjust the angle that the bed knife sits at. That's the only adjustments that I'm aware of as far as adjusting, you know, how aggressively the uh, the mower cuts. It's more a, a, a different bed bar that you roll that you run with versus than the um, than like altering it with the reel. I would I would not do that. I would not do that. So, or I've, I've never heard of doing that. So, just just for what it's worth, um, you know, whatever the angle is now, I would leave it there and just just sharpen it as it as it currently sits. But congrats to the mower. We got to give you a clap for that. Congrats to the new sixteen hundred. It's a nice mower. I like mine. I really like mine. All right, Derek Wright says Arden fifteen is seeding is going. Uh, I have holes in the yard, but I'm seeing sprouts for my early fifth, fifth seed, uh, my early, my April 5th seeding. When should I be able to use spectricide in the lawn? So I would hold off, Derek. I mean, it's, I don't, without seeing how, how mature the grass is, it's difficult to tell you when you can start introducing herbicides, but really you want the grass to be established, growing well before you introduce any kind of stress to it. Now, Spectrocyte is a relatively safe herbicide. It's it's not not particularly strong as far as the concentrations of the the herbicides that are in it. But at the same time, I would not want to apply it to brand new grass. That is, you know, if you tell me your 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 Arden 15 is you know a quarter of an inch or like under half an inch, I wouldn't want to then go hit it with spectrocyte right then. You know, I want it to be you know get it be get let it be established, catch itself. Uh, before you you start trying to eliminate weeds using herbicide, so I know I'm not more helpful with that but without actually seeing a picture of it or knowing how the height of cut you are um, you're currently at. It's I'm just kind of err on the side of the caution and say just to wait, just to wait. Next up, uh, your question is: In how strong of a fertilizer should I use to push this to fill in after weed material, uh, weed, weed removal? So I wouldn't really, I, as far as the, the strength of fertilizer. I wouldn't go heavy on nitrogen. Really, the amount the, the amount of nitrogen you should be applying in your lawn, 
um, really of what your soil needs, is a soil test, a soil test is going to tell you that. But if you don't want a soil test and you just want to have some general guidance, Bermuda, when it's actively growing, needs about a pound of nitrogen per month. They're about eight tenths to about a pound of nitrogen per month while it's actively growing. So I really wouldn't exceed that. So if the grass is starting to germinate, it's starting to fill in, I really wouldn't go much higher than a pound of nitrogen. That's more than enough to get it to fill in because that's really more, the grass filling in quickly is not so much a function of how much nitrogen you throw at it. It's more a function of how much like heat it's getting, how much sunlight it's getting, how often you're mowing it, because that's going to help promote lateral growth. That's going to cause it to fill in bare areas or thin areas a bit faster um, than like throwing, you know, two pounds of nitrogen at. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't do that. You're going to cause more problems than you create, than you solve by going crazy heavy on the nitrogen. You know, eight tenths to a pound is all you need per month for Bermuda to do well. All right, next up is Mike Matthews says, what height of cut should I scalp with a 1600 after to have the, the finished height of cut to be half inches, uh, half an inch? Kind of your call, Matt. I mean, uh, Mike, you can you really want to cut or scalp lower than the target height of cut that you're after, right? So if, you're, if you want to maintain the lawn at half an inch, scalping at 0 0.4, 0 0.35, that's going to work really well. So uh, the answer is almost down to the dirt. Uh, is is where you're going to want to go, but just below where your target height of cut needs to be. So half an inch is your target, 0.35 is what I would aim for. Hope that helps. Also realize that after you scalp it, while I look for the next comment, you are going to have to likely get the real fresh and bed knife freshened up afterwards because scalping is pretty hard on those on those parts. But uh, But then, yeah, you should be good to maintain your line at half an inch. All right, Rob Miller in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas says, with thick clay soil, I'm doing my first lawn leveling project with local turf blend, eight cubic yards drop tomorrow. Bermuda's recovering from the rough POA infestation, but not 100%. Should I wait or not? Um, it's, it should be fine. So if you, if, you are, if you are top dressing the lawn the way that I recommend, Rob, which is to go light, so no more, I mean, a half inch at the most, but really a quarter to half an inch of material, uh, the Bermuda should tolerate that just fine. There shouldn't be an issue with with that, uh, you know, on your lawn. Even though it's, it's still, you know, catching itself, it's trying to recover from the Poe infestation, should be just fine. Um, what I would not do is bury the entire lawn in sand, and because that that's just one, it's just not necessary, and you're that's going to that particularly could injure the turf. It's not going to kill it, but as far as it's just taking a lot longer to recover and grow in and look nice like how you want, you're you're working against yourself if you go too heavy on the top dressing. All right, let's see here. Uh, Ryan Pound says, have you used Spectacle Flow? I have, Ryan. I actually got a fresh bottle, got a new bottle for this fall right here. Right here, so I got a new bottle right here. But yes, I've used this. It's a great product, excellent, excellent product. The only problem with it, I would say it's a problem, but I mean, I, you know, the, the, the only issue that most people have with it is that it's expensive, right? Which Really, if you think about it, is it kind of isn't really an issue? Like, if the only thing that I always say, if the only thing you complain about is of what something costs, then I mean, yes, that's a consideration, but that means it's, it's likely a good product because if the only thing you can say is it's expensive, but it does what it's supposed to do, then that's good. And Spectacle Flow, there's not really anything else like it as far as pre-emergence that can control POA um, that lasts for, I mean, I think the label says up to 10 months, but really easily six months of coverage of, of control. It's really hard to beat spectacle flow. Excellent, excellent, excellent pre-emergent. It's just more expensive than most people want to spend for, you know, a, um, you know, for, for pre-emergent for a residential lawn. So if you can afford it, uh, it's a great option, but it's just going to be, you know, bring your wallet, <laughs> bring your wallet's all I can tell you. All right, uh, next up is Devin. He says, I absolutely need to get back on. Been really busy with work, getting used to waking up at 3.45 a.m. Ouchie. No worries about setting this stuff. Yeah, man, I haven't forgotten. And uh, yeah, we got to get you back on once you have a bit of free time, which right now doesn't sound like you have it. But when you do get some, you got to come back on. Got to do it. And then um, Eric says, Ron, runny eggs are a culture things. I'm grossed out also. Vegan now, used to love only extremely well done scrambled eggs with uh, with barbecue sandwich. Yeah, I'll, I'm definitely a, a scrambled eggs kind of guy, man. I just can't do it. I can't I can't do the runny thing. Like I like one of the like a fun story while I look for the next comment is when I used to travel a lot for work. I remember the first time I actually saw someone because back home no one eats runny eggs. No, I've never seen anyone do it anyway. I remember the first time we were out. We were like, or I think it was at an IHOP, 
And one of the guys I was working with, he got done doing like this maintenance work late at night. And so we were having an early morning, morning breakfast and he ordered like a farmer's breakfast. He had his eggs with it and he orders his, um, his, uh, his eggs. I forget how he ordered them, but they were, but they were running. And he, I remember him popping like the yolk and then like rubbing the toast in the yolk and eating it. And I have never been more disgusted in my entire life. I was like, oh my God, that's so, so, so literally my skin crawled. Um, but I realize that I'm in the minority because a lot of people just love to eat their eggs that way. So there you go. All right. Next is Randy Verlotti says, um, how does hydrotain work? I'm in Texas without rain for seven months and 90 to, uh, 90 to 100 degree heat. Having to water my celebration Bermuda every day. Ugh. Okay. So the way it was explained to me by hydrotain, I spoke to, I think his name is Rick, who's one of the, um, I think he's the owner, and then also Jim um, at Ecologel, is that hydrotain work, the way it works is that they, the way they describe it to me, um, without going into the chemistry and the secret sauce behind it, is that it behaves like a moisture magnet. So you apply the product, you water it into the soil, and it draws water both from below the root zone and above the root zone to help make water available to the grass. So it's one of these things where when the grass draw, when the roots draw water away from it, it's, it, lo it keeps looking for more water and, and keeps drawing it to, it, it draws the small water droplets to the hydrotain, to the prills or to the product. And then the grass is able to make use of the water that the roots can't easily get to. So either surface water or water closer to the surface or waters are just below the, below the roots. So the, the, the way that they describe it to me, they said the, the best way to, to to describe it is like a water magnet. Think of it as, like, as something you put in the soil that literally attracts water. And the reason why you need to water it in is because it needs to be in the root zone so that when it's attracting water, it's in the right, it's in the correct location for the grass to be able to benefit from it. So if you apply hydrotain and don't water it in, it's gonna be sitting on the surface and your grass is really not gonna see the benefits. So that's why you need to apply it and water it in right after application to really see the benefits. And in your situation, Randy, where you're, you know, you've got a lot of heat, not much water. Hydrotain is, is a great, I mean, it's made literally for you. Like, I mean, I see benefits from, from hydrotain, but someone like you would really see the benefits from it, you know? So you'd have to, you might be able to reduce, you know, cut your watering in half where instead of watering every day, or you said you're watering every single day, maybe you water every other day, which would be a big bonus, right? You'd be able to cut your watering in, uh, in, in half potentially by doing that. So it's worth, it's worth trying out. I really liked the results I got with it last year. I've already applied it to my lawn this year and I'm gonna to continue to use it this season. So hopefully that helps. If you need anything else, let me know. Michael is in the house. He says, we sold our, our house and we'll be moving in late July. I have plenty of Humic Max, but I don't wanna put the good stuff down uh, on what will be soon be someone else's lawn. Oh, wow, look, look at you. Look at you. You're like, I am, we're, we're leaving some of the, you know, the good vintage, the good wine. We're gonna put that, we're gonna put that away. What was another good option? Um, if you don't want to use Humic Max, Flagship's a good option. So we have that at the golf course lawn store too, Michael, and it's you know it's it's a good fertilizer. Go to uh, shop and then lawn fertilizer and then scroll down and then you can go with either a starter fert if you want or like the Flagship, which is a twenty four zero six. That's a good option as well too. You know, applying that at your three pound per thousand uh, rate is going to be plenty. It's going to be plenty of nitrogen for your lawn, and this is this is going to be a good fertilizer that you can apply. That's not going to have to you. It's not going to require that you break out the uh, your your top shelf stuff, right? So that's what I would do if you're gonna you want something else that's an option instead of Humic Max. Uh, go get Flagship again. We have it in stock at the Golf Course Lawn Store, and that should uh, should take care of it for you. Randy Villard, uh, Randy um, Villarde says, I'm currently real mowing three times a week at half an inch. Applying PGR, applying PGR will reduce mowing how much? So here's the thing, um, Randy. I did um, plant growth regulator. I ran Primo Max on my lawn when I was mowing last year at half an inch. And you're gonna be able to mow, you're gonna be able to do the three times per week mowing um, for a while, right? For another two to three weeks. But once the temperatures get hotter at half an inch, you're, it's gonna get to the point that you're gonna be mowing really at a minimum every other day. Some, you know, when you get into June, July, every day, because at, at, at a half an inch, the grass really only gets to grow 0 0.16, 0 0.16, 0 0.17 of an inch um, before you start violating the one third rule. So your choices are either mow the grass a little bit taller, like let it get a bit taller, um, which is really what I'd recommend, or um, pick up your mowing frequency. 
Uh, PGR is going to help with that. It's going to allow you to continue with your, th your three times per week mowing for a bit longer, but eventually you are gonna have to pick that up if you decide you're gonna stick with half an inch. So it's um, it's it's gonna help you. It's it, Right now it would reduce your mowing frequency a bit because it's not that hot right now. But going forward, if you were to start introducing um, Primo to your lawn, is all it's gonna do is gonna allow you to get away with three week, times per week for a little bit longer than you would um, had you not started using Primo. But again, at some point, you're gonna be out there mowing every other day and then like late June, early July, uh, you're gonna be out there every day if you decide you're gonna maintain the lawn at half an inch. So that's even with plant growth regulator. So if by going up to three quarters of an inch, you don't have to deal with that, right? You, you can still stay on that every other day mowing or three times a week mowing if you're using PGR and still have a great looking lawn. But half an, once you start getting at half an inch and lower, it's uh, it the mowing like it's it's exponential the amount more, the amount of mowing you have to start doing to keep the lawn looking nice between mowings. So, hope that helps. Let me know if you need anything else. And then next is Ignacio Pais. It says you mentioned not applying Primo in shaded areas. However, I keep reading on forums that PGR helps turf in shaded areas. I'm trying to think where I said not to. I don't recall saying not to apply Primo in shaded areas. Where, where I would say not to apply. Um, Primo is if you're if you just top dress your lawn and you want it to recover faster, then I would not apply plant growth regulator. Not just Primo, but any any PGR. I wouldn't do that. Um, but as far as shaded areas, I mean it's um, I mean if you if your grass is growing in the shaded area, I mean there's enough sunlight there for the grass to grow, then yeah, you can absolutely apply Primo. There's nothing nothing wrong with doing that. I don't I don't recall ever saying that you can't use. Um, you can't apply Primo in shaded areas. Um, let's see, the rest of your comment is uh, that PGR helps turf in shaded areas. I don't really know. I mean, it's not gonna hurt it. Again, assuming there's enough sun, the big thing with shaded areas is sunlight. So if you're getting enough sunlight, then yes, PGR will work there. It's like it will work in areas that get more sun. I, I, I'm not sure what you, what form you're reading or what um, like what they're after if they're saying that, but applying plant growth regulator to grass growing in shaded areas will perform better than grass that is growing in shaded areas that does not have plant growth regulator. It depends on what you determine, what you call better, right? So if by better you mean it's going to grow less, then yes, that is a, that is a thing. If you're saying that by applying PGR to a grass that's in shaded, in other words, if a grass won't grow well in a shaded area, applying PGR is not gonna make it grow better in shade. If that's if that's what you're saying, so it depends on. I, I don't know what form you're referring to. I don't know all the context, but like it's not going to make grass that that won't grow in shade grow in shade. If that's what you're saying, but it will help grass that's growing in shade grow slower in shade. If that's what you're after, because that's what it does, right? It, it regulates growth. So hope that helps, um, Ignacio. Um, again, it's kind of hard to answer it without having all the context. But you have another follow up here where you say I applied a mixture of of uh, Primo in the front yard at three quarter rate on Monday, mix some liquid furt and biospectrum um, in tank and experience no tip burn, but got great th growth reduction, dark green, like it. That's what I like to hear, man. That's what I like to hear, it's good stuff. Yeah, mixing in a little bit of iron and and, and, uh, and nitrogen with it really does a lot for preventing that tip burn. So that's that's good. I'm glad that you're getting a good result from that. And again, I, I don't recall ever saying um, not to apply Primo in the shade or that it will you know, it'll cause a negative result. I don't recall ever saying that. So if, if I did, I uh, I apologize because I don't I don't I don't know why I would have said that. All right, next is James, or no, actually next is Del Norte, where he says, Hey Ron, I have a small 1,000 square foot lawn. I know it's small, but I want to show off some stripes. Is it possible without spending thousands on a real mower? Thanks a lot for the content. Sure, sure it is. It depends on one, your grass type, and um, how tall you're mowing it. So you can you can um if you have a rotary mower, you can either buy a striping kit or buy or make a striping kit that will help lay the grass down that will help you get some lawn stripes. If you have a um, like a push reel mower, some of those will have like a little roller on the back where you can make a little striping kit for those that will help as well too. But the big thing is you have to, to if you want stripes, regardless of whether you're using a rotary or a reel mower, it comes down to two things. It comes down to the height of the grass and it comes down to the ability to lay the grass down. So if you have a roller, like most real, like some of the nicer real mowers have, like a drum roller, that's gonna help with stripes. With a rotary, you need something on the back. Um, like some rotary mowers also have like a skirt 
that kind of is on the back of them that kind of helps lay the grass down as you run over the and make a pass. And that's going to produce some stripes, but really a roller of some sort is what you want for really, you know, the kind of stripes I think you're referring to. Um, so hopefully that helps. You know, you are going to be limited a bit without having a, mo a remower that has a rear drum because that's when you get the really, the really super hardcore stripes. But you can, again, you can do a DIY setup that will produce decent looking ones that will still make your lawn look really nice. So it just depends on... Uh, on what you're after and how much you're you're willing to spend. All right, uh, James says, have you seen the battery powered Scottsdale mower? I have not, uh, James, I've not. I'll have to look into it after the live stream because I didn't know that was a thing. Next is Ignacio, he's back. He says, any input on PGR on turf maintained at a height of cut of 1.5 to 1.75 inches rotary mode? Sure, you can still apply it. You can, yeah, if you wanna, if you want to mow your lawn less, you can apply plant growth regular to it. So if you're mowing a grass that's growing at you know 0.75 or, or 1.75, you know once a week, twice a week, you'd be able to mow it once a week if you put PGR on it. So yeah, you can still do it. Most people that use plant growth regulator are going for shorter cut turf though, but you can still apply it to grass that's being grown taller if you want. It's st still gonna work. It's still gonna have a good effect. You're still gonna get like regulation, but most of the people that use a uh, plant growth regulator are people that are, you know, either real mowing their lawns or cutting it shorter and they want that, um, you know, they want the grass to, so, to grow slower. All right, great question. And I'm trying to find the next one as we begin to wind down here. Um, CS Mike is here with a question. He says, should I do anything to correct my potassium deficiency? It's 25 with an optimal range of 38 to 72. In my MySoil test, about three quarters or two thirds of the way to optimal range on the chart. Yeah, so it depends on what you want to do, um, Mike. You can apply a fertilizer that contains a higher degree, a higher amount of potassium. So like the stress blend. So let's, let's, let's I'll show you some options here. So you go to the golf course lawn store, go to or just scroll down and go here to lawn fertilizers. You can click here or click on the link. Either one of those will take you there. And then for a higher potassium for the stress blend, the 7020 is a good option. If all you want is a straight potash for a straight potassium for you also have the 0048, which is just a straight um, potassium fertilizer. So you have a choice. You can do the stress blend or you can do the 0048. Either of those have a higher amount of potassium that will help bring those levels up. So really your call on which one you want to go with. If you need to also feed your lawn with nitrogen, which you probably do this time of year, the stress blend is a great option. Like that's probably when I would lean towards, but if you've got adequate nitrogen levels or you're getting your nitrogen from some other source, that's when the, uh, the 0048, you know, is a, is a better decision. So hope that helps. And then um, he says, what kind of results could I get from, um, we're gonna expect on turf type tall fescue. The same thing, uh, Mike, you know, you know, three to four weeks of regulation um, of, of of slowed growth if it's applied properly. That's about it's about the same thing you could see on Bermuda. So it's gonna it's gonna slow down how quickly your grass grows for about three to four weeks, depending on um, how you apply it and the rate that you use. All right, um, Alan says, uh, "Man, that's awesome. You're the man. I appreciate it. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but um, I which what I what I did, but thank you for that. I appreciate it." Uh, and then next up, Midnight Sun says, how do I message Ron? Just like how you're doing it right now, Midnight Sun, just put your thing, your question or comment in the chat and I will find it as I work through these. All right, uh, Ricky Blackmon says, can you apply a little insight on applying hydrotain on Bermuda in Alabama? So it depends on which one you're using, Ricky. If you're going with the granular, just apply it. There's nothing really special you have to do. Um, if you're planning to aerate your lawn, applying it right after aerating is a good idea. But if not, you just need to apply the granular and then water it in within three days after applying it to your lawn. That's the first. So granular is super easy. If you're going with a liquid, which gives you more coverage and it's better value for money from a standpoint of how much you, how much you can cover with the with the liquid, um, in that case, then um, you're going to want to apply it when the lawn is already wet. You're going to want to uh, you're going to have the lawn already be wet. Apply the product and then water it in immediately after application. So what that would look like if you're trying to make your life a bit easier is on a morning when there's already a, a dew on the lawn, you'd want to go apply the hydrotain when there's already dew on the lawn and then water it in immediately after application, and then you're going to be good to go. So if you don't want to do that, use the granular. If you know getting up a little bit early and applying the product when there's dew on the lawn is not not an issue then um, go with the liquid liquid option. So hope that helps. Outside of that, there's nothing else you really need to know. Just apply it and it's gonna reduce how much water 
you need to put on uh, on your lawn, which is great stuff. All right, Peter Maliki says, no question, just want to appreciate the solid content, learned a lot from the channel. Thank you so much, Peter, I appreciate that. Thank you for letting me know. And then V DeMillo is here, he says, hi Ron, can I really expect a lawn like yours if I get the online course? No. If you only get the lawn online course and you um, only and you only just get the course and you just go through the course and you join the Facebook group, um, you will not get a lawn that looks like mine. Just just by doing those things, it, to get a lawn that looks like um, when to get a lawn that looks like mine, uh, you have to do the stuff that's in the course because literally what I have in the course is what I do on my lawn, and you have to. It, for the thing that most people fall apart on is the mowing part of it. Right, most people are fine to do the fertilization, to do you know the biostimulants, to do the soil testing. But then when it comes to getting out there and actually mowing the lawn regularly, because that's what it takes to 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 take the green grass that you're creating and make it look like a golf course, that is the thing that that um that most people tend to fall back on. So if you do that, then yes, then yes, absolutely, um you can you can build a, a lawn that looks like that looks like this. Keep in mind this lawn. Is was not built overnight. This is like, I mean, this is not. This doesn't look great now. It looks horrible now because I just, uh, I just, you know, core aerated it. But um, if you want a lawn that looks like this, like let's go back to the homepage because this is actually my lawn because you can see the rocks there in the background. If you want a lawn that looks like this, this lawn was created over the course of seven years. You know what I mean? So it's it's um, you know, the, the you can get about 85% of this within a year with with reg with very dedicated effort. Like Alex's lawn was a normal lawn. I'd consider it to be a normal lawn. And he went from zero to hero in the course of about three months. Over the course of one summer, his lawn looked in it just a complete complete turnaround. And now this year, we're a couple of years into it. It looks it keeps getting better and better every year. He he does a, a few small things, light top dressing here and there to fix areas that he doesn't like. And just now is now he's just in the phase of just refinement. So the, the, the course shows you the process, and if you do the work, you're gonna get the result. You know what I mean? But the, the course by itself is not gonna produce a lawn like this. It's, it's getting out there and doing the work, mowing, doing a lot of the regular, um, a lot of things that, that I recommend that's gonna help produce, um, produce that, that result. Uh, the next part of your question, which is, what is the discount for enrollees? So currently there's a discount for Miramichi Green products. Um, only Miramichi Green. And again, that discount is subject to change the end of this year. I've, I've decided I'm going to leave it as it is until December, till the end of the year. But um, at the end of the year, that discount will will likely be, go down slightly. So right now, I think it's like a 10% discount for Miramichi on Miramichi Green products, which is actually pretty good. Um, I'm not making a whole lot of money by doing that. But I want it, I do that for the Golf Course Lawn Academy members as a way to help support you guys, right? Because if you're if you're doing the things that I recommend, which is you know, you're using the carbon kit, you're also applying um, Essential G monthly, right? I want to help you guys out to where you're able to get a great result on your lawn. I want you to be able to buy the products and use them and actually do the stuff in the course. So as a way to help me help invest in you and, and getting your lawn better, that's why I'm able to give a, a very small discount on just, just that particular that particular branch of products. And again, it's going to change the end of the year, but throughout the, throughout the rest of this year, it's a way for the course to almost pay for itself, right? Because if you are... Um, regularly buying the products, you, you know, you can you can recoup a lot of the cost of the course in addition to all the other benefits. Like one of the coolest parts of the course in, in addition to the instruction is the uh, the Facebook group. Like it's a really good, good group and a very cool set of people in there. Like we've not had any jerks come in there really. Um, and if, if we had someone that was really a jerk and really a pain, I would just refund you and, you know, tell you to go somewhere else. Because I, I really, I want to keep the community really nice. Um, so that's also a really cool part of, um, of the Golf Force Land Academy as well. So hopefully that helps answer a lot of the questions you have. And, um, and I'm just, I'm being real, you know, I'm not, I am not a miracle worker. I have not yet figured out a way to put mowing in a bottle. If I could, I'd be really, really rich. So as long as you do the work, you can create, you can create a lawn that is better than the lawn you currently have much better. So hope that helps. Okay. Next is C Chick. Uh, see chicken chen that says hey ron i use thanks for the insight i did go heavy on my pre-emergent i use a pressure washer tip instead of a t-jet i've been real mowing all season i'm seeing root clubbing how long does that last until the pre-emergent wears off so if you did prodiamine um let's say in february so february march April, May, it's going to be a lot of this growing season it's going to last until july-ish 
in July, she should start seeing the lawn um, do a bit better. So yeah, so it's, it's only the, for the length of the, the effectiveness rate of effectiveness period of the pre-emergence for Prodiamine, mm, four, four months or so. So it'll, it'll get better. Next, and next time you do it, next time you apply it, use this tip instead. Use the flood jet tip. This is the tip you want to use for applying pre-emergent. Um, you, you can use, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've applied it using the, what you're talking about, the pressure washer tip, like the, the green tip that comes with the flow zone, but you got to have some, you got to have some giddy up in your step to make sure that you're not over applying it. You got to, you know, the, the way to do it and apply it at a, at a, um, at a more relaxed pace is to use one of the, to use the flood jet nozzle from TJet. All right, Eli Vasquez is here. He says, hey Ron, so last week I put Queen Clark on what I thought was crabgrass, but it looks like I have Dallas grass. What do you recommend to get rid of Dallas grass? There's not really a great option for killing Dallas grass in residential lawns, Eli. Um, like certainty will help suppress it, like it's gonna injure it, but it's not gonna kill it. The best way to get rid of Dallas grass, if that's in fact what you have, is to just physically remove it, just dig it out. Like that's gonna be your best bet. There was a herbicide that was useful or that was very effective against Dallas grass that is no longer labeled for use on residential turf. So that's not really a thing. Um, so the, you can do one of two things. You can do something like certainty to injure it, which is that's all it's gonna do. Um, but the way to really get rid of it is to physically remove it. That's, and I was sorry I don't have a better answer for you, but it, and it will take a while. But if you get out there, you know, a couple times a week for, you know, an hour at a time, it won't take you long to act here to physically remove the Dallas grass. Again, assuming you have like a reasonable size lawn. If you got like, you know, an acre, then uh, it's going to be hard. You know, that's going to that's gonna be a tough one. But if you have a normal size lawn, you can physically remove it over, a, over the course of a couple of weeks, which is really the best way to go about it. Anything that you use that's available for residential use is really just going to injure Dallas grass. It's not going to, it's not going to kill it. All right, um, uh, Carl the Llama says, I see it in my boulevard last um, fall, but none of it survived the Minnesota winter. It just got hit with 90 degree temps, but it's going back to the 60s next week. Is new seed going to take still planning to run seed with rye? You said temps are going back to the 60s next week. So yeah, so here's the thing, Carl. If it's in the 60s, yeah, I mean, you, you're, I mean, that those temps are better for rye grass in the 90s for sure. But the but given that we're trending more towards higher temps, even if you could get it to grow in, let's say you were to go through and put some seed down and it were to germinate, you know, I don't know how well it's going to tolerate the heat once the, you know, once summer gets here. If you're going to water it a lot and there's a bit of shade in the area, you it might survive. But I don't want you to go through all that hard work of putting down seed and watering and everything and that and like that just to have it have the ryegrass die when summer heat gets here. So it's, it's your call. If you want to try it and you don't really mind potentially wasting a bit of seed, then then go for it. The worst that's going to happen is that it's going to die and then you're going to be in the same situation you're in now, right? So it just depends on, on you. All right, next up is Triple UT Doc that says, can you top dress without core aerating? What are the pros and cons? Yes, you can. I've done it before. Like this, the video, like I'll link it for you here in the, uh, the chat, Triple UT. A video I did a couple weeks ago, um, I top dressed the front lawn, top dressed the slope, and I didn't aerate it. Um, and the the pros and cons. The pros to aerating is that it helps the top dressing mix integrate with the existing soil better. Because you're open, you're removing plugs, you're opening up the soil. There are little, literally little voids all throughout the lawn. So when you uh, when you add your sand soil mix, it's going to help integrate with your existing soil profile much better than if you didn't do that. Uh, the cons are that it's not going to integrate as well or as quickly. Th those are the cons. Also, if you um, if you have a heavy rain, I mean, and this was kind of a light con, but if you if you were to go heavy with the top with the top dressing um, and you aerated, the likely the likelihood that you're going to be able to hold on to to retain more of the top dressing is better if you aerated your lawn. If you did not aerate your lawn and you go heavy with the top dressing, which I don't recommend doing, but if you did that anyway, and you get a heavy rain, you're likely to lose a lot more of the material or, or have it shifted around than had you aerated. So whenever possible, I recommend aerating. It's not strictly necessary, um, but if you can, then by all means do it. I've done it both ways. Like I've like last year when I did the lawn with carbonized PN, I didn't aerate. And this year when I did the, the lawn, the front lawn with um, 
the um, super sod uh, soil cubed compost, I did not aerate it. And I got a great result in both cases. So you, it's not strictly necessary, but if you can, it is good to do. It's a good question. So I'm sure other people are gonna have that one as well as we are getting now into top dressing season. Ravi Kumar is next. He says, hey, our new lawn in our, our new house lawn is a disaster. We have more weeds than actual grass. I followed some of your videos and used the weed stop liquid. Should I still use dry herbicide before aeration? So here's the thing, Robbie. The I don't know what kind of weeds you're dealing with um, or what kind of grass you have. And weed stop is a good option, right? As far as a less expensive option to kind of get you going, um, weed stop will, will help. It'll likely take a couple of applications to really get rid of the weeds. Um, but what we're after when it comes to using herbicide in general, right? is you have a bunch of weeds in the lawn, you don't have much grass because the, the weeds have been taken over and the grass is like trying to hold on for dear life. Once we apply a herbicide like weed stop or Celsius or something else that to get rid of the weeds, what we're doing now is we are, we are injuring or killing the plant that we don't want, which is going to allow the grass or the plant that we do want to begin to dominate and take over and become the dominant plant in the lawn, right? But that takes time. So I don't, without pictures, I don't know you know, how much actual grass you're working with. But at any rate, eliminating the weeds is, is an important first step to really getting a great lawn, you know? So once you once the weeds are dead, then we can decide with, hey, can we get the existing grass that we have to grow in and fill in and do well? Are we looking at, you know, maybe resodding the lawn or, you know, it just depends on the state. Without pictures, it's really hard to, to tell you which way you should go. Um, but uh, but you are doing the correct thing by going after the weeds first. You know by trying to eliminate weeds first. That that is a, an excellent first step. Is what I would recommend. And then as far as using a dry herbicide before aeration, yes. I mean if you want. I mean it depends on on what's in it, right? If it's a pre-emergent, if it's a pre-emergent, you're already a little bit late in the season for pre-emergent. If you're going to be aerating, say, tomorrow, and you're going to apply a pre-emergent, then I would say, and you still want to do it anyway, I would say then wait till after you aerate the lawn. Because you're already, you know, you're already kind of behind the eight ball as far as putting pre-emergent down. If I have a choice between um, putting the pre-emergent down before I aerate or putting the pre-emergent down after I aerate, I would do it afterwards. You know, but because at this point, again, you're already a bit late anyway, but I would I would do it after aerating the lawn if that's what you're asking me. Because I think by dry herbicide, you're referring to something that has uh, pre-emergent in it. All right, a CS Mike says, what do you think about the Ecologel Cytogrill? I've never really used it directly. A lot of their fertilizer, some of their fertilizer products have some Cytogrill in it, but I have not used Cytogrill by itself to be able to give her, to give you an opinion on it. So I can't really help on, um, on that one, uh, CS Mike. I use... Um, Nutric Help and just the, the Miramichi Green Biostimulants. I really like those. So I just haven't had a need to, to start to integrate or add Ecologel or this the side to go to the program. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's bad enough already. You guys, I'm already telling you guys that for my, you know, my pared down list of what I want, I use on my lawn to spray is 901C, um, 901C Nutric Help Biospectrum. And I also use some, um, some, uh, Nutrizol for the micronutrient as well. Can you imagine now if I tell you guys, hey, in addition to that, I'm also using Cytogro as well. I'm, I'm sure it's a great product and it would perhaps help things, but I also have to be conscious of, um, you know, is it, are you getting into the point of diminishing returns? And I don't want people, I mean, you know, granted, yes, you got new bought Cytogro. It's beneficial for me because it's good. Yeah, I appreciate the business, but I also want to, to recommend products that are going to allow you to get a great result without having you to spend money you don't have to. You know what I mean? So, uh, and really the carbon kit with a, you know, the, the, the release, the non, the non-release zero carbon kit with a liquid FERT is all you really need. And the 901C with like Nutrizolve is really all you need. So I haven't had a need to really complicate things by adding yet another product. So hope that helps. Um, I haven't tried it, so I can't really speak on it. But again, some of their other products contain some of that in there. And I, I'm a big fan of Ecology products in general. So there you go. All right, Ravi is back. He says, what is the time gap I have to give? I'm also trying to level the lawn, level and soften the lawn as I as I have kids. Do you think I can do fix the lawn and level the lawn in the same season or take one season, one step, step for each season? No, you can absolutely do it all in one season. If you want to see this, Ravi, if you've not seen um, how quickly you can turn a lawn around with a lot of work, but again, key point is it's a lot of work, right? You gotta, you gotta be out there mowing it, you know, 
blowing it all the time. So far, I've been hearing a lot about products you're applying, but really, your ability to get out there and mow the lawn regularly is gonna be a big part of really turning this lawn around. Even after top dressing and leveling and all this kind of stuff, you gotta get out there and mow it. So what I'm gonna send here to you in the chat is a, um, a playlist, it's a link to a playlist on the YouTube that's gonna show you the transformation of Alex's lawn. Um, please excuse the footage and the cinematography because you know, I was filming on my iPhone. I didn't have all the, all the gear that I have now. So, but the messaging is good, right? The, the process is good. So I'm gonna send that to you here in the chat. Watch this. And what you're seeing there is the course, the change of Elan over uh, over 15 episodes, over 15 weeks or, or right around three months, a little bit more than three months. So you can absolutely do it all in a season if you want. It is doable, but it really comes down to you and how much work you're willing to put in to really transform the lawn. So I hope that helps. All right, next up is Trish uh, Trish to Average. It says, which soil test kits do you use? I use these, Trish. I use the one from my soil. Um, the one that, the one I would recommend for people that are first getting started, I'll show you here really quick. So make, make it even easier. You go to the Golf Course Lawn Store, golfcourselawn.store, and then go to Shop, and then Soil Test Kits and pH Adjustments, or if you hate me using menus, just scroll down until you get to right here and click on the My Soil Test Kit. And it comes in a couple of different flavors. You have just this, which is the standard soil test kit, which is great to use if you already have one of these guys. This is the highly over-engineered soil uh, core sample tool. So if you've never used any of the My Soil test kits before, or you and you or you don't have one of these, if you have another core, a core tool, then you can just use that. But if you don't have one of these, I highly recommend starting out with the starter pack because with this one, you see on the screen now, the mouse is moving around. You get the soil test kit, and you get the tool to get to collect your samples. Once you have done this one time, from there on out, if you decide to test again, you can just either get just individual kits, or if you want to get good for the year, you can get the pro pack, which comes with the pro, which comes with the probe, and then two test kits, so you can do one now and do one in the fall if you uh, you so desire. I really really like these because they are easy to use. Um, with the new web interface that they added. Uh, last year, or um, late last year, um, all your soil test results go into this interface that allows you to go back and revisit them. So I can show you really quick here. So take a look at my screen now. Like these are all my soil test results ever started, since I started using my soil test kits, right? So starting at like 2020 up till now, every soil test that I've done is right here. So if I wanna compare the results from uh, to see how the, the, the soil is changing over time, it makes it really easy for me to do that. For example, if I wanted to compare my winter soil test kit to my fall soil test kit from last year, and I hit those two sam hit those two, and I say compare samples. I can see how the soil levels are trending. I can see that hey, you know, I had a lot more nitrogen in the fall than I did in the winter, which makes sense because I'm not feeding the soil in the winter. So I can see how that those levels are changing, and I can see overall how pH is moving. All these types of things, which is really cool. You don't pay extra for this. Just the mere fact that you use the my soil test kits, you get access to this interface, and all your soil tests get added to them as you use them over time. So that's the one that I, I like, I'm a huge fan of it. And uh, that is what I would go with if you are in the market for a soil test kit and you don't have, you haven't, you know, you don't have one that you already, you already like using. All right, uh, next is, I think we're pretty good here. Um, uh, you said here, um, thanks, great channel and um, appreciate the advice. Just grab your uh, test kit from the shop, previous soil test kit was not as detailed. Yeah, and that's the, that's the, another point too. The my soil test kits have enough detail. They have they have sufficient detail, enough detail for you to be able to make an intelligent, informed decision, but not so much like extra like word salad um, that's going to confuse you and not be able to say, not be able to to give you the data you need to be able to make you know informed decisions as far as the nutrient program for your lawn. So they're just, they're, they're great for a number of reasons. And I don't say that just because I sell them and they have them available on the store. The reason why I sell them is because I like them that much. Like literally, you know, fun fact, while I look for the next comment, is the way I got introduced to my soil is a viewer sent me soil test results to look at. And it was one that they got from my soil. They took a picture of it and they sent it to me. And I was like, I looked at it, I was like, man, this is this is like soil testing done right. Like I, I they literally, it was easy, it was clear, easy to read had recommendations in it and I reached out to them and said how can I you know get you know get affiliated with your products and start making this available to some of my viewers cuz cuz I really liked it. it it solved a lot of the problem so that people have with soil tests um the biggest one being that they they're just difficult to understand and and to read and that is not the case with these so 
I highly, highly recommend them. All right, uh, let's see. Mitchell LeBlanc says, what are the three products you have to have for Kentucky Blue Gas and Rye Lawns? Uh, pretty much the same thing you need to have for Bermuda Lawns. I would say if I could only have three things, uh, you said three to five products. Um, really, outside of herbicides, Mitchell, they're exactly the same. So I would still use the carbon kit, which is, I'm using three of my, my coupons right there, right? So I could use the carbon kit, so I'd use my uh, 901C, um, Nutric Help, and Biospectrum. So I've used three out of my five. And then I would pick a granular fert of some sort, so like Humic Max or some other granular fert that fits my soil. So that's using another one. And man, now you're making me decide between like a micronutrient or PGR, and I'm probably gonna have to use PGR. So the, the long short of it is the same products I would use on Bermuda are the same products I would use on a rye or Kentucky bluegrass with the exception of herbicides. The herbicide families are, are completely different. Do not use do not use Celsius on ryegrass. You're going to have a bad day. You know, just like don't use tenacity on Bermuda. You're going to have a bad day. But everything else is it can be is interchangeable. You can use them on on both on both grass types, on both types of grass without issue. All right. Um Shortstop Long Cure says, any advice for an up and coming entrepreneur? Huh? Um, put the customer first, you know, put the customer first is more important than money. You know, uh, work on, work on, um, providing great service, like, you know, give a lot of yourself and just, you know, do, go out of your way to help your customers, even ones that are just a pain in the neck and they're really difficult and are mean to you. Like just, just, uh, you know, be nice, find a way to be nice because also in life, you never know who you're talking to, right? You never know that, you know, you could, you know, you might have someone that's having a really bad day and they're emailing, they email you a nasty gram and they could, you never know what's going on in the world, why they, why they came at you the way they did. Um, so wherever possible, um, always, you know, temper your responses uh, to, to negative um, comments. And um, whenever you have, um, you know, whenever you, have a whenever you have a customer, go out of your way to figure out ways to delight them and to make sure that they have a great experience um, working with you. You know, people, you know, there's not there's not a ton of um, in the lawn care industry anyway. You think about it, like we have fertilizer, we have herbicides, we have you know soil amendments and those types of things, um, and you can get those things from a lot of different places. But the thing that you can't get in many cases is great customer service. Someone that's going to help answer your questions, and you know someone that's going to go out of their way and, and try and get invested in you getting a great result. So if you do that, you're going to have you know I mean the the money will be a byproduct of that. You know what I mean? So make sure you just put the customer first, do a great job, and um and and just just truly take an interest in people getting success, and then you know they will reward you with pieces of paper with dead presidents on it if that's the thing that you're really into. All right, next up is Jason Sitter. He says, um, let's see, he says, uh, hey Ron, I know you've been talking, I've been talking to you about my leveling project coming up with Super Sod Leveling Mix. Once the mix is down, how long does it usually take before I can mow Jason from Raleigh? So it depends, <laughs> depends on your, on, on your lawn. Uh, the first time I top dressed, it took me you know, three weeks before I was really able to get out there and mow again. It took a while, two to three weeks before I was able to mow, but that was the first time and it took a, it just, the lawn just was like, what, what is this? It took a while for it to bounce back, right? These days when I top dress, I'm able to start mowing within four to five days, you know? Um, the, the really big top dressing job that I did last year, I top, I finished up the top dressing on a Saturday and I was mowing the following Thursday. So it, it's it's different on every lawn. What you will find is you do it more is the lawn is going to cover faster and faster. But I would budget for, you know, a couple of weeks. Worst case scenario, two weeks is what I would expect, especially if you top dress it the way that I recommend, which is you go light, a quarter of an inch to half an inch. That's all you should need. And uh, you will get a good result from doing that. And good job choosing the Super Sod Mix. It's a great product. It's one of the best, literally one of the best, one of the best choices you can make for a pre-made leveling mix for your lawn. Okay, next up. And then Modi says, don't do the rye. I can't get this stuff out of my out of my yard. See, that's the thing too. I don't really want to have to smack my lawn hard with herbicides, you know, later on in the season. So that's that's a thing. So we'll see. I I I I I keep saying I'm gonna to tour with the idea, but knowing myself, I'm probably gonna not, I'm probably gonna not do it. All right, uh, let's see what else here. We're winding down, guys. We're almost done. Rob Miller says, what's the best way to clean off small rock sticks, emulse, et cetera, from common Bermuda without tearing it up? Thanks, Ron, you're the best. Um, I use a, I mean, you can either, you can just pick them up. 
Um, you can use a leveling rake. Leveling rake's really good for that. Like a leveling rake is a really good um, tool for picking up small debris uh, without doing much injury to your lawn. Like if you don't have one, I'd recommend that. They're really good for that. Even though they're they're really designed for like moving moving um, material around, they're also good for the, exactly what you're talking about as well too. So that's um, that's a, an option you can look into. All right, um, JC says, how often should we do a soil test? About six weeks ago, I had one. It was low on most of everything except for pH. I have since done two applications of the triple 12. So I would give it at least three, I would give it four weeks between your last fertilizer application and when you soil test. So um, I would say this, JC, if you want a soil test after your two apps, you can. But what I would say is you, you did it in the beginning of the spring, you know, the beginning of the season, you know what your lawn looks like now, and you what the soil looks like now, stick with that program, stick with the triple 12. And if you want, at the closer to the end of the season, do another test then to see how what you did over the season worked. You know what I mean? I wouldn't do it every month just, I mean, because really what's going to, what's going to change? I mean, I guess you could, your levels could have come up and it would allow you to change fertilizers if you want to, but that's really the only benefit that you would get from it. You know what I mean? So if the triple 12 is working well, if the grass is responding well to it, it's growing nicely, I would just keep rolling with that until again, we get closer to the end of uh, end of the growing season. All right, uh, Hunter Hall says, what does the average um, home, homeowner use to verticut their yard? Also, how much sand should 10,000 square feet of Bermuda need each year? Okay, so to verticut, um, the easiest way to do that is to find a place that rents a slit cedar. You can use those for verticutting. The negative to using a slit cedar is that there's no, that typically there's no basket attachment on the front. So you're going to have to figure out a way to rake up or get rid of all the, the, the material you're removing after you're done. So a slit cedar is a, the easy way to verticut your lawn for the, for the average homeowner. The rule for 10,000 square feet of Bermuda is um, one yard of material per thousand square feet. So you have a 10,000 square foot yard. You should get 10 yards of sand to top dress it. All right. Next up is Grayson Patterson. What do you do for a living? I work in the information security space. I'm a tech guy. I'm a geek. I, uh, I do information security for a living. That is what I do for work. He says, I'm brand new to this live, so I just want to know what you do for a living. Well, now you know. I am a computer. I'm a computer guy. I do, I do information security. I lead a team that, um, that defends networks. That's a, good, that's, a, that's a good way of saying it. I mean, it's not, I'm not really that hard to figure out what, where I work and what I do. So if you do a bit of research online, you can, you can find out. But I'm a, and information security is the best way to just at a high level is to describe it. All right, Rob G says, um, would dethatching break the pre-emergent layer? If so, would liquid dethatching be a better option? I mean, anything that you do after applying pre-emergent will technically disturb the um, the barrier. I have aerated my lawn every year after applying pre-emergent, and I don't get a bunch of weeds in my lawn for having done so. So I would say if you put your pre-emergent down, you applied it properly. I really wouldn't worry about it. Really wouldn't sweat it, especially if you're doing all the other stuff, meaning that you're mowing your lawn regularly, you're just you're doing all these things to help grow a thick, healthy stand of turf. That's going to do a lot for keeping weeds out of it. And then, you know, the fact that you did your pre-emergent is going to prevent is going it, it will have done its job as far as preventing the weeds from germinating, but then your other cultural practices as far as like the regular mowing is going to is what's going to also help keep weeds out of your lawn if that makes sense. And I think we are about done. Let's see here. Uh, Michel LeBlanc says, do you have a good product to help your grass recover from dog urine? No, not really. Uh, the best thing I can tell you for that is to train your dog to pee in one spot, like to designate a sacrificial area of your lawn and let your dog go there. That is the best way to do it. I mean, the way to recover from that is um, some people have had success with using carbon, first watering the area very heavily and then using carbonized PN or some other or topsoil or some other rich organic material to help, you know, give the grass some food to be for it to fill in faster, but it's really going to be a time thing. You know, I mean, fertilizer is not going to materially make a huge difference in it. The best thing is to just prevent the damage in the first place going forward. And again, something like a, um, a rich organic material like carbonized PN can help or some other rich topsoil can help with the process a bit, but it's just going to be a time thing, unfortunately. So sorry you're dealing with that. And let's see. Grayson says, my bad. I know now I know what you what you're doing. Uh, but do you know what kind of grass to use for lawns? It depends, Grayson. So it depends on the kind of grass you use for a lawn depends on um more mostly your climate. So if you're in the north or in cooler areas of the country, 
using a cool season grass like rye, fescue, Kentucky bluegrass. Those are like those are more suited for cooler climates. If you're in the southeastern United States, then a grass like zoysia, Bermuda grass, of course, gotta get Bermuda. Um, if you're in Florida, St. Augustine is very popular. Um, so, so it depends on where you are in the country and then also your preferences. So if you like a taller lawn, then St. Augustine for warm season grass makes a lot of sense and fescue makes a lot of sense for cool season grass. If you prefer that more of that golf course lawn look, then Bermuda or zoysia for warm season grass is a good choice or um, Kentucky bluegrass or rye is a good choice for cool season lawn. So it depends on your climate and what kind of lawn you're looking for, what kind of look you're looking for as far as your grass, and also how much time you have to mow it, right? Because it's easy to say that Bermuda is, you know, an awesome grass type to go with, and that, you know, it, it stripes like, it looks great, it looks be awesome to have this golf course lawn look, but it takes a lot of time to do that. So do you have the time to maintain the grass that you want at the levels that it's gonna require for it to really look good? You know what I mean? So there's just a, a whole lot, I mean, it's a simple question, but. As you're seeing, it's not the answer is more complicated than just, you know, Bermuda or ryegrass. All right, well, hope that helps though. And um, if you have any other questions, let me know. And next is um, uh, James Kelly says, I mow daily at two inches. Am I mowing too often? Probably, probably at two inches, there's really no need to mow every single day. Um, it's, it's, if as long as your equipment is sharp and you're varying your mowing patterns, you're probably not really gonna hurt anything. If you're mowing the same way every single time or every day at two inches, yeah, that's a bad idea. It's gonna, you're gonna put ruts in the lawn and cause compaction problems and things like that. But if you're varying it every single time and you just wanna get out there and mow the lawn every day at two inches, you you likely don't need to do that. But, you know, it's it's um if you want to get the exercise and, and do it anyway, again, as long as you're mixing it up, mowing the, varying the mowing patterns, so you're not causing ruts and those kinds of things. Uh, you're fine, and your equipment is sharp. Because if you're cutting your your lawn every day with a dull mower, you're going to cause problems. You're going to—it's not going to look good. You're going to introduce disease, fungus, all kinds of, or you're, or you're going to make it more easy for those things to take root um, in your lawn. So the more more the more you mow, um, the more it's important to maintain your equipment properly. So that's one thing I'd also tell you with um, everyday mowing, James. Okay, and uh, James says, yeah, the cool part about the soil test kit, I use the yard mastery test kit, and when I go to look at the results, it shows both. Yeah, so there you go. So it's um, like the yard mastery test kit, like the technology is done by my soil, so I'm not surprised that you're seeing both of them in there. And you're very, very welcome, um, Trish. Let me know if you need anything else. I'm glad that you, it was helpful. And you're very, very welcome again, Mitchell. And you're saying you're a geek. We need to, we all need what you're geeked out about. It's very, very cool. So guys, thank you guys so much. This was a long one, but we had a lot of great questions. Hopefully you guys got some value out of it. Um, as far as uh, things to, to keep in mind, remember we are in fungicide and preventative insecticide season. So you go to the Gulf Wars Lawn Store, we have those in stock. Uh, they're in stock now and shipping. If you have not tried out Plant Growth Regulator, consider doing that. It's pretty awesome um, as far as what it can do for your lawn, as far as mowing reduction and then just, just in general how it makes the turf look i'd highly recommend it and outside of that get out there and do something fun in your lawn this weekend get out and mow if you want to aerate aerate but get out and do something fun in your lawn and uh you know and have fun with it thank you guys so much for watching i truly do appreciate it i will see you guys next week stay tuned for